Hello everyone, my name is Harshit. So this session is all about course overview. How are we going to start our course? How are we going to start our Python learning? And how are we going to end it? So the course, this, this particular session is all about the flow of learning. So the first one that we will be doing is about installation of Python. We will be installing Python 3.7 or whichever latest version we have we have available in Python. We will be installing that version and we will be working on it. Then after installing the Python, I will walk you through installing installation of Anaconda. After Anaconda installation, we will learn how can we basically work on Jupyter Notebook. I will show you how we can upload a new file, upload a file, how can we create a new file, how can we write a code and there are several other things which are available in Jupyter Notebook as well and I will walk you through them. After that we will write our first code and I will also show you how we can write comments. Comments are pretty much useful whenever you are learning or whenever you are building any project. After doing, uh, after write, learning commands, we will learn about simple mathematical operations. Then we will learn about variables and data types. What different type of data types we have in Python. Then we will also learn about assignment operators. And then we will see how we can get an input from an user. And we will see about how we can basically format our print statements. After this, we will learn about relational operators and Boolean values. Then we will learn about indentation, which we had... Uh, which which I had talked about, which I had talked about in our previous session. Then we will also learn about flow control statements, which are if and else. After this, we will learn something about our first data structure, which is list. And then we will learn about the loop statements, which are for loop and while loop. After while loop, we will learn about the break and continue. And after break and continue, we will learn about strings and then functions. Then we will also see about recursion. What is recursion? How can we use recursion? Then we will also see about data structure, which is set, tuple, and then dictionary, which are already available in Python. Then we'll be, we will see about lambda function, map function, and at last we will look into exception handling. Okay, so this is all about the course. And along with the lectures, we also have assignments after each course. And what my advice to you will be before moving on to the next course, try to do the assignment by yourself. And if you have any issues, then you can let me know. But before looking into the solution, go and to, uh, try to do it by yourself. Okay. Allow, after completing this course, I have also provided few assignments which you also need to uh, complete. And along with the course, we will be doing hands-on Jupyter Notebook for each of the tutorial that we have. And along with the hands-on, we will. I have also provided the presentations wherein you can find the code for each of the syntaxes for each of the uh, tutorial. So uh, till then, see you in the next lecture, and we will begin our course. Then fine. See you. Goodbye. Hello everyone. My name is Harshish. So today we will be installing Python, the latest version of Python on our systems. So what we will do? We will first go to Google Chrome. We will open, open Google Chrome, then we will type python.org and then we'll click enter. In python.org, we will navigate to this website. This is basically the, uh, this is basically the uh, actual website of Python, wherein if you want to see any documentation, all of them is available regarding Python. So for downloads, you can go to downloads over here. And if you can see here, the for Windows, the latest version of Windows is available as Python 3.9.0. If you want to uh, get the, uh, if you want to download for Mac, you can download for Mac as well. So here are latest versions. If you want to download Python 2, you can download Python Python 2. Or else, if you want to download the uh, for Windows, you can download this one. Okay, so I'll download Python 3.90 for uh, Windows, and so I'll click over here. And once I'll click over here, once I'll click over here, the latest version of Python will be start installing. So uh, let me, yeah, so it is already installed. So so this is for 64 bits. If you want to install for 32 bits, you can also come down and you will be able to see the different, different versions of Python available. These are for Macs. If you want to go for uh, Windows, you can click on Windows and you will be able to find different, different versions of Windows fine 
so if you want to download it for windows you can download it for windows as well fine if you want to go and download for other platforms you can click on other platforms and you will be able to find for aix ios ibm i for solaris as well so there are different different packages of python available and if you want to download it for linux you can download it for linux as well so here i have installed python for windows so let's go and start installing the python so i'll go to uh, first so i'll go to downloads and where is where the version has basically been installed i'll delete this one it is so it was installed twice so i'll just double click on this and i'll just double click on this so once i'll, I'll minimize all the folders which are open and now now if you can see this is basically the installation of python uh, installation window of python now what i need to do i can either click on this one wherein it will in start installing and with python we are getting ideally pip and documentation and the second thing is if you are going to click on this button if you are going to click on this particular setup then it will install the python at the particular at the uh, p default at the default location which is this one c users arshit app data but what i want i don't want to want it to be installed at this location i want it to be installed at the location which where i want and where i can access if i want to add any libraries or something so if i want to do any manipulation i can do it so i'll install it at my customized position location which is customized installation so before moving moving on to customized installation go and click on this checkbox add python 3.9 to path so what will it do it will add python 3.9 to the environment variables when you whenever you are working on or you are installing some software like java or any sort of things you have to you have to provide those environment variables to the path okay so now after ch checking this checkbox you can click on this installation part customize installation once you click this then you will be having these five checkboxes documentation pip so along with python all these things will be available for you now you do not need to uncheck any of those all of them are checked so we can just just directly go and click on next so i'll click on next now if you can see we have all these things are going to get installed these are some advanced options wherein we have install for all users let's click on install for you all users so you'll get pre-compiled standard library you'll get associated files with python create shortcuts add python to environment variables all of them will be done with this advanced option you do not need to click on these ones these are not that required if you want to click you can click so now let's let's choose a location i'll go to browse i'll go to this pc and i'll go to g location wherein i have python i have already created a folder python 3.9.1 so if you can see this is my python 3.9.1 folder and it is not having anything so i'll just select this folder and i'll click on ok now once i'll click on ok this is the lo location that has been where my python is going to get installed now once it is done i can click on install button okay so i'm going to click on install button now so i'll click on install and if you get this popper you just click, click on yes and then your setup will start installing so if you can see in python 3.9.1 you are getting all those uh, library all those pre default uh, tools that that were needed all are going to get installed here okay so let's wait for a few seconds and once this setup will be done then we'll come back okay so the setup has been installed now uh, now we can go and click on close if you get any pop-up so the, uh, here used usually we got one we get one pop-up so if you get one pop that pop-up just click on that pop-up and click yes okay so for now we are not getting that pop up so we can close this one now uh, so basically your python has been installed on your systems now what you can do you can just go to cmd to check if your python has been installed so you'll get you when you'll open your command prompt you can just type python and you can say version python hyphen hyphen version this command you need to use so i'll just enlarge it so that you can see it better python hyphen hyphen version just click on enter and you will see python 3.9.0 so this basically means that you got you have python installed on your system which is and the version is 3.9.0 right if you had tried this one and if your python was not installed on your system then you would have got you would have got the message 
that uh, there is no such command as python okay so for now we are very much comfortable that python has been installed on our system now if you want to try you can go and click on type python as well click enter once you click enter you will see again the same line of code python 3.9.0 and uh, some tags and uh, on window 32 and type help so what you need to do so here these three arrows basically means that now you are into the python shell so if you want to now you if you want to run any command like one plus two so whatever operations which can be done in python can also be done over here so if i write like print hello world it will also i just need to click on enter oh i need to provide i'll just say print uh, hello world I had actually not provided the parenthesis to complete the code so you can see hello world so in this way your python has been installed basically and now if you want to write any code you can write over here okay so as i told you in my previous lecture that uh, uh, once you install python then there is an ide which comes up inbuilt and which is ideally python uh, you can go to your search bar and ty start typing ideally and you will see that python so the uh, best match you will see ideally python in your best match and 3.9 is our version and 64 bit so you can just click on this ideally python if your desktop is 64 bit then all then only you need to install python 64 bit if your desktop is 32 bit then you can install python 32 bit okay so this is basically your console now i'll try the same operation one plus two if you want to try your simple simple operations you want to create a code over here you can also create your code over here and let me tell you one more thing that what all operations which we are going to do in basics in this tutorials all those operations can be done on this python shell as well if you do not want to open your jupyter notebook in order to execute such programs you do not need to but in order to know how we can basically work on jupyter interface we are using jupyter interface and so this is also integrated developed in environment i just wanted to tell you here also you can build your own course and those will also be executed the same way as jupyter notebook or pycharm or spider any sort of ide can provide you so you can click on enter and it will give you the result now go and click on file so once you click on file you can click on new file okay so this is basically it's a kind of a notebook or it's, it's a kind of an interface where you can basically write your own full code so this was basically just you can uh, write your one line of code over here but here you can write your full code so it's like print hello world world and uh, you can also write print ideally now before running this you can click on run and you can run using run module or f5 option or customize shift f5 but before running you have to save it as save it so i'll save it at desktop and i'll give uh, ideally.py so dot py is the extension which needs to be given so if you do not want to give so it will be saved as a dot py file only so i'll give ideally only let's let's see and if you go to your desktop i'll just open the desktop you can see ideally.py okay now i'll go back to ideally.py and i'll go to run and click on run module now if you can see ideally and hello world has been created so the same way you can create your own program over here if you want to if you in further lectures you learn for for loop uh, while loop every such sort of things and if you have uh, if you want to practice all of them over here you can also practice them from here so in this lecture we have basically learned how we can install python you should by now you should be able to install python so uh, easily i think and if you have any issues if you are getting any issues while installing python just let me know and uh, in the next lecture we will learn about anaconda installation anaconda also once we install anaconda then python also get installed with it but before installing that anaconda i wanted to show you that if you do not want to use anaconda then also it is fine if you want to use python you can use python so anaconda is not that necessary
but we will use anaconda because it has some inbuilt features whenever you are installing any libraries then it is quite convenient so for now whatever you have learned try it out and if you have any issues just let me know so till then see you in the next lecture goodbye hello everyone my name is harshit so in our last session we had uh, installed python on our system and the version was 3.9.0 today we will be installing anaconda on our system so the main point that i wanted to tell you is it is not mandatory to install uh, it is not mandatory to have python installed on your system before installing anaconda so once you are installing anaconda python will be installed by itself because basically python has been provided by anaconda okay so uh, let's go to google chrome and uh, download anaconda so i have opened google chrome just write anaconda now the first website that you can see over here www.anaconda.com you have to click on this website so this is basically an official website of anaconda and uh, always always whenever you so consider this as an important point so whenever you are installing any software product from any website whether it is python or whether it is anaconda or let's say any sort of software licensed software or unlicensed software so always install it from the from its own website okay so what you can do here you can go to products and you can click on individual edition so rest are basically paid ones you will go to individual editions edition just scroll downward and there you will see your data science toolkit so anaconda is basically used for data science mostly anaconda is a tool which is which has jupyter interface spider all those available interfaces and which can be used for data science and visualization so you can click on download just when you when you click on download it will navigate you to the installers so these are anaconda installers which are available if you can see windows mac os and linux and for each we have 64 bit and 32 bit for windows so if you can see the latest python version that is available in anaconda is 3.8 so when you are installing anaconda it will install python version of 3.8 so we have already installed python version of 3.9.1 3.9.0 right but with anaconda when when we are installing anaconda it is going to install python 3.8 not 3.9 so uh, you will see that once we will be finished with anaconda and we when we will go and look for the version that we have in python it will be python 3.8 because anaconda is going to override in the python version that we already have okay so my desktop is 64 bit so i'll go and install 64 bit graphic installer anaconda so let's click on this installer okay so downloading has been started and if you can see uh, here my downloading has been started so let's wait for a few minutes and once this uh, installation will be once this downloading will be completed then we'll resume the session so as you can see uh, anaconda has been installed uh, sorry anaconda has been downloaded let's go to the folder where it has been downloaded so oh i don't know why it is initial first okay so let's remove this so let's click on let's start installing this anaconda i'll double click on this uh exe file and it is verifying the installer let's wait for a few seconds Yeah, so I'll minimize all the windows which are open. Now I'll click on. So first you need to go and click on next to continue. Then you, if you want to read all these, you can read. But uh, what I'll do, I'll just directly go and click on I agree. And then you have two options: either you can install for yourself or you can install for all users. So this requires. So recommended is just me. So I'll go and click on just me if you want to install it for all users you can go and install it for all users so what i'll do i'll go and click on next now what i need to do i need to install it to a particular location so this is the default location that has been provided by anaconda so this is the default location that has been provided by anaconda so what i'll do in this case i'll just go and change the location I'll go to this PC, I'll go to 
one is G. Here I have created a folder Anaconda. Now I'll show you what is there in Anaconda. If you can see, there is nothing present at this moment in Anaconda. I'll go and choose this folder and click OK. Okay. So once it will be clicked, you can see the destination folder of installation is G Anaconda. Now I can directly go and click on next. So you can also see over here. So Anaconda setup is having is around of 3 GB. So remember that and you should be having more than 3 GB spaces space available in the directory in which you are basically installing. So I have at a, at the moment I have 175 GB available in the directory in which I am basically installing the Anaconda software. So I'll go and click on next. Now you have two options over here add Anaconda 3 to my path and environment variable or register Anaconda 3 as my default Python 3 content. So if you remember when we were installing Python we had also provided Python in the environment variable as well which uh, checked the checkbox. So at the moment I have Python 3.9 installed already on my system. So here what I will do. I will go and click on this checkbox register Anaconda 3 as my default Python 3.8. So from now onwards, my the Python 3 that I am Python 3 that I am having, it will be uh, considering Python 3.8 as a default Python because it has been provided by Anaconda. Now the second thing is if you are installing for the first time. So as I told you, it is not necessary or mandatory to install Python before installing Anaconda. If you do not want to install Python, you do not need to. Okay. So if let's say if you were installing Anaconda for the first time and if let's say if you were not having any Python setup already installed on a system, so you should have clicked over here. But for me, I already have a Python system already Python already installed on my system so I'll go and directly click on this checkbox and click on install so what I'll do I'll just directly go and click on install now if you can see my Python installation has been started but the setup is of 3 GB so it will take quite some time so if you want to see you can also click on show details it will show you what exactly it is basically installing it is not of much use you won't be able to understand much but so uh, I will resume the session one, once this all thing will be installed. Okay, so uh, wait for a few seconds or wait for a few minutes. Okay, so once you get this message completed, so that means that your installation is has completed. So and if you can also see that uh, we got a message of setup was completed successfully. Now once all this thing is done, then you just need to go and click on next. So I'll click on next and uh, so you will get anaconda plus chat brains and just click on next and uncheck these we do not want these tutorials and click on finish okay so now your anaconda has been installed so uh, let's go and check anaconda type anaconda on your uh, uh, search bar and if you can see we got an anaconda prompt Okay, just click on this Anaconda prompt app. Once you click on this Anaconda prompt app, so this is also similar to your normal command prompt, but this is basically a command prompt provided by Anaconda. Now what you can do, you can just type Python over here. And you can see Python 3.8.3 provided by Anaconda in, right? So this is basically the Python 3 Python installed by Anaconda. And we will be using this Python when we will be working on Jupyter interface. Now you, as you already know, we came into the same uh, Python shell. What you can do, you can just, uh, if you want to check 1 plus 2, you can check 3, okay. So we will, what we will do, we will exit this shell. You can just type exit and you can provide the parenthesis. Now you are out of this uh, Python shell. Now what you, what you can do, so this Anaconda prompt is pretty much useful. Whenever you will be installing some uh, sort of some sort of libraries like NumPy, Pandas, Scikit-Learn. So I'll show you one more thing. So if you can, if you want to see which version of Conda has been installed, so you can just type Conda info and click on enter. It will give you the version of Conda that has been installed on your system. So if you can see, 4.8.3 version of Conda has been installed. Okay, and Python 3.8.3 has been installed. Python version 3.8.3.5.0. 
so whenever you want to install any uh, let's say numpy you just need to type conda install numpy and you can just click enter and it will be start installing you do not need to do anything in order to uh, in order to uh, install any library so you can see that uh, just your internet should be open at this point of time so that it can do all the necessary requirements it can fulfill all the necessary requirements okay so till then um, so we have now an installed our anaconda we have now installed our python and you have already understood that if you do not want to use anaconda or jupyter notebook you can directly go and install python and you can use python ideally provided by python and along with that if you really want to work on pycharm go and install python pycharm also but uh, i don't really like to work on pycharm i mostly prefer jupyter notebook because there i can with anaconda i can install multiple libraries data science libraries like numpy panda scikit-learn and i can use them very easily so that is why i have we have already understood how to install anaconda so here i have shown you how can you basically install python and anaconda for windows but if you want to install it for linux or mac os as well you have already seen the website you can just directly click on those uh, for those platform the process is almost similar there would be a minute change otherwise you will be able to install everything okay and if you have any issues if you are not able to do so just drop me a comment just drop me a message and uh, then i'll try to figure it out in the next lecture we will see about jupyter interface how we can basically work on jupyter interface and how we can create a notebook and how we can basically start a coding so till then see you in the next lecture goodbye hello everyone my name is harshit so we have already completed anaconda installation and now we will be moving on to jupyter notebook we will see how we can basically work on jupyter notebook so the first step that you need to do is to open a Jupyter notebook. So how will you be able to open it? So first what you need to do, you need to go into the at the search bar. Then you have to type Anaconda, Anaconda prompt. So as your Anaconda has already been installed, so you will be able to see the best match as your Anaconda prompt. So you can go and click on that Anaconda prompt. And so once you open that Anaconda prompt, it will be, it will be it will look as similar to your normal command prompt but this is basically your anaconda prompt this is not your regular command prompt now if you can see the current directory that we are in is c c users and harshit but our current directory is basically this one so the main motive is let's say you have created a folder this is my folder wherein i will be placing all the all my notebooks that i have created so ipy ny is basically the file extension that is basically generated when you create a, a notebook in Jupyter notebook when you create a python file in Jupyter notebook okay so what i need to do i need to navigate to this directory then i can work on it so if you can see the drive that we are currently in is c drive but the drive that we need to go is in g drive so what i'll do first i'll just use g drive g and colon and if you press enter you'll come to g drive this is my g drive okay now what i'll do i'll just navigate to the direct to the exact directory that we need to get into so cd is a command which is basically change directory cd is a command that is basically used in command prompt as well so you can use cd then you have to provide the test directory you have to provide the complete path test directory then you have to use forward slash sorry back backslash here it will be backslash that we will be using and let's provide the directory quotes and let's click enter so now if you now can you see we have come into the course directory now what we can do we just need to write jupyter notebook always remember this is the wherever if you are in c user search directory then also if you use jupyter notebook in that case then it will create a notebook or it will create the Jupyter in interface at that particular points only. So here I am what I am trying to do is I am trying to create a Jupyter notebook at this directory which is course directory. Now if I go and press enter you will see it will create a notebook interface over there and if you can see this is so I will show you once again so this is basically the path this is basically the 
server path that you got and if you can if you'll go and look over here this is the same path that we have from here so you can either go if i'll just copy this path if i'll paste it here this is the same path right so if let's say at some point of time if you tried and if you if this jupyter notebook is not opening for you then you can just copy this path and you can just paste it in any in any of the either you can put it in google chrome or if you want to put it in ie or mozilla wherever you want you can put it and you, it will open the host for you and where you will be having the whole jupyter notebook now whatever changes you will made here whatever new files you will made here that will be reflected in this particular folder okay so let's go to the jupyter interface so this is basically the home of jupyter interface here we have all the files these are already created files if you want to see one i'll uh, i'll show you uh, later but what can we do the first step the first step would be let's create a new python file okay what is this text file for uh, folder we'll look afterwards and it is not even required so we can create a python 3 first over here so python 3 is basically going to create because we have installed python 3 so it will be creating python 3 now if you can see this is the new notebook which has been opened this is my home folder and this is the notebook that has been opened and the current title for this notebook is untitled so if you want to change the name of the notebook you can say jupyter notebook interface and this will be the name of the notebook that you have created so once you will just so let's go and change the rename rename it now this has been created if you go and go and go and check in home you will get a new file as jupyter notebook interface at the same way if you go and check over here you will also get jupyter notebook interface over here so whatever changes you will made over there will be reflected in this particular home directory okay so let's go back okay so we have already created jupyter notebook let's see the interface now so this is basically the first cell so whatever code you are going to write in this particular cell if you will execute this cell then the whole code will be executed it's not like you have written one line and then one line will be executed whatever course you will write over here that will be executed so the best part is there are two modes one is command mode and the other one is and the other one is edit mode so command mode is basically this mode blue mode right and edit mode is green mode so command mode is blue mode when the signal is blue it is command mode when the signal is green it is edit mode now command mode means if it is in command mode then what you can do you can do anything you can add a cell reflect and uh, you can just delete a cell whatever you want to do for this with the cell you can do in the edit mode you will be in the cell right if you can see the cursor is in the cell now if you remember in excel we have f2 if we want to modify any cell in excel what we do is we press f2 then it comes into the edit mode but as we come out of the x edit mode so if you want to come out of this edit mode you can just pr uh, press escape so if you we'll press escape esc you will come into the command mode now you can see the cursor is not there if you want to again go into the command mode you can either use your mouse to press over here or else what you can do you can just press enter if you press enter you'll come into the edit mode so the next thing is command mode if you want to go to command mode go from command mode to edit mode you can press enter or you can click using mouse in the cell okay if you want to go from edit mode not edit it should be edit mode to command mode you can press escape and go back to the command mode right okay now the next part is if you want to run this particular cell if you want to run this particular whole cell what you can do you can use control plus enter okay so ctrl control plus enter can be used 
to run or to execute the whole chunk of code code or the whole code the ch whole chunk of code you have written in the cell in the cell okay now let's let's try control plus enter okay now once you press control plus enter you will see that earlier it was it was not showing any number over there now it is showing well so this is basically your first line of code right and what you will see you will see you will see a change in brackets in this in brackets when you execute any cell okay now i'll show you once again if i if you'll again press control plus enter now this number has got changed to one plus one two two now if you'll press again so if you are into the command mode you cannot press control plus uh, you can also press control plus enter in command mode as well okay if you want to if you are in edit mode then also you can press control plus enter if you are not if you are in uh, if you are not in command mode then also you can press command command control plus enter okay so the number will be changed now if you can see that we have not uh, added any more cell over here now what you can do if you want to control plus enter can execute the code the code but it will not not add or move to the next cell while um, shift sorry shift plus enter shift plus enter will execute the code and move to next cell okay i'll just comment this one so this is basically commenting i'll tell you what is commenting afterwards so let's okay so i have now pressed shift plus enter and if you have seen this five has been changed to six and the new cell has been created right if you can see the new cell has been created and we have come into the edit mode directly we have not come into the command mode and if you can see there is no such number over there now if i'll go and press control plus enter again now we came into command mode but we have not provided anything i'll print i'll do some stuff over here print hello we will learn about print as well in the next lecture but for now you just need to understand the interface i'll say control plus enter you can see it has been executed and this number has been changed now this number will be changed will be incremented from the previous cell to new cell whatever course you have executed so far on that way it, the number will be changed it will not be like for each cell you have different number set of numbers now now i am into this uh, edit mode if i press shift plus enter now i came into the next cell now if i'll go and if i'm in this command mode then also i can press shift plus enter now you are in the new mode when you are in the command mode and if you press shift plus enter you will come into the command mode only when you are in the command mode if you press shift plus enter then also you come into the command mode now if you click over here then you'll come into the edit mode right fine so these are some of the operations that are basically required control plus enter and shift plus enter is basically used to execute a cell execute your chunk of code if it is a blue mode that means it is a command mode if it is a green mode then it is an edit mode now you are here so if you want to let's say add any cell above this cell you can use a if you want to add any cell below this cell you can use b fine let's let's try this so now when you are using a only when you are in command mode if you are in edit mode you won't be able to do so because if you are in edit mode and if you write b then it will be it will write in the cell right 
so first you need to come into the command mode i'll just copy this for copy this for the next line and okay so if i'll just come into the command mode i have just these two command mode and i am now pressing a so it has added a new cell above if i'll again press a again press a it will add the new cell above okay i'll again come to this added mode i'll say b now can you see the b has been added to this cell only so i need to come into command mode once again now i am clicking b so b has added the cell below has inserted the cell below so these are some important operations that you need to be knowing know about you need to know about the first one is the command mode and added mode the second thing is the uh, how you can basically execute the code the first way is control plus enter the second way is shift plus enter control plus enter will not uh, create a new cell shift plus enter will create a new cell okay and you will be able to move to the next cell so if you think that uh, uh, okay the so the next operation that i would like to tell you is the how to delete a cell so dd can be used to delete a cell delete a cell this is the shortcut only in command mode okay so let's press press shift plus enter okay so if i if i'm here if i'll press control plus enter then also i will be there i wouldn't be moving to the next cell if i'll press control, shift plus enter then i'll be moving to the next cell okay now let's delete this one now i am in the command mode L let's come to edit mode and write d uh, and uh, press dd so if you can see dd has been added to the cell because we are in edit mode now let's move on to the command mode now if i'll press dd so it will be removed only one d will not work we have to provide two d at the same time dd it will be removed dd it will be removed dd it will be removed right and if you want to add any more a a it will be added above right so by this way basically we can delete a cell we can add a cell above, uh, up above the cell which on in which we are working or below the cell in which we are working now coming to these points so if you are already running a code and if you want to interrupt the kernel interrupt the kernel means that if you are running a code and you want to stop it stop the code working of the code you can press this it will stop the code in which you are working run will execute the it will be working like shift plus enter if you want to restart the kernel you can use this and if you want to go above the cell so if you are working on this cell and you want to take this cell upwards you can take this cell upwards using this if you want to come down you can use this and it will come down this is basically if you want to copy this and paste it somewhere else if you want to copy this you can use copy selected cells and if you want to place this you can use this and paste cells it will place it will paste your cell downwards or if you are in the command prompt it will paste over there if you want to cut any cell you can use this or you can use dd dd is pretty much useful you can use cut as well if you want to insert a cell below you can insert a cell below over here but we have already known so if you want to insert your cell using a uh, mouse you can insert your cell above and below from here okay so these are some of the important things that you need to know about the next important thing that i would like to tell you about is markdown or heading okay so this is basically in a code mode you are in a code mode that is why you are writing it as a code now if i'll add if i click on come into edit mode at this position now what i'll do i'll just go to this code we have three heading markdown and raw and we convert we just need use code and markdown whenever we are working with jupyter notebook rest are not even required if you go for heading jupyter no longer uses special heading cells instead write your headings in markdown cells using hash character so basically you just need to use markdown so markdown is basically used in order to give some special effect to the heading if you want to write a heading then you can provide this markdown and you have to start with the hash so i have already converted this cell into hash now if you can see this has been converted into blue now if i'll write like uh first program this had if you want to give and get like first program and you can press shift plus enter and it will be converted into your heading first program right so again if you'll come like this and if you'll press 
hash hash it won't work because you are in a code mode now in this mode if you can go and change this to markdown it will be converted like this and this will be small i guess so second program you have to always give space when you are working when you are using hashes second program this is a bit smaller if you use three and write third program if you go and use markdown it will be a bit smaller so based on the size if you use one hash then it will be bigger second hash smaller third hash more smaller if you do not want to go and change your use mouse in this case what you can do you can just uh, use hash space uh, using markdown and come out into the uh, command mode you can use one if you use one it will be it will go into the markdown position now if you use two it will bring one more hash if you use three it will use one more hash four more hash five more hash and more small and then you can press shift plus enter and you will be able to work like this so in this case this is basically the markdown wherein you will be getting the result in italics okay let's try once again i'll say one and i'll say markdown okay and if i'll say markdown and if i'll use one okay so this is the way basically you can change the heading okay you can make your cell more creative right so this is all about this jupyter notebook now the next part is if you want to create a new notebook you can use python 3 the main part that you need to use over here is first one is how to save so save and checkpoint will be used to save this particular notebook you can click on save and checkpoint this will checkpoint created 1353 so this has given you time and this whole notebook has been saved and if you want to save it as this if you want to save it to some other directory you can save it like this the best part is don't go for save as just do save and checkpoint and it will be saved to the to the uh, same directory where you are already working now go to download as download as in download as you can download this particular notebook and if you go and click on notebook so this notebook will be downloaded and if you want to go and check it in the folder in downloads you will be having right so this is the way by which basically you can download the particular jupyter notebook so for this particular so this is basically an interface if you want to see how many other shortcuts are available if you want to go and learn python i python numpy scipy so if you want to take the difference you can use help as well okay the other part that i would like to tell you is this is one more thing open the command prompt so this is basically going to give you all the shortcuts which can be used for this jupyter notebook okay you can also go through this fine so this is over okay now uh, i'll close this workbook so how can you close this either you can log out instead of log out just uh, if you want to log out you can close tab now we are in the home folder now if you can see we have just closed it directly so that is why we are in the running stage if you want to change this running stage to shut down so you can click click on this check box and then you can see duplicate shutdown view added these buttons are available now now if you want you can shut it down now this way now the running position uh, running mode is over now you are uh, now it is now the workbook has been shut down if it is a running stage that means that the process is still running in the background okay so these are already created files if you want to go and check for the files you can just click on them and if you can you can see what all course is available there and if you want, don't want you can close it then again it is in a running state so let's uh, shut it down now i'll try to upload so file to upload open and i'll click on upload yeah now can you see it has been uploaded okay so 
if you can go and check this is your file now the same way if you want to create your text file you can create a text file over here and if you want to create a folder you can create a folder let's rename this folder. okay so the main thing is if you click over here if you can see if you want to rename this you can rename from here as well test I'll rename it to test and so if you can see the file are being displayed in the like a notebook then text file is being displayed like a text file and then this is basically a, a folder right so if I'll click on test one so you have several if you want to create a duplicate you can click on duplicate and it will create a duplicate for you if you want to rename it you can rename it we have already seen if you want to download it you can also download it it will be downloaded and if you want to view just just click on view and the notebook will be open either this way or you can just directly click over here right if you want to go on add it you can add it but it will open in most of the like HTML codes which is I don't think so is quite intuitive so better to avoid it and if you want to delete it you can use this one delete selected if you want to delete let's delete this copy one I'll delete this copy one and yeah now it has been deleted okay so this is the way by which basically you can work on and if you want to just shut down multiple you can shut down multiples okay so this is basically then introduction to Jupyter interface try create your own file and just write simple statements whatever statements I have given you just try to write them otherwise we will be moving into the next session wherein we will be starting with the Jupyter notebook and we will be writing our first code so there you won't be facing such issues okay so till then see you in the next lecture goodbye let's look into the agenda for today's session today we will be learning about how we can basically start our python programming we will just write a simple print statement and then we will also understand how can we provide comments in python right so let's move on okay so what we'll do we'll first start with a print statement a simple print statement wherein we will be writing print this is my first program so you do not need to worry about syntaxes you just need to worry about that how can we write a print statement simple print statement and for more details we will be learning in our further lectures okay so let's move on to the Jupyter notebook and I'll show you how we can start with our first program okay so I have opened my Jupyter notebook now uh, I'll rename my notebook as getting started and let's start okay so I'll write print and this is my first program now I have written the first program either I can press control enter I'll say or I can go for run I'll click on run first now can you see this is my first program and a new cell comes up okay now let's another one this is my second line okay and let's have some full stops now instead of clicking on run what I'll do I'll just press control and enter so I'll say control and enter now can you see I have printed this is my second line but using control and enter I cannot go to the next line I'll be able to just print the statement what I'll do I'll just click it once again and now instead of control plus enter what I will do I will just click shift plus enter now on clicking shift plus enter you can see a new cell has come up, come some stuff and this is my second line has already been printed right so let's print one more and now I will learn oh pardon my spelling python and let's press print, let's press shift and enter and can you see now I will learn python okay so these are some simple print statements that we have learned so far try all these try print hello so this is basically a beginning so let's get back to the presentation okay so we have already completed our first print statement first line of code now we will go on commenting so whenever so commenting commenting is basically pretty much required when you are working on any programming language 
so comments are basically the statements that does not get executed so if let's say you have written a thousand two thousand line of course now what do you want so let's say after you after five to ten years you came back and you saw that code this code of thousand to let's say ten thousand lines now will you be able to understand the code at the first glance of course not so commenting is basically required at this moment because this is basically useful to document your code now when you ever whenever you have written some code you will provide a comment onto it that yes this particular chunk of code is going to be used for this particular purpose so this is why we usually provide comments so comments are those line of course that does not get executed okay and in python we can provide comments using hash using hash okay and if you want to comment multiple line of course you can use hash otherwise the best way is control plus slash so let's go to jupyter notebook and comment few lines okay so i have opened my jupyter notebook now what will i do i'll just say the above statements are meant just for first program right now if i'll go and execute this so don't you think this is a code so that is why it is considering it as a code that is why you are getting an error syntax error now what i want i just i don't want to get it executed what i can do i can just press just write just provide comment like hash okay if you want to provide multiples as well it will also be it will also work or else only one will also work now if you go and execute it using shift plus enter using shift plus enter now can you see it doesn't work right so the same way so i have understood how to write a first program and how to comment and document my code right now i'll just provide hash in the beginning and if you can see if i'm not providing hash the line once i'll provide hash the line is converting into green is getting green and it is converting into italics so this is basically a signal so that you can understand that this is basically a comment now now if you go and press shift plus enter it will work no now let's try with how i have understood how to comment but now i am providing multiple lines a uh, multiple multiple lines how will i comment now now what you have done you have provided multiple lines now other you can do what you can do you can just go and click, press here and you can just write hash don't you think this is tedious so that um, if you have 10 5 10 lines uh, each time you have to go to each line you have to press hash so instead what you can do you can just remove these hashes now what you can do you can just select all these rows whichever whatever rows you want to comment and just press control control plus control plus slash and if you press control plus slash all the three lines will be commented now if you want to uncomment it then also you can use control plus ahead slash control plus slash for commenting control plus slash for uncommenting so by this way you can basically command uncomment your code and comment your code now if i'll go and just provide these statements all these four statements print hello print now i will learn python you have already learned python and print this is my second line now if i pro provide all these statements and if i select all, all of them and if i press control plus slash those all will be commented fine so this is the way this is basically a beginning wherein you learned a simple print statements you just need to write a simple code in our further lectures we will be learning about each and every details in python 
for now you understood that hey, yeah this is a way by which we can basically use a jupyter notebook and provided the uh, we have written our first code and then what we have also understood that whenever we are going to write a code we will also provide comments in order to document what exactly is going to happen what exactly is basically happening over here so that in future if i am coming or if some other person is coming and trying to understand our code he should be able to understand what we have basically done right so till then see you in the next lecture goodbye Let's look into the agenda for today's session. So today we will be looking into several arithmetic operations in Python. We will see how we can do addition, subtraction and what are what all are those arithmetic operations we will see going forward. So first what we will be doing, we will do some addition part, then we will do some subtraction of two or more numbers. As you can see 10 plus 4, 10 minus 4, we will add some more numbers as well in Python. Then we will see about multiplication and division wherein we will be multiplying two numbers then we will be dividing two numbers then we'll see about exponentiation wherein we will be uh, raising the powers like 2 to the power 3 is 8 and what is exponentiation i'll show you what exactly it is then we'll see about quotient so quotient if i'll give you a brief idea so when you divide 10 by 4 you get 2.25 but let's say if you want just quotient which is 2 then how are we going to get it similarly modulus is remainder then what exactly it is i'll show you so let's move towards our jupyter notebook and see how we can do such operations so i have opened my jupyter notebook now i'll go and create a new notebook and okay so now let's let's rename this notebook we'll say arithmetic operations you can give spaces as well let's start so what i'll do first i'll do addition and uh, i'll just make it as markdown so that it should be looking good okay then let's see 10 plus 4 so you'll get 14 now 10 plus 5 plus 6 you'll get 21 if you do not want to give spaces over here you can give like 10 plus 2 plus 3 in this way you can do the addition part so you can try as many numbers as possible 10 plus 3 plus 7 9 9 8 plus 2 3 4 5 6 and you, if you want to execute you can execute with shift plus enter now uh, let's move on to subtraction part so i'll say subtraction and i'll say markdown if you do not want to go and uh, use your mouse you can just escape and print uh, and click one and you'll get the style so for subtraction let's subtract 10 minus 4 so 10 minus 4 6 and then 10 minus 4 minus 10 you'll get minus 4 100 minus 25 minus this oops okay so in this way you can get the numbers okay so you can practice subtraction as well let's move on to the next part which is multiplication multiplication and I'll say escape and I'll say 1 and let's shift and top so multiplication 10 multiplied by 4 40 10 multiplied by 5 multiplied by 6 multiplied by 7 and shift enter 2100 13 multiplied by 7 91 so what all operation what all multiplication you want you can do it so if you want you can use decimals as well 87 into 0 0.02 you can use as many as decimals as possible no w is not number so in this way you can get it okay now let's try another one let's say division so division if i'll go with division let's give it some style now in division 10 divided by 4 let's say so you'll get 2.5 100 divided by 25 4.0 let's say 100.25 divided by 34 2.945 so in this way you can try out whichever way you is possible so division is over now what's next so next is exponentiation exponentiation and so i'll just correct it yeah so exponentiation is basically so if i'll say 2 multiplied by 2 
it's 4. But if I say 2 multiplied by 2 multiplied by 2, it's 8. If I say 2 multiplied by 2 multiplied by 2, 16. So as many number of times you can multiply 2. Now instead of multiplying 2 a number of times, what I want is I just directly want 2 multiplied by multiplied 8 times or say 10 times. So that means I'll say it's power 2 to the power 8. You must have studied this in your mathematics a to the power b. So a to the power means b means a is being multiplied by b times. So similarly let's say if you want the power of 2 to the power 3. So in exponentiation in python what you have to do is you just need to provide the first number for which you need to uh, you want it to be multiplied then you can say this cap symbol no not cap symbol in in python we use double star and then we'll see 3 so 3 times you want so 2 to the power 3 is 8 let's say try let's try 3 to the power 2 get 9 let's try uh, 9 to the power 4 you get 6564 6, in this way you can get the another way of doing this power operation to get the power is by using power so i'll use the same set of results i'll use power with 3 comma 2 i'll use power with 9 comma 4 so the first number first number would be the power 1 uh, would be a if it is a to the power b so first number would be a and second number would be b right first number would be a and second number would be b in this way you can get try practice practice it try as much as possible if you find any issues if you are not able to do anything just let me know okay moving to the next part which is uh, quotient okay so what is quotient so i'll just make it more visible okay now <clears throat> what is quotient so when i'm dividing 10 by 4 uh, let's say 10 divided by 3 you'll get 3.3.333 what what i want is when i'm dividing 10 by 3 i'm getting a quotient of 3 plus a remainder of 1 right so what i want i just want this 3 part just 3 part so what i'll do i'll just say 10 and say double slashes and 10 3 you'll get 3 now let's try some another way so 40 is 7 5 let's try decimal part 35.5 by 7 you get 5 let's try 42 by 7 you get 6 let's say 67 by 11 you get 6 let's say 100 by 11 you get 9 point. Oh, not this we'll give double slashes 9 so by providing double slashes you will get the quotient now the another part which is if you'll go and see over here which is remainder how are we going to get the remainder well, we also call it as modulus so modulus let's try modulus so tan when instead of double slashes what you can go give over here you can get percentage 3 you'll get 1 68 percentage 11 you'll get 2 100 percentage 11 you'll get 1 now if you want to check let's try another way let's try 70.75 divided by 5 you get 14.15 now i'll say 70.75 double by 5 14 70.75 percentage 5 you get 0.75 in this way you'll get the result now if you want to find out if your answer is correct or not the best way is quotient multiplied by so i'll just comment it quotient multiplied by your uh, number with which you are dividing with which you are dividing and number with which you are dividing and addition of remainder or modulus so if you want to try so let's try with the uh, let's try um, 68 so quotient is 11 multiplied by the number with which you were dividing it so a uh, quotient is i'm really sorry quotient is uh 68 so quotient will be 6 let's, let's try it 68 and 7 will get 9 
and 68 if you say percent is 7 you will get 5 okay now let's try 7 multiplied by 9 plus 5 what you will get is 68 so in this way if you want to check that is if your quotient is correct and remainder is correct then you can try it this way so try your arithmetic operations try all the operations in, with multiple numbers subtraction multiplication division exponentiation quotient remainder everything try it out and if you have any problem come with me i'll solve it i'll try to solve it fine till then thank you so much goodbye let's quickly look into the agenda for today's session so today's session is all about variables so first we will be looking into what exactly are variables then we will see about valid variable names so in python we cannot name a variable we cannot give any name to a variable there are several conditions which needs to be matched before give providing a name to a variable so what all conditions are there we will be look uh, we will be seeing about it after this we will be looking into the arithmetic operations on variables so uh, these are the same arithmetic operations that we did in the previous session but this time what we will be doing we will be providing we will be assigning a number to a variable and then we will be doing those arithmetic operations so let's move on and let's see how we can uh, proceed further so what are variables so variables are basically defined to store values now there are several uh, so whenever we are working on any data so it might be possible that the data could be of a character could be of an integer could be of a boolean value so characters are basically like a name like if i'll say sam so sam is a name and integers or let's say numbers are basically like 12 13 100 25 so if you think about characters can we do any addition operation to a character we cannot do such operations there are several other operations which can be done on a character like we, if we want to find a some part of the string which cannot be done on a number if we have 100 number it's not like we will be we will say that we do not want 100 we want 10 so this is not the case for characters this is the case similarly we cannot multiply two characters so similar way boolean values are basically true and false so if the statement is true then it will be performing some other operation if the statement is false then it will be performing some other, some other operations what are boolean values for the for time being just remember that boolean values are basically two first is false the second one is true we will be in our further sessions we will be looking about boolean values in detail for now just remember this so um if so in python so in general in general we know that characters integers and boolean values are different and they have different arithmetic operations now in python or in any programming language how are we going to define that uh, if the user has provided the input that user has provided is either of character is either of integer or is it boolean value or is it any some other data type so there are other data types as well which I, we will be discussing further for now how are we going to distinguish it how the programming language is going to distinguish it so let's take an example let's let's come to uh, so how basically programming language can distinguish it it will be coming into data type so characters is one of the data type just remember this integer is the another data type boolean values is another data type now how python is going to understand that data type then that we will be looking afterwards for now let's move on to variables so let's say the best way of assigning a number to assigning any value to a variable is giving a var giving a name to a variable let's say in this case we have given a name to a variable as var and we have provided a value as 30 so at this point if someone asks you what is var like what what do you have in var so var is basically storing 30 in it so we will say what is var then var is 30 now let's say we have updated our var and now we have made it 40 now if anyone asks you what is var 
then we will say it is 40. In this way, we can basically assign a name, assign a number or assign any, any character or anything, any type of value to a variable. Now, let's move on to valid variables. Again. So, sir, as I told you, so in Python, we cannot just, uh, we cannot give any name to a variable. There are several conditions that needs to be fulfilled before giving a name to a variable. And what are those conditions we will be looking into it. So the first condition is variable names can only start with a letter or an, under, or an underscore. So letter is basically from A to Z, whether it is a small caps or whether it is large caps, both are same and both are uh, not both are same. We can use letters in this case. So these are characters basically. And if you do not want to started with the letter you can start it with underscore the second condition is variable name should contains only numbers letters or underscore letters and underscore we are already knowing we already know about it but the third thing is number so a variable name can contains a number but the thing is a variable name should not start with a number okay so here i have provided a list i have provided several examples wherein you can see if they are valid or not valid so let's consider the first one var1 so it is a valid variable name why it is valid because it is starting with a letter and it is containing only number and letter and character the second one var1 and then question mark so it is invalid why it is invalid because it is containing question mark the third one is var1 underscore var1 underscore yeah it is correct it is valid it is fulfilling all the conditions then one var one var is not correct. Why it is not correct? Because it is starting with a number. Underscore var is correct. Underscore one var is correct. Uh, so it is mentioned as invalid. I'll just correct it. So I have corrected it. So underscore one var is correct. And var underscore one is also correct. Dot var is not correct because it should not contain any dot. Right? Now let's try these. Let's try and create a variable and assign a value to it. So I have opened my Jupyter Notebook. I'll rename my worksheet as uh, let's say variables and let's try first creating a variable var equal to 10. Let's say what is var? 10. Now what I'll do I'll just update my var to 20 and now if I'll say and see what is my var just 20 right. Now what we need to do we'll try our valid variable names. So I'll say var underscore 1 is equal to 10. It is correct. I'll say 1 var. Sorry, 1 var is equal to 10. And it will give me an invalid syntax, right? If I say underscore var is equal to 10, it will work. Now, one more thing that I would like to tell you is underscore var is equal to 10 is correct. Now, if I say underscore var, is equal to 20 that is also correct now if you go and check underscore var it is still 10 and underscore var it is 20 why is this so because in python everything is case sensitive so if you're providing small v over here and if you're providing capital v over here so both are different this is a different variable this is a different variable now what you have to do, you have to go and try all these operations and you will, if you find any error, if you find anything different, just let me know. For now, I'll just try one more, one question mark is equal to 10 and you'll find an invalid syntax. So this is a way by which you can basically assign a variable. Moving on, assigning values to a variable. So this is the only way by which we, we, are, we are basically assigning a value to a variable you can use equal to sign i never use double equal to sign it has different meaning i'll show you afterwards arithmetic operation of variable let's try arithmetic operation let's say there are two numbers x is equal to 3 and y is equal to 2 and then we have all these operations which we did earlier now let's try all of them okay so i have opened my jupyter notebook let's move on let's say arithmetic operations Okay, and uh, just go to markdown and just change the style of it. 
now let's give x equal to 2 and y equal to 3 okay first one what should be the first one what first operation that we should be doing we'll say addition and we'll try x plus y we'll get 5 right 2 plus 3 is 5 so this is correct the second one subtraction pardon my spelling if it is wrong x minus y x minus y is minus 1 that is correct let's move on to the next part multiplication and let's say x multiplied by y it is 6 right correct let's move on to the next part division let's say division so x divided by y what should be the answer is 0.6666 right let's move on instead of division what we will be trying here exponentiation i say x and let's try first way which is uh, what's our first way so it is x double star y you'll get it we'll try another way we'll try power method pow and x comma y you'll get it now let's try the another one which is quotient special operation and x double slash y right, right zero correct and what about remainder or say modulus x percentage y 2 so if you can see we have tried all our operations and they gave us same number they gave us same result which we usually get from 2 and 3 now instead of so what exactly is the requirement of variable is we can store store anything 2 3 any character any sort of thing into a variable so that why we are basically creating a variable because it is going to store in a memory with the name x with the name y so whenever we want to use this whenever we want to use 2 or 3 we can go and directly use x and y instead of using 2 and 3 each time right so this is the way we are creating the variables so what we have learned so far we have created the variables we did some arithmetic operations in it and why are we creating variables that also you got to know about so try and try to uh, do all these exercises and uh, if you have any issues just let me know uh, if you are facing any issues with uh, uh, creating the variable names just let me know about it till then thank you so much and goodbye Let's look into the agenda for today's session. Today we will be learning about data types. So first we will see what are data types. Then we will see some basic data type types that are available in Python. Then we will see how can we basically verify the data type of a variable. And at the end we will see some uh, type casting. Fine. So let's move on. So data types. So uh, let's say if we have been given a character and if we have been given a number or if we have been given a boolean value then how are we going to distinguish among them so let's say if somebody has given us a complex number then how basically are we going to say that it is a complex number and it is different from a real number so the same way in any programming language if we have provided any value to that programming language then how this programming language will be able to identify that if the uh, if the value provided is a character or if the value provided is a number or if the value provided is a boolean value or if the value provided is a complex number how is how the programming language is going to identify the type of the variable and this type of the data that we have provided to the uh, provided to the programming language is called as the data type so whenever we create a variable in any programming language to store a value the variable create creates re, create the variable created represents a memory location where the value gets stored now if let's say we have uh, created a variable in python just 30 and so when we create this variable a space will be allocated in the memory so let's say this is RAM and so we have created a variable var1 wherein we have provided a value 30 to the var1 then we have created a variable var2 var3 and then var4 
so all these variables will be assigned a specific memory location in RAM. So now moving on to data type. So it might be possible that the values that we have provided and we have asked to store could be different set of values, could be integers, could be characters, boolean or even floating number. So even integers are 22, if 22 is an integer, but 22.25 is a float, is a decimal number. So now let's come to a situation that uh, we know that we can perform arithmetic in operations on numbers, but we cannot perform arithmetic operations on characters. We cannot multiply a string two times or three times. We can do the same thing to a number only. So how the programming language is going to identify the type of the input data. Now in many programming languages like C, C++, we have to explicitly define the type of the variable. So when we create a variable, let's say in C++, when we create a variable, then we have to specifically assign the data type of the variable. Let's say in this case, we have provided int as the data type. So int is basically integer and then we have assigned some value to the variable var. Now var now C++ will be able to understand that this the variable that has been provided is basically an integer. Okay. Now diff there are different number of bytes that are basically provided to each of the uh, each of the data types. So let's say if it is an integer then a different byte has been provided if it is a character a different byte has been provided so there are different different bytes that are being provided uh, we can learn about it separately so it's not much required just think that uh, just have this understanding that there are certain different type of data uh, data that we have the, that we already have in the universe and how the programming language is going to identify that we need to understand so in Python, the type of the variable is interpreted by the Python itself and we do not, do not need to define the data type of the variable. So we have already seen that we can create a variable and we can assign a value to it. So when we are assigning a value to any of the variable, then only the variable is going to get defined. So by looking at the value that we have already provided to this variable, the Python will interpret it as an integer. Fine. So there are uh, different basic data types that we have in Python. So we have basically six data types. So these are those, actually these are more than six. So first let's talk about integer. So integer is like 5, 10, 22, 36, 535, 0. So these are basically integers which do not have any decimal numbers. Now float are the one which have decimal numbers, right? 5.25, 3.26, 5.32. Okay. Complex are the one like 3 plus 4j. So in mathematics, we already know that uh, 3 plus 4i, we used to define complex number as 3 plus 4i. But in Python, instead of i, we provide j. So if you'll write 3 plus 4i, then it will show you as incorrect and it will show you as incorrect syntax. But if you'll provide like 3 plus 4j, then it will consider it as a complex number and it will perform all the operations as you want. Okay. Boolean, we already know true comma false. So a string is basically something so how Python is going to understand if the value that we have provided is a string or an integer. So whenever you have provided any codes, then it will consider it as an, it is a string. If you have provided true or false and you have not provided any codes, then it will consider it as a value. Sorry, sorry, Boolean. If you have provided the, in this form, then it will be a complex. If you have provided decimals and if you have not provided any codes, then it will consider it as a float. And if you have not provided any decimal and you have just provided a number, then it will be an integer. So in this way, Python is going to interpret your values. Now coming to the data structures that we have list. So list is a data structure which basically contains different set of values. It could be an integer, it could be a string, it could be a Boolean value. It can store any of the data type. And the best way of uh, identifying the list is the square brackets are the square brackets. In case of tuple, everything is same, only that uh, only the difference is you have to define a tuple in parentheses. So uh, we will learn about list tuple set in dictionary in the in our further lectures. For now you can uh, you can just remember this list can be defined list, tuple, set and dictionary all 
can contain any sort of data type integer float complex boolean string but uh, but list are defined in square brackets tuple are defined in parentheses set are defined in curly brackets while dictionaries are also defined in curly brackets so dictionary is different from list tuple and set by what way so basically dictionary contains a key value pair so one is basically a key and sam is a pair which is a value two is a key and sara is a value so let's go back to jupyter notebook and i'll show you i'll create all these data types and i'll show you the examples of them okay so i have opened my jupyter notebook i'll rename the notebook as data type now let's start with creating a variable x is equal to 10 so you have basically created this variable okay now this this is basically an integer i'll show you how basically we can find the uh, type of this variable so if you want to verify the type of this variable what sort of data type it is you can just say type you can use type method and you can provide the variable name so if you go and check it can you see int so basically python has interpreted as int now if i'll provide my value as 10 in course right in course we have provided if you go and check check the type of this x now can you see this is a string so basically whatever is you are going to provide in course it will be considered as a string and if you have not provided any course you have just provided the number then it will be considered as a integer now if i'll go and ch change this to 10.25 right now if you go and check for the type of x now can you see we got a floating number so this is basically the third data type that we uh, i was talking about this is float wherein you have the decimal values where you do not have any decimal de values it will be considered as an integer and it will be the type will be int here the type will be float right now let's let's show you something else true x is equal to true is basically if you go and check the well type of x it is bool right if you go and so boolean values we will talk discuss about boolean values in a further lecture so we have already uh, discussed about boolean values so if you go and check for type of x it will be bool okay fine so if we have not discussed about boolean values we'll uh, discuss about it in a further lectures if we have already so you must be already knowing about the type of the boolean value right so you have understood the difference between integer string float and boolean value now comes the complex number we will not be discussing much about this complex number if you'll provide 3 plus 2i 3 is basically your real part 2 is basically your complex part now i this if you'll provide 3 plus 2i it will be considered as invalid but if you'll provide 3 plus 2j it will be considered as a valid operation so this is basically a complex number so if you go and check for type of x you get complex right now so you basically understood integer string float bool and complex now come back to the data structure so let's say we have a data structure like list so let's say hello and true hello okay fine so if you'll go and check for x this is your x and you have provided we have provided the square bracket so if you'll go and set search for the type of x it will be a list if you provide your all the similar values in uh in a parenthesis then if you go and check for the type of x it will be tuple and if you print your x then you can see that we have we got the parenthesis so parenthesis means it is a tuple fine uh, let's move on so <clears throat> the next one is set so one two three and hello so if you have provided in curly brackets and if you go and print it and if you go and search for the type of x it will be a set right so this is a set so we will learn about set tuple and list in a further lectures for now you can basically uh, remember that it all these three contains can can contain different sort of data type and set has been defined in a curly brackets list are defined in square brackets tuple are defined in 
parentheses. Now the come the comes the last one wherein we have a dictionary. So if you have let's say black, black is a key and 11 let's say is the value. It's a key value pair. Red 12 green 13. So this is a key value pair. If you'll go and check for x, this is your x, which is black is a key, red is a key and green is a key. 11, 12, 13 are the values. If you'll go and check for the type of x, can you see it's a dict. So dict is basically dictionary. And you have already understood how can we basically verify the data type. So if you want to verify what sort of data type it is, it is using type. You can do it. Now type casting. Okay, so what is type casting? How can we do it? So type casting is basically if you have, let's say, so basically we will be doing it on integer, float, and string. We will be working on these because you'll get mostly these sort of examples. So let's say uh, x is equal to 12. Let's say this is a string. If you'll go and search for type of x, it is a string. Now, if I'll say, if I'll consider int and I'll provide x. Now, it if you'll go and put your x, which is a character in int, then it will be converted into an integer. Now, if you'll go and let's put it in a variable y is equal to int x. If you'll go and search for type of y, can you see it is an integer now? So first we'll work on these operations. So if you if you have 12, 12 is basically your string. And if you use a constructor, so this is basically int is a constructor. If you use a constructor of 12 on a character, it will be converted into in an integer, right? Now, if you use 12, normal 12, we already know 12 is an integer, so it will be 12. If let's say if I provided a floating number, 12.25, this 12.25 is basically a floating number, so it will be converted into 12, into an integer, 12, right? If you'll provide, so don't worry, it will not be round off any time. If you have provided 13.97, it will be converted into 13. If you have provided 13.99, then also it will be converted into 13. If you have provided 14.01, then it will be converted into 14. Right, so this is basically operations on integer when you are using int, when you want to convert any string of float into an integer. Now let's see for float. So float is basically if you have provided 12 character, so it will be converted to 12.0. Float, if you have provided like 12.25, then also it will be converted into float. If you have provided float as 12, 12 is basically an integer, so it will be also converted into 12.0. Right? Now let's go back to string. So string, if you have a string already, let's say 12, then it will be converted into 12. We know that it is already a string. If you have an integer, if you have provided an integer and you are trying to convert it into a string, into a string, then it will be converted into a string. If you have a floating number, 12.245, then also it will be converted into a string. Now I'll give you some solid situation let's say if, if we you are trying to convert hello into float now this is hello is a string and you are trying to convert it into float but do you know if hello is any number it is not a number so this will give you an error could not convert string to float so float can only convert the floating literals so floating literals are basically like 12.25 13.25 which are basically numbers if you are providing a string if you are even providing hello 12.25 then also it is a string so it will not be converted right same case applies for int wherein if you will provide hello it will not work it will never work right even for int if you will try 12.25 it will also not work right you got an error or invalid literal for int with base 10 so how can we solve this problem so in order to solve this problem, what you can do, you can just convert this 12.25 first into a float, which will be converted into float. Now what you can do, you can just convert it into a string. Now you will get 12. 
so if you want to check the type of this so if you want to check the type of this particular variable and if you want to check the type of this particular variable you can go and check it right this is an integer this is a float right let's get back to the presentation okay so we have basically understood all these data types and what are their differences then we also learned about verifying the data type in python so we use type method in order to know the data type of uh, any variable and then we also understood about type casting so wherein if we want to convert any data type into another we can do it as follows so in 12 so if you 12 is your integer already so it will be 12 12.28 if you try int constructor on it it will be 12 if you try a character it will also be converted into the 12 okay but if you have provided hello which is basically not a name not a number or not an integer then it will throw you an error about the literals so integer int can only convert integer literals which are like 12 13 14 15 16 if you are providing 12.25 as well then also it will not allow it so you have to first convert it into float then you can only convert into integer so this is basically useful i'll tell you where in what situation this is basically useful so Let's say you are basically passing a text file or an excel file so if you are passing an excel file then all the values let's say those are numbers but in excel those are basically defined as a as a general let's say so if it is 12.25 12 or 12.25 and it is being defined as general so when you will pass that file into python it will consider it as a string it will consider it as a character in that case you will find a problem to so how can you do the arithmetic operations on these particular values in those cases what you will do you will convert each of those values into an integer into a float whichever suits you then only you will be able to work on that data or then only you will be able to do the or all the arithmetic operation or whatever operations you want okay so this is all about data types i think you have learnt that would be quite clear to you what exactly are data types and how can we basically verify a data type and how can we basically uh, convert our data type into another so uh, till then practice as much as you can and if you have any issues just let me know so see you in the next lecture goodbye let's quickly look into the agenda for today's session today we will be looking into uh, user input and print statements so if let's say uh, you're working on a project wherein what you want you want an user input let's say you want user to input to give you some string or to give you some number you want an input from a an user now how are we going to get that input from the user and how are we going to store it and then how are we going to use it all those things we will be looking into this session then we will be looking into printed statements so uh, we already know that uh, if you want to print anything in python we can say print and then we can provide parentheses and then we can provide uh, the statement in double quotes now let's say instead what we want is when we are providing a print statement then what we want is along with the statement we also want to provide a variable how are we going to provide it then let's say there are multiple variables that needs to be come into the print statement then how are we going to do it all those things will be learned into this part then we will see about formatting string so there are several ways by which we can basically format our string what are those ways we will looking we will be looking into it in this session so let's move on and get our hands on so first is user input so if you want to get an user input we use input keyword in python what you have to do you have to just provide input and then brackets if you want to provide if you want to uh, provide any string then you can give you a string otherwise it's not even required so let's let's move on to jupyter notebook and uh, do the same exercise so i have opened my jupyter notebook let's rename this uh, worksheet i'll say uh, user input and print statement okay 
uh, we are also we will be doing formatting as well so I'll say print formatting okay so let's first look into user input I'll just comment it uh, uh, I'll just comment it and say markdown okay so the first way is uh, let's say input and I won't provide any string into this I'll just say input parenthesis and I'll play, uh, press shift enter so if you can see now a dialog box has opened and if you want to provide any anything any sort of uh, input you can provide this I'll say 10 enter now it will be printed because we have not provided any statement print or any such thing we have not we are not storing it, it is just printed so in this situation at this point this is of no use now let's try another one I'll say input now in this case what I'll say enter your age okay now can you see enter your age so it has come it has been printed as a statement now it is asking you and in in this dialog box you need to provide it I'll say 24 it will just print it it will just show you in the console now how are we going to use this input I'll say I'll create a variable x I'll say x is equal to input and I'll say enter your age again shift enter now enter your age I'll say 10 now this statement is over now if I'll go and check what my x is can you see it is 10 right so this input value the input that we got from user has now been stored in x and whenever you will print x it will show you 10 but can you see this single course over there this means that the input that we got from user is basically a character so the use the input that we got from user is basically a character now in case we don't want it to be a character we want to be a string uh, sorry we want it to be an integer so what we will be doing we'll just say x is equal to and we'll change the data type of this in order to change the data type of any string to any string to a uh, integer we can say we can provide int before it or if you want you can provide float also I'll show you float as well so you'll say 10 now if I'll go and check x oh 10 I'll go and check x it's 10 right and you don't see any course in it now if I'll go and check type of x it is integer right same way if I say I don't want integer I want float and I'll put input and uh, your age I'll say shift enter say 10 and if I'll go and just print my x it is 10.0 that means this is float let's check it again it is float so this way by this way this is a good learning for you this way we can basically uh, change the data type of the input and this this int and then brackets and then you have any number any string so this we can use whenever you want but remember now let's let's try another one x is equal to so I'll use the same one I'll say enter your age I'll say great I don't know my age now can you see invalid return for int with base 10 great I don't know my age because this int is not able to convert this string into an integer right so that is why it is giving you an error so remember whenever you have such condition you have to provide always you have to provide the numbers then only it will be able to convert it I'll say again I'll say 25 and yeah
right now let's print the x again yeah 24 so what's next so we got the user input now let's let's move on to our ppt again so user input has uh, is over let's move on to print statement so how are we going to print anything so we can print anything on console using print keyword the simpler way print and whatever you want to print so let's do our hands on i have opened my jupyter notebook we already know that the x value is 25 now let's print so i'll say print if i say print x you'll get 25 that is correct if i'll use print i'll say 25 it will print 25 because 25 is a number if i'll go and print and if let's say what i want is if i say y y is not defined so whatever is defined that only you can provide print here y is not defined that is why you are not able to print it if i say print and y then you will be able to print it so whenever you are providing a character you have to provide in in single quotes or double quotes so let's say uh, i'll say my number my age is x now how am i going to provide x the first way is this comma and x my age is 25 what it will do it will take your first string it will take your first uh, string and then give you a space then it will give you x right now this is called as formatting what exactly the we have done here we have done formatting the same formatting can be done in multiple ways and what are those ways we will be looking about it so i have opened my presentation so let's move on so formatting print statement so we can format print statement as follows okay let's let's start taking an example so let's say uh, we will take sam sam is a person sam is your friend basically and sam um, now we will ask sam that he can provide his age as an input whatever sam's age is his father is always 30 years older than sam so if sam is providing an input as 20 that his age is 20 we will say his father age is 20 plus 30 which is 50 similarly if he is providing his age as 30 that means his father is 60 if he is providing his age as 10 that means his father is as 40 let's move on so what we need we need the output as sam is so whatever input he has provided sam's age years old and his father is this much years old right in this way we need the output so the simple statement that we know sam is then we do not need to provide a space over here i'll just correct it out and we can try this statement and his father is y years old now let's let's make this program so i have opened my jupyter notebook uh, let's say formatting print statement okay and i'll change it to markdown shift enter okay now what are we going to get here is uh, we'll say x is equal to input we are taking an in user input over here we'll say sam and enter your age now in this way sam is going to provide his age what we will be doing we will be converting it into an integer right uh, let's let's not converting let's not convert it to an integer okay and say so sam is saying my age is 25 let's print x 25 but it is a character now we know that his father age is always 30 more than x so we'll say x plus 30 right oh you got an error why why did you get an error can only concatenate string not integer to string 
so here we are basically if your addition is basically an operation provided to the strings as well wherein if you say hello plus hello it will return you hello hello but in integer you cannot add it add a string to an integer right so what we have to do we have to convert this x into an integer right either you can convert your x over here or you can convert your x over here whichever suits you whichever way suits you you can do it what i'll do i'll just change my input from here i'll say int input sam enter your age now he'll say 25 i'll get 25 i'll say x is 25 y is x plus 30 so if you want to print y so y is 20, 55 now let's come to the next part what we have to do we have to print so print uh, we'll say sam is comma x years old and his father is y years old full stop sam is 25 years old and his father is 35 years old pretty awesome right but it seems to me quite tedious to provide double quotes each time i really do not want this so what i will do i will do some formatting okay so this is the first statement print sam is we have already tried this now try another way of formatting so this is a way where what you are going to do is you will be providing the whole string in double quotes and you will be giving your variables in curly brackets a and b what you want a is dot format you will be using dot format remember dot format is being used and in format you will say a is equal to x which is x is your sam's age b is equal to y y is your five sam's father age right now let's try this so i have opened my jupyter notebook let's try this one print i'll say sam is in curly brackets i'll say a years old and his father is say b say years old right now when you have completed this string when you have you have finished with this string you say dot format and you have to provide what is a a is x b is y Instead of x, if I say 10, b is 20. Sam is 10 years old and his father is 20 years old. Whatever you are providing here, but we know that is x and b is y that we need to print. Then you will get Sam is 25 years old and his father is 55 years old. Right? Now let's try another way. So the another way is what we have to do we have to provide so this here one thing is wrong i'll show you directly i'll use this statement so this is the correction that i need to do i'll do it in the pre uh, presentation so sam is if you can provide the integer one one means corresponding to x two means corresponding to y but i have provided one over here so that is why my result will be incorrect i'll show you directly into the jupyter notebook okay so print sam is what one years old and his father is one as i provided one so i'll say one years old dot the same way format and here you do not need to provide a a or b we do not have a or b so we'll say x comma y instead of x comma y if you want 10 comma 20 let's try 10 comma 20. Uh, so here is one mistake so the index is always started with zero and it always go with one so first one will be considered as zero the second one will be considered as one right so that is why you are getting Sam is 20 years old and his father is 20 years old. Now if I go and change it to x, comma y, 
will get Sam is 35 years old and his father is 35 years old. If I'll go and change it to 0 and I'll change it to 0 as well, you'll get Sam is 25 years old and his father is 25. But we want Sam is 25 years old and his father is 55 years old. So pardon me and 0 it is always going to start with 0 and so 0 this will be a 0th index and this will be a 1th index right in this way you can format it so there is another way as well let's look into it so i have corrected this one starting with 0 and then ending with 1 now the fourth one is a pretty easy you do not need to provide 0 or 1 anything it will always consider in ascending order so the first one the first bracket will be considered as the first one the second bracket will be considered as the second one let's try this in jupyter notebook okay so let's try this print i'll say sam is i won't provide anything over here years old and his father is years old dot format and what we will be providing here is let's say provide 1020 oh let's correct print yeah sam is 10 years old and his father is 20 years old because we have provided 10 and 20 now instead of 10 and 20 what we will be providing we will provide x and y so x is 25 years old and his father is 35 years old so these are four ways by which you can basically format your print statement I preferably use this statement this is I would recommend this statement because here you are basically providing your indexes based on which you are getting the result here you are not providing anything but this is quite helpful here you have to provide whatever variable you are using over here you have to assign a value to it fine so practice user inputs practice your print statement practice your formatting if you find any issues if you have any ambiguity just let me know we'll try to solve it till then see you and goodbye uh, today's session is very much important and today's session is about indentation so i'll rename my work workbook as indentation so what is indentation in python so if you talk about any programming language, let's say C, C++, Java, or maybe R. So whenever you create a function or whenever you create if else statement, whenever you create for while loops, let's say loops, or if you create a class, then whenever you are creating these functions or if else any such object in python in any of the programming language then we usually provide the conditions or the statements under sometimes we provide parentheses sometimes we provide uh, somewhere we provide um, curly brackets so this is basically an example or this is basically some kind of a mandatory uh, let's say procedure that we need to follow so the same way in python we have indentation so i'll just comment it out so let's say if you are creating a for loop i'll give you an example of for loop so for i in range uh, or let's say if i'll give you an example of if and else statement so if x is greater than one now after any such thing if or function you are creating a function or if you are creating a for loop or any class then you have to give a colon operator this is mandatory so in c++ you give brackets the same way here you have to give the colon operator so basically when you give a colon operator then python will consider python will interpret that the next line of code that is going to come will basically belongs to if condition right for the next line if you can see so if you see here so if i press enter then it goes directly to a, to a space. It is not coming directly over here. So basically this is a tab. So if you give a tab over here, then it will, the cursor will come to this position. 
so the space this this is basically called as indentation if you are creating a if loop if you are creating a if statement if you are creating a else statement and if you want to give your statements over here statements those all should be coming after a tab right because if you are providing the statements over here if you are writing your statements from the beginning then the python will not be able to interpret if the condition of the statement that you have provided is basically belongs to if loop or not fine so you should always give a tab to it which is basically indentation then you have to give all the statements then if you are going for else loop then the same way else loop if and then you have to provide a colon operator and then you have to press enter and there should be an indentation of tab right if let's say here if you are creating a for loop for i in range 0 to 5 here also if you are creating a for loop so in order to so when you are going to the next length then you have to give the second tab over here so basically this is your first tab this is your first tab this is your second tab so if you are giving the tab that means the condition that you are basically giving that the statement that you are basically giving belongs to for loop so for is coming under else then statement is coming under for for okay so i'll just give you an example of this so this is a mandatory condition that we need to follow that this is a mandatory procedure that we need to follow i'll give you some example of let's say if x is greater than one we'll talk about if and else statement uh in very detail in if and else and about all these for and uh, functions for loop and functions but for now you should remember you should learn about indentation so i'll give you an example is if and x is equal to one if x is equal to is, is greater than one print correct and okay now let's let's try this okay so if i'll try this one you won't get anything so what i'll do i'll just say x is greater than or equal to one so you got the result is correct but if let's say if i'll provide the print statement from here it will give you an error expected and indented block so basically this statement should be coming under if loop right so that is why you have to give this in a you have to press a tab and then you have to give this statement so if i'll remove the colon operator as well you'll see invalid syntax so whenever you are writing if statement or else statement you have to provide the colon operator so this will be correct now now i'll show you the for loop so for i in range let's say 0 to 5 0 comma 5 and i'll say print i now it will print 0 1 2 3 4 but if I won't provide colon over here, so this is basically an invalid syntax. So I have to provide colon. And the second thing that I need to provide is the indentation. Expected and indented block. Okay. So I'll say like this. Now if I'll what I'll do, I'll just provide if statement over here. If i is greater than 3, then print i. Now if I'll go and try this one, again I'll get an error because it is expecting an indented block so it should come after a tab now it will print 4 right similar is the case with while loop similar is the case with function if you want to uh, so we'll learn about functions in functions and for now you should be just remember that whenever you're creating a function if else statement class or whenever you're creating for while loops then if you have provided the for conditions then you have to provide the colon operator if you have provided the if condition you have to provide the colon operator and then for the next statement which you are providing print or any sort of operation that should be coming after an in, after a tab tab is basically an indentation so it should be followed fine so uh, if you want to practice practice this but uh, if we will be working on if else statement then you will have to practice all of these so for the time being just remember that indentation is must and is an important procedure this needs to be followed in python fine so till then see you in the next lecture goodbye let's quickly look into the agenda for today's session today we will be learning about assignment operators what are assignment operators why do we use assignment operators and how do we implement them in python we will look into this in this session 
okay so assignment operators so assignment operators are basically used to assign a value to a variable so we have already studied about variable how do we assign a value to a variable in python we have already studied about it so let's take an example x is equal to 5 so this is basically one of the way by which we can assign a value to a variable so equals to is also called as an assignment operator fine so this is the list wherein i have provided various assignment operators and how do we use them so let's go to the first one this first one we have already talked about it is equal to which is one of the assignment operator the second one is plus equal to so plus equal to is also considered as so we take we can also call it as x is equal to x plus 10 so let's say x is equal to 5 in this case now if we'll say x is equal to x plus 10 that means now the value of x is 15 okay now instead of if you do not want to write it like x is equal to x plus 10 what you can write is x e plus equal to 10 this is also as similar so x is equal to x minus 10 x is equal to x divided by 10 x is equal to x percent is 10 all these operators if you can see how we can write it so we will remove this x and we will bring our operator before equal to sign x minus equal to 10 x divided by equal to 10 x percent is equals to 10 x uh, modulus equal to x uh, quotient equal to 10 and x to the power 3 so these are some of the operations these are the operators that we will be using and these are some of the operations that we will be doing and this is the result so let's go to jupyter notebook and uh, try all these assignment operators and let's see what is the what's the result that we are going to get so i have opened my jupyter notebook let's rename it to assignment operator so i have renamed it to assignment operator now let's say x is equal to 5 fine if i'll go and print x it is 5 now when i'll say x is equal to x plus 10 this means that now earlier my value of x was 5 now x will be 5 plus 10 which is 15 if you go and check your x it will be 15 right so the same way if i'll say x we can also write it as an assignment operator x plus equals to 10 so if you go and check your x it will be 25 right x was 15 now it is 25 let's try with minus 1 x is equal to x minus 10 now what will be the x so x is 25 x we have 25 already so 25 minus 10 x will be 15 in this case right now we can try this by using x minus equal to operator equals to 10 what you just need to do you just need to forget about this x you need to bring this minus sign or plus and whatever operator you have uh, whatever arithmetic operator you have just bring it before equal to and it will be as similar to this operation x minus equals to 10 now go and print x it will be 5 right 15 minus 10 is equal to 5 now let's try a multiplied operation x is equal to x multiplied by 3 fine what is x 15 right 5 multiplied by 3 is 15 now let's try this again x multiply equal to 3 now what will be x 15 multiplied by 3 45 so x is 45 right now let's try division so x i'll divide x x is equal to x divided by 5 x is equal to x divided by 3 okay uh, okay let's divide it by 5 x is equal to x divided by 5 now what will be my x in this case x will be 9 so let's try x x is equal to 9 now instead what i'll try x x divided equal to 3 which is x is equal to x divided by 3 now 3 divided by 9 9 divided by 3 what will be the result 3 so x go and check x x is 3 right what is the next operation that we have we have already covered um, addition subtraction multiplication division now let's try uh, power operation okay so x is equal to x to the power 3 
now what will be x 3 3 is a 9 3 2 3 multiplied by 3 is 9 multiplied by 3 is 27 so it should be 27 right if i'll say uh, x to the power equal to 2 right so it is basically s is equal to x to the power 2 so if you go and check your x it is 729 right correct now uh, we'll try one more operation x uh, now we will be trying to get the remainder which is modulus so x percent x is equal to x percentage 10 what will be x 9 right 10 divided by 729 it will be 72 as the quotient and 9 will be your remainder right so what i can also do i'll say x percentage equals to uh, less divided by 2 less divided by 2 or okay less divided by 2 so what will be x it will be 1 right fine uh, okay so what's the next operation that we can do here let's multiply it by again x multiply equal to uh, 25 what will be x 25 right now what's the next operation quotient x let's divide less x is equal to x and we'll try to get the quotient using 2 so what will be the quotient 12 right now let's uh, try it with uh, 5 5 would be good so x we'll use the same operator and 2 let's go and see x 6 oh sorry i shouldn't have be I shouldn't okay fine so 2 is also fine so we get 6 right so this is correct good okay so these are some of the operations that uh, that are basically uh, that basically comes into assignment operators we will be using these operations when we will be writing our for loop or while loop so there you will be using these conditions x is equal to x plus 5 these kind of operations will be used over there so instead if you do not want to use x is equal to x plus 5 you can also use x plus is equal to 5 so uh, try practice all these assignment operators if you have any questions if you got any issue just let me know uh, till then see you in the next lecture goodbye let's look into the agenda for today's session today we will be looking into relational operators so what are relational operators and how we can perform several operations on these re uh, relational operators using these relational operators in python we are going to look into it okay so let's move on uh, so relational operators basically we have uh, six type of relational operators in python in python or in anywhere in any programming language you will find only these six uh, relational operators one would be less than second would be less than equal to greater than greater than equal to double equal to double equal to is basically when you are uh, so 12 is is equal to 12 so if you uh, if you want to say 12 equals to 12 so here we use double equals to so if you remember in a previous session when we were assigning a value to a variable what we said that when you are assigning a value to a variable you should use single equal to not double equal to so double equal to is having different meaning which is basically when we are using these statements when we are using these relational operators in order to uh, satisfy a condition in order to find if the condition is true or false at that time we use equal symbol then we comes up not equal to which is being used by uh, by this symbol so whenever we use a relational operators it always results true boolean values it always results boolean values one would be true or either it would be false so how basically we are going to do it let's open jupyter notebook and let's try it out and see how it actually works so i have opened my jupyter notebook now let's try one uh, simple example so let's say 10 is greater than 7 so we know that 10 is greater than 7 so it is true right now if i say 10 is smaller than 7 we know that 10 cannot be smaller than 7 so it will return false right this is the reason why we use relational operators in order to find if a particular value is greater than or lesser than if it is greater than that means it is satisfying our value if it is not greater than that means it is not satisfying our values 
okay so let's start with so first i'll take less than and so let's say uh, tan i'll take the same example less tan is smaller than 7 we'll get false five is smaller than seven will get true right uh, let's take an example using a variable x is equal to 10 and y is equal to 12 so x is smaller than y true but if i'll say y is smaller than x false right in this way we can do less than operation now let's try with less than equal to so how are we going to use less than equal to I'll say x, I'll use the same operation, x is equal to, instead of x is equal to, first we'll say 11 is smaller than equal to 12. We know that 11 is lesser than 12, so it is satisfying one condition, is out of smaller than and equal to, it is satisfying one of the conditions, so we'll get true. If I'll say 13 is smaller than equal to 12, it will say false, but if I'll say 12 is smaller than equal to 12, it will result true because it is satisfying one of the condition same way if you want to try it out i'll say x is equal to let's say 12 and i'll say y is equal to 12 and if you will try x is smaller than 12 smaller than equal to 12 it will return true, right now let's try another one so we'll this time we'll go with greater than okay so i'll use the same operation x and y we know that x and y are equal so if i'll say x is greater than y it will return false if i'll say y is greater than x it will return false right you can try it out so let's say 13 is greater than 12 right it is true 14 is greater than 12 right it is true i'll say 15 is greater than x it will be true but if i'll say x is greater than 15 x is 12 basically so it will come false so here we'll get two outputs only one is true and the other one is false now let's try greater than equal to so i'll say uh, x greater than equal to y we know that x is 12 and y is 12 so it will come true if i'll say 13 is greater than equal to y it will say true if i'll say 15 is greater than equal to 13 it will come true right if i'll say 17 is greater than equal to uh, 20 it will come false right so this is about greater than equal to i'll just correct this spelling pardon my spelling so now let's try with equal to okay again uh, let's correct this equal to now uh, let's say x we know that x is sorry x is say smaller x we know that uh, so in python it is case sensitive x is 12 and y is also 12 so if i'll say x is equal to is equal to y it will be true right if i'll say x is equal to 13 that means x is now 13 but if i'll say x is equal to is equal to 12 it will say false because x is 13 so whenever you are equal using equal to just remember that it will give you false and if i'll say x is equal to is equal to y at this moment it will say false because y is 12 while x is 13 right so both are not equal now let's try the last operation which is not equal to i'll use the same one x not equal to y it is correct true if i say 13 not equal to 12 it will say true if i say 12.25 not equal to 12.25 it will say false 12.25 not equal to 12 it will say 12 true so in this way you can do all these operations i'll just rename my workbook so what i'll say uh, relational operators okay so just try all these operations there are six basically relational operators we use in python smaller than smaller than equal to greater than greater than equal to not equal to and equals to so all these six operations will be used in further sessions a lot and various several times 
so you'll be using them in for loop as well while loop as well you will be using them in if else if in if else it will be used a lot whereas if you'll go to numpy pandas anywhere these relational operators will be used everywhere and the second thing that you need to remember is the output the result that we get from relational operators is basically either true or false none other than true or false we are not going to get anything else we will get only true and false only boolean values so remember this try all these operations and if you have any issue come come and uh, just drop me a comment so till then goodbye thank you let's look into the agenda for today's session so in our previous session we looked into relational operators and we saw that the output which comes out of the relational operator is either true or false so which are basically boolean values now what are these boolean values true and false why do we use them and how can we use them how are they going to impact our code all these things we will be learning in this session we will see how these true and false can impact further so before moving on just look at this operation logical operators so in your schools you must have learned about these logical operators and and or and is basically logical and or is basically logical or so and means so the second thing that you need to remember is and is always considered as a multiplication or is always considered as a plus as an addition just remember this and in the further sessions you won't be able to think much the second thing that you need to remember is always consider whenever you see true or false so boolean has two values true and false true is always one false is always zero now i'll take you to jupyter notebook and i'll show you why we consider true as one and false as zero okay now let's move on to jupyter notebook and see how it works okay so i have opened my jupyter notebook i'll just rename this to uh, boolean values okay now let's say i have an integer 10 let's print 10 now if i say bool bool is basically used in order to convert any integer or any type of other data type to a boolean value so boolean will result true and false we know about that so let's try bool 10 you see true right if i'll try bool 1 you'll get true right bool will return false for only one value which is zero so bool will return uh, false for only one value which is zero if i'll say bool 0 0.01 it will return true so in the whole universe let's take another example i'll say minus one this okay this big value it will also return true so in the whole universe in the whole universe of numbers you will get true value for each boolean each number except for one number which is zero if it is zero it will show you false so similar conditions x is greater than 12 x is smaller than 12 so whenever you get a false that means it is zero right whenever you get true that means it is satisfying the condition right just remember this whenever my condition is satisfying that means it is true whenever my condition is not satisfying that means it is false in the whole universe zero is considered as false in the whole universe uh, and rest of the elements rest of the values are considered as one now coming back to the presentation so coming back to the presentation if you can see so that is why forget about every other uh, universal element or value just remember this false whenever you see false it will be zero whenever you see true it will be one right now let's move on so let's try this one so i have basically combined these two operations into this not true and false and we know that is a multiplication while or we know that or is an addition so true and false true is one and multiply by false zero 
1 into 0 is 0, that means we got false. 0 into 0, false. 1 multiplied by 0, false. 1 multiplied by 1, true. If you want to try it out, I'll just try it out in Jupyter Notebook. But for now, just remember this, just understand this. Let's move on. Now comes the OR operator. OR operator, we know it's a basically an addition. True is 1, 1 plus 0. 1 0 plus 0 0 1 plus 0 1 1 plus 1 1 moving on so this is basically our operator where it will be adding it uh, so true plus true you can think about two but it will be true because we know that in the whole universe you'll get only true or false right now coming back to this condition whenever use whenever you are adding two values so you'll say true plus false is 1, 0 plus 0 is 0, 1 into 0 is 0, 1 into 1 is 1. Let's try these operations in Jupyter Notebook. So I have opened my Jupyter Notebook. Now let's try with true multiplied by true, 1 true multiplied by false, 0 false multiplied by true. False is 0, true is 1. 1 multiplied by 0, 0. Now false multiplied by false. What you'll get? 0. Right? The second operation uh, true plus true. So you'll get 2 over here because 1 plus 1 is 2. True plus false. True plus false. 1. Always remember this is not a boolean value. This is not a boolean value. Similarly, this is also not a boolean value. Always the first uh, letter T is capital, rest are small and this is your boolean value. Always remember this. Same with false. Uh, Python is case sensitive and you cannot ignore the characters. Okay, so let's move on. Let's coming back to AND and OR. So first go with AND operator. So I'll say TRUE and TRUE. Why are we using TRUE AND and OR in this condition? I'll show you in the next lecture which will be IF AND ELSE statement. There you will be able to remember all these things and you will be able to answer these. Okay, FALSE and TRUE. False, right? True and false. So let's correct this. Uh, false. Fine. False and false. We know it will come false. Let's try with or. True or true. True. True or false. 1 plus 0, 1. False plus true, true. False, false. This correct this, false. Right? Understood? Now I'll show you the could way. Now why are we using this? Let's take an example. X is equal to 10. Right? The first condition is X is smaller than 7. We know that this is false. It is false, right? Now, if I say x is greater than 5, uh, so Python is case sensitive, x is greater than 5, true. I'll just keep this in bracket. I'll say and x is smaller than 9. Fine. Now can you see we got false. Why are we getting false? The first condition x greater than 5 is true but the second condition x smaller than 9 this is false and we know that true and false true and false is false. If you do not want to multiply this the second way which you can think of is and is basically if I'll say and 
that means all the or both the statements should be satisfying if either of these statement is not satisfying the condition that means it will be false in case of or let's try this one again x greater than 5 or x smaller than 9 it will say true why it will say true because either of the two conditions either of the any number of conditions any one of them is satisfying the condition that means for me this is true right you can try as many ways as possible if i'll say x uh, greater than 7 and x smaller than 15 true okay so x greater than 7 and x is smaller than 15 this is if one of this and both of the statements are true then only we are going to get the true so let's try another one x is greater than 10 and x is smaller than 16 uh, what you'll get over here you will get false because my x is equal to 10 it is not greater than 10 on the other hand if i'll use the same statement x greater than 10 or x smaller than 16 so it will say that it is smaller than 16 so one of my condition is true that means it is true so try all these operations try uh, too many op uh, too many operations if you have any issues just let me know and till then see you goodbye let's look into the agenda for today's session so today we will be looking about if and else statements how can we use them in python what are if and else statements so uh, let's move on so if you want to write say, if and else statement so the syntax for if and else statement is as follows so uh, first we start with if then we provide our conditions so in our previous sessions we had learned about relational operators then we had also learned about boolean values how we can provide the conditions x is smaller than 12 x greater than 14 so those conditions and how we basically we were using and and or operator so those conditions we will be using here so this condition one is basically the same as if my x is greater than 13 or x is smaller than 13 so we will look about it and see how it works so if and else statement will start with if and then we will provide our condition then we will provide a colon symbol so in the whole python wherever we are using if and else statement if we are using for loop while loop if we are creating a function if we are creating a class wherever we are using such uh, objects wherever we are creating such objects we will be using colon so uh, you have to remember this that uh, in every condition we will be using colon uh, let's move on so then we will be providing our statements so what all result we want if we want to print anything or we want to do any operation now the second condition is elif so let's say instead of one or two conditions we have multiple conditions wherein we are using uh, let's say we want to see if my x is uh, within 5 to 10 or if it is 10 to 15 if it is 15 to 20 in this way so if there are more than one condition then we will be using elif and then we will be providing our condition too then we will be providing the statements if we want to provide print statement if we want to do any further operation those will be coming under elif then we will go on with the else condition so else is basically used where you will be providing the final statement so if all the conditions are not fulfilled that this is basically my last condition and what will be the result will be coming under statement 3 so uh, i have opened my jupyter notebook now let's uh, let's try if and else statement and see how it exactly works i'll rename my notebook as if and else statement okay so <clears throat> let's let's start with uh, let's declare a variable x is equal to 10 now 
the first condition let's go with if only so i say if and i'll say my condition as x greater than 5 if x is greater than 5 then i will be printing x is greater than 5 right so you'll get an output in the console as x is greater than 5 this is correct because x is greater than 5 is my condition which is fulfilling because tan is greater than 5 right so that is why my answer is coming correctly let's try another situation if i'll say f x is greater than 15 print x is x is greater than 15 now what i'll do i'll just press shift plus enter and see the result now can you see we didn't get any result in this case why didn't we get any result because we know that x is great equal to 10 now x is not equal to 10 x is greater than 15 now we know that x is not greater than 15 so this statement is false if the statement is false then the loop will not come under will not print the statement will not reach to this point and it will not print the statement that we have provided now what are we going to do in this case so what we'll say we'll use else statement so i'll say x greater than 15 print x is greater than 15 and i'll say else if x is not greater than 15 then what will you print print x is lesser than 15 right let's print it so can you see i'll just give some space over here and if you can see x is lesser than 15 right now instead of this if i'll go and change the x value to x is equal to 20 if i'll change the value to x is equal to 20 now if i'll try the same statement you'll get x is greater than 15 this is correct right now if i'll go and change this 20 to 15 let's try this one and if I'll run the same statement, if else statement once again, you'll get x is lesser than 15. Because if you look at the first condition, x is greater than 15, which is false because my x is 15. So it will go to else and it will print the next statement, which is x lesser than 15. Now, if in case we also want to print 15 as well. So there are two ways. I can go and change this statement and I'll say x is greater than or equal to 15. Now, if I'll go and run this statement you will get the correct answer now come to the another point let's say what i want i want is i want if x is smaller than 5 i'll print x is lesser than 5 right now the second condition is lf I'll use elif in this case because what I want I want to give another condition because what I want to do I want to print all the numbers which are coming between 5 to 10 x is greater than 5 and x is smaller than 10 if I'll use this statement and if I'll say print x is between 5 and 10 what i'll do over here i'll say less than equal to and i'll say as lesser than equal to 5 okay uh, now uh, i'll just give some space over here and the last one is else print x is greater than equal to 10 right now let's try 
okay so we need to give double quotes okay so x is equal to 15 x is greater than or equal to 10 if i'll say x is equal to 5 what will i get over here x is lesser than or equal to 5 if i'll say x is equal to 9 and if i'll try if else statement x is between 5 and 10 so you can try all the possible steps i'll say 9.95 let's try and you'll get x is between 5 and 10 fine if you want to try you can just try 10.00 and x is greater than or equal to 10 right fine good so you must be thinking about I have used A and D in this case, right? And while in my previous session, I, sh I had shown you uh, AND operator instead of A and D. So in Python, you can use A and D as well. In this, in if and else statement, you can use A and D or if you want, you can use uh, AND operator as well. So let's, let's try another one wherein I'll be using OR operator. I'll say X smaller than equal to 5. I'll say print x is lesser than equal to 5. The second one I'll try elif x is greater than greater than 5 and instead of and I'll say and x is smaller than 15 print x is between 5 and 15 the last one else print x is greater than equal to 15 right again I made the same mistake I need to provide if it is a string I need to provide it in quotes x is would be 5 and 15 I'll try 15 over here Always when you are writing a code, just try and test it if each and every operation is working fine or not. Then only your code will be good and will be better. Right? This is over. Now, let's try another one with OR operator. What I'll do in this case is, if the number is divided by 2, it is even. Okay, if number is divided by 2, it is even. If number is divided by 2 or 5, I'll say or 7, it can be divided. Right, if number is not divided, by 2 or 5 or 7 we'll say it cannot be divided right so let's create this one let's comment this out let's comment this out control slash and let's move on Okay, so I'll say if x percentage 2 is equal to 0, this is the first condition. What I'll get is print x is divided, x is even, right? Elif x percentage, instead of 2, I'll remove this 2 and I'll say 5 or 7. 
because we have already involved do in the first condition. So I'll say if x percent is 5 is equal to 0 or if x percent is 7 is equal to 0 we we'll say print x can be divided right else we we'll say print x cannot be divided right I'll provide double quotes let's see okay so what I'll do in this case I'll say x is equal to let's try with 4 and what you'll get x is even now I'll try it with 15 what you'll get x can be divided right because 15 cannot be divided by 2 so it will not go to the first condition it will go to the second condition and then print it then I'll say x is equal to 21 and it will say x can be divided now I'll say 22 once again right I'll try this one x is even now the last condition I'll say 29 and it will say x cannot be divided right this is interesting right? now let's try with another one 33 and it will say x cannot be divided if I'll go and do x is equal to 35 it will be divided right so this is a good learning try if and else statement now you should be pretty much aware pretty much you should be having pretty much knowledge about why we are using boolean values how we are using boolean values what is their impact how we are basically using relational operators and how are we going to build our if and else statements all these things you must have learned so far i have also provided you an assignment just try it out and see if you have any issue if you have any problem just let me know see you till then goodbye let's look into the agenda for today's session today we will be looking about list what are lists how can we define lists in python and uh, so we will also be learning about indexing and slicing so what is indexing what is slicing we'll come to know about it let's move on so a list is an object which is being defined in, a, in Python. So it is an ordered collection of one or more data items which can be of different data types. So the data types, so list will be an object in which you will be storing different number of data, different number of elements. It could be a number, it could be an integer, it could be a character, it could be a boolean value. So all the items can be collected in a one in one data structure which is a list. Okay, now why it is ordered, I will let you know. Then lists are mutable, that means they can be modified. So once you create the list, then at any point of time you can come and modify the list. Lists are defined in square brackets, this is very important. So whenever you are creating a list, you have to define it in a bra uh, square brackets. So this is one of the example of list. So if you can see you can provide a square bracket you can give a name to the list as list one and then you need to uh, provide square brackets under which you have to provide the elements that you want to store so one two three four is number hello is a string true is boolean value john is a string so all these all these data items can be stored in one data structure which is list now why lists are ordered so why are we saying that lists are ordered so whenever you see whenever we create list then each element exists at a particular position which is called index so if i say sam so sam is stored at the zeroth index john is stored at the one index sarah is stored at the two index so their position is fixed and based on which we are defining it so that is why it is ordered so if i'll say it is not the case that karthik is coming at index one or sara is coming at index three so this is not the case here each and every element is ordered and is being stored moving on so 
let's uh, let's go to jupyter notebook and show you how we can basically create a list okay so i have opened my jupyter notebook so let's rename this notebook list and uh, let's say we'll create one list let's take a, a simple name l1 and i'll say 1 2 3 4 6 7 5 8 so this is my list if you want to see what is there in the list you can see l1 and you will be able to see all the numbers all the values that we have provided if you want to create another list we can create another list l2 and which will be let's say 1 2 3 and let's say i'll give some name as sam and then let's say john let's say true is your boolean value and let's try l2 so this is your l2 okay now what is indexing let's look into it Okay, so now we will be uh, studying about list indexing. So as you have already seen that this is my list one, let's say Sam, John, Sarah and Karthik. No, I, now I told you that Sam is at zeroth position. So in list, always the first element start with the zeroth index. Then comes the first one, then second, then third. So Karthik will be considered as list one, three. So list one, zero will be Sam, list one, one will be two. So if you want to find which element is at which position, if you want to see, you can just provide list one, the name of the list, and then in a square brackets, you can provide the index with which you will be able to return the value which is there at that index. So in the similar way, list one three will be Karthi. So let's go to Jupyter Notebook and create a list and see how we can basically do indexing. Okay, so let's create another list, L3. I'll say 10, 20, 40, 30, 50, 60. Okay. And I'll say enter, uh, shift enter. If you want to print L3, you can print L3. Now let's try L3 with 0th index. You'll get 10, right? Because the first one, the first element, it has 0, is at 0th index. So in brackets, you are basically giving an index. Rem always remember, you should give all square brackets. If you try to give uh, parenthesis it won't work it will say list object is not call it callable so basically when you are using parenthesis it means that you are using it as a function to call it but here we are using list as an object so whenever you want to access that list you have to provide the index number in your square brackets now let's try another one I'll say let's write 2 2 so 2 is the third element we will get 40 right now let's try another one, L3 and I'll say 5. So 5 is 60, right? This is correct. So in this way, you can do the indexing. Now along with the list indexing, there comes negative indexing as well. So let's say if you want to just, uh, if you want to just uh, bring out the last element, so you do not need to provide L1 and you do not need to provide length of the uh, length of the list minus one so this is one of the way the other way is the, is the simple way of providing minus one as an index so if you say list one minus one it will be karthik so the last element will be starting with minus one then this is element will be minus two third element will be minus three and fourth element will be minus four so in this way you can also retrieve your elements by providing negative index so let's go and try it out in jupyter notebook okay so uh, let's use the same example l3 and i'll say minus one okay so can you see 60 60 is the last element and you are able to retrieve it by providing minus one as the index l3 and i'll say minus three you'll get 30 right 30 is the third element so always remember the from the beginning you can start with zero one two three four five six seven from and you can start with minus one minus two minus three minus four right now, if you do not want to use your last, uh, your negative index, what we can do, you can say first, if you want to find out the length of the length of the list, you can use length function. This length function will give you the length of the list. So if I'll say I want, let's, let's print L1 once again. No, it's not L1 we were working on. We were working on L3. So if I'll say L3 and I'll say len now why do we get this error so if you know this is my first index 0 1 2 3 
four, five. So it is ending at five fifth index. And we have provided LAN. LAN you basically know it's six. So where so when you are using L3 and in brackets, you are providing a number which is out of bound, which is which cannot where the list is not having any value, it will return you an error. So what we'll try to do here LAN minus one. I think I have done a mistake. Yeah. So the mistake is LAN, but I have not provided the uh list name so if you can see list index is out of range now i'll say minus one and if you can see i got 60. so this is the way by which you can do this so do all this indexing part and uh, try with positive indexes and try with negative indexes all as well let's try another one l3 and i'll say minus five so what will you get minus one minus two minus three minus four minus five you'll get 20 right let's try it out and you get 20 fine let's move on so now indexing is over now it comes slicing what is slicing slicing is basically like if you have this whole list now what you have to what you want to do you just want to take out a slice of it so let's say you want sam john or you want john sara you want sara karthik or let's say you want sam john and sara so it is just a slice that you want to take out from that list how will you take out that uh, that part that we are going to know okay so let's let's move on to uh, jupyter notebook directly and i'll show you how it actually works okay so i have opened my jupyter notebook let's take the same example l3 now what i'll do l3 so whenever you are slicing anything so what you have to do you have to provide the first index and you have to provide the last index till the element you want right now in between that you need to provide a colon operator right so the first one will give you the first index the last one will give you the last index but in list it doesn't work like this if you're providing the last index so if let's say you want to slice till 30 then you have to give the index number after 30 so if let's say let's take an example i'll comment it and move on so l3 and let's say what i want to do i want to get the get 10 20 and 40 okay these three i want i'll say zero i'll say colon and i'll say zero one two right but if you can see it won't go till 40 so your zero will be counted as the first one but two will not be counted so the number before it will be counted so you'll get 10 20 now instead what else do i'll say 0 column 3 in this case you can see 10 20 and 40 now you are getting 10 20 and 40 now let's take another one i'll say i'll say what i want to do i want to get 20 40 30 and 50 all four elements so i'll say first index now second third fourth fifth so i'll say five right another way let's try this with negative index okay so before negative index i just want to show you so if you won't provide anything if you won't provide anything over here and if you won't provide anything over here so it will print the whole list why why it will print the whole list so before colon all the values i'll show you why so l3 let's take one and now i am saying that i want to print from first one to the last so you can give the first one you do not need to give your last element so it will print till last in the same fashion i want to start from the very beginning and i want to go till 30 so 0 1 2 3 so 3 instead of 3 we'll give 4 right yeah because if we had given 3 it would have come till 40 let's let's print l3 once again okay so you got this the same way if we'll provide colon so that means the first one will be starting from the very beginning the last one second one will be ending till the very end and you'll get all the results right now let's try another thing over here let's say if i want i want to start with two and i want to end it till 50 okay let's try with another one so i'll say one for 20 but i don't want to count it till here i'll say minus one for 60 we already know that last one is index negative index similar way so if i'll say 
if I'll start with minus 1 and what I want to do I want to go till 10 from minus 1 to minus 5 you won't get anything because it will go in front only okay uh, because whenever you are providing anything it will go in front so how can be uh, what I want I want to print from 60 to 20 now what is the way so I'll show you an another way wherein you can do the same thing so this is that way so what we are basically going to do we will be skipping elements while slicing what is this I'll tell you so let's say you have you have this list Sam John Sarah Karthik Jason and Matt now what do you want I don't know what do you want uh, what I want, I don't want John in between, I don't want Karthik in between. So I want every second element, Sam, then Sarah, then Jason. I don't want John or I don't want Karthik. How will I be able to do so? so in that case, what you have to do, you have to provide the first, to, uh, first uh, you have to provide a colon, before which you have to provide the first index, after which you have to provide the second index, plus one. Then you have to provide another colon and then you will be providing a separator. So, if you have provided one, that means after same you want the next element. If I say I want second, that means first you will be starting with zero, that is Sam, and then you will be saying I want the second element, not first, then second, not sec first, then second. If I say I want third, then first, zero, then I don't want first, I don't want second, I don't, I want third, right? Let's go and try it out in Jupyter node. Okay, so let's print L3 once again. What I want, I want each element. Okay, L3, I'll say from 0, I'll start with 20. Instead of 10, I'll start with 20. 1, and I'll say till last. And so I'm not providing anything over here. I'll say just provide another colon and I'll say 1. So if you are not providing any colon, that means you are using 1 over here. Okay, if you are not providing any value over here that means you are using one now i'll say l3 i'll say one and i'll say two now can you see we have started with 20 now each we are skipping one element one and then two one and then two now let's try another one l3 i say one i'll say three now 20 one two three the same way so what I was saying, what I was saying, L3, now let's try another thing. So if I'm not providing anything, so what will it print? This, this, and, so it will go till and, and it will print every element in this case, right? Now, the second thing. So I'll say, I'll start with one, I'll start with zero. Okay, I'll start with one, I'll go till four. So. 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. That means it will print till 20, 40, and 30. Now, instead of 0, 1, or 2, what I will do, I will say minus 1. So, minus 1 means if I am starting with 20, then it will go to minus 1. It will move towards back. So, it should go to 10. So, in this case, you won't be getting any result. Why are you not getting any result? Because it is going at the back. Now let's try another one. I'll say minus one. Minus one means my last index. And I'll say one. Okay, that means from 60 to 20. From 60 to 20, from 60 to 40, it will come. And I'll say minus one. Now, if you can see 60, 50, 30, 40. Right? Okay, let's try another one. So now let's say we'll come to the same example. I'll go from beginning to end and I'll say print go with one right now instead I'll say go with two it will give you the result the same way I'll say go with three now here I'm not providing anything in the beginning I'm not providing anything at the end so the same way if I, you'll go and provide minus one at the end so it, work, it will start from the end and it will come to the uh, first element and it will print all the elements in the negative index. If you'll go with 2, 
you will be able to print so this is a question this is a question of an ask asked in interviews wherein what you have to do you have to print the reverse of the list so how will you print the reverse of the list so there's a reverse function also available in list but what you can also do you can provide double colon operator and then you can provide minus one at the end now if i'll say i think this is enough so you can try it out you can try all these operations and uh, try to find if you have any issues just let me know uh, so till then see you goodbye so uh, let's look into the agenda for today's session today we will be learning about list methods so what are those list methods let's look into it so first we will be discussing about uh, these list methods first we will be seeing append extend then insert then pop then remove Okay, so let's go to Jupyter Notebook. Let's create a list and see how it actually works. Okay, so I have opened my Jupyter Notebook. Let's rename the workbook. I'll say list methods. And okay, let's create a list. Uh, I'll give the name of a list as A. And I'll say 10, 20, 30, 50, 30, 25, again 25, again 30, let's say 60, let's say 102, let's say 254, let's say 30 again, and let's say 25, let's say 60. Okay, so here we have a big list. Uh, let's press shift enter and let's print our list. Okay, this is our list. Now, what was the first one? First, we'll go about append. Uh, let's give some style to it and okay so append now what we have to basically do let's consider this is as a list okay let's give this a little bit so make these two as separate elements okay now what we have to do the first operation if you have any list now i told you that we can modify a list whenever we want now the first way is if you want to add any more elements to this list you can use append in append if you want you can use 10 and if you'll press enter and if you'll print then if you can see 10 has been added to the list in this way if you want to add any more element let's say i want to add one minus 120 and if you go and check your a it will be minus 120 understood so in this way, if you want, you can add any number of elements to it. But there is a catch. Now, if I'll say I want to append, but I want to append a list, I will say I want to append 10, 20. Now, if you go and check your A, then it will be added as a list, right? So the first case is if you want to add multiple elements as a list, then you can add like this. Or else if you want to add single by single so you can provide only one element in append and it will be added as a one element but if you want to add as a list you can add as a list using append but let's say I don't want to use I whenever I'm providing any list I don't want to add it as a list I want to add it as numbers 10 and 20 how will I do that what I'll do I'll just uh, use a original list that we had now in this case if we want to extend our list so basically what we are doing basically what we are doing we are just extending our list so I am saying that my a is this now what I want to do I want to use elements 10 20 now with append what you see with append what you saw that it was added as a list now when you are using extend it will be added as a number so it will extend the list with 10 and 20 so similar way if you have another list you have another list as 10 20 and 30 and if i say a dot extend b and if i say go and check a it will be appended understood so there's the difference between append and extend so in append if you are providing a list as an uh, as an argument it will be appending it will be appending the whole list to the existing list 
while if you are extend if you are using extend as a um, if you are extend method if you are using extend method and you are providing list as an argument it will be appending each and every element not a list okay fine so what was the third one third one was insert now uh, let's let's take a situation uh, what I'll do I'll just take the original list I don't want to use the list of which we have edited so far I'll use the same list a okay now let's say if you want to insert any element now append is basically what append is basically doing it is uh, inserting an element but at the end now I want to add an element at the second position what I can use I can use insert and I'll say I'll say first one is the index 2 and I'll add 30 not, not 30 let's use 24 if I'll go and check my a can you see now I have added I got 24 as a second index okay now the next operation is pop okay so I'll go and take my original list this is my original list and I'll go and check what my original list is now I'll use pop and I won't provide any argument to the pop what it will do it will remove the last element the last element list is in is is already in order so pop will return you the last element because you have not provided any argument to it now if you go and check your a 60 has been removed right now what i want i don't want to take the last element i want to take the first element how will i take the first element a dot pop as zero it will take the first element zero then that's now if you go and check your a this is it if I say I want to pop my last element minus one and it has popped your last element right so this is the way so first what you have learned how you can add an element at the end using append how you can basically add two or three elements using a list by using extend function extend method then what we have learned we have also learned how we can insert an element at any index using index using insert sorry then what we learned how we can remove any element using pop now what we will be doing the next so now i will be using remove okay so why do we use remove so i'll take my original list that we had and i'll just print it out oh so python is case sensitive and you cannot use small a i'll use capital a now uh, what we have used we have used pop and what we have learned so far that if i can provide any index to the my pop method then it will remove the element from that index right but let's say i don't want i don't want to remove the element from an index i just want to provide my number and want it to be removed so let's say i want to remove 30 okay I want to remove 30 now what it will do it will remove the first occurrence of 30 now if you can see 1 2 3 and 4 there were 4 30s now we have 1 2 and 3 if you again go and use the same operation and I'll go and remove 30 and if I go and check a now you will be having two 30s okay so by this remove method what we learned we can remove a number we can remove anything uh, any value directly by using pop we can remove based on an index let's let's go back to our presentation and see uh, what are methods what methods do we have okay so you have already seen append extend insert pop pop and remove now let's move on
Now we will be looking into another other methods wherein we will be seeing the count method, index, reverse, sort, and length. Length we have already seen. So let's start with count. So I have opened my Jupyter notebook. Let's go with count. So what count is exactly going to do? So let's go and take our original list. Okay. Now I'll go and print my list once again. So what I want to do, I want to count how many number of third, how many thirties we have in this list, because I can see there are too many thirties. So I'll say a dot count and I'll say 30. Now you got the result as four because there were four thirties. If I want to check, I'll go and check 25. Okay. You'll get three because there were three 25. If I'll go and search a number which is not already there, which is not present in the list, I'll go and search for 100. So you'll get zero because there are no such, there is no such element as 100 in the list. Fine. Okay. The next element, the next method is index. So if you can see, this is your list A. Now what I want, I want to find my 50. Uh, I want to find at which location, at which position I have 50. I'll say A dot index, I'll say 50. It will return me the position of the first occurrence of 50. If I say I want to, I want to get an index of 30. So if you can see the second index is my first index. So 30 is present at the second index. It is not going to give you any information about the uh, next occurrence of 30. It will give you the uh, position of first occurrence of 30. Okay, so it is presented to fine. So the next one, as I told you in my previous lecture about reverse. So as the name suggests, you can easily understand that it will basically reverse your whole list. So a dot reverse and if I'll go and check a, so if you can see 60 is coming from the, from the end and 10 is coming at the end, right? The one which was there at the last position is coming at the first position and the one which was there at the first position is coming at the last position, fine. If you also want to try reverse, you, you can also use colon colon minus one operator, which will also give you the same result. If you don't want to use that, you can use this one. Right. Let's move on to the next function, which is sort. So sort, you must have learned, heard about sort a number of times. So list also has a sort function. So if I go and check my uh, list, so let's go and check. Let's take the original list because my list has already changed over here from reverse. So I'll go and print my list a now a dot sort. Now this will sort my list. Can you see now it is sorted? Right? Now it is sorted. What if I don't want to sort it? What if I don't want to sort it? I uh, I want to sort it in an in let's say in decreasing order. What I can use here sort and I'll say reverse equal to true. And if I'll go and check my A, now it has been sorted in reverse order. Fine. So this way you can use sort function. So the last one is len. We already have, uh, we already know about how len works, how len will basically give you the total number of elements in A. Now let's, let's try an example. So I'll say A dot remove, uh, I'll say A dot um, remove 102. Now what is your A? This is your A. I'll say len of A. Now can you see the length of A has decreased to 30? Fine. So by this way, you can basically do get the length of the list and 
just try out all the functions that I have told you so far and if you have any issues if you find any difficulties so just let me know and till then see you take care let's look into the agenda for today's session today we will be looking about strings so in Python how can we define a string we will look into it then we will see about indexing and slicing of string as we see as we saw in list okay so uh, let's move on so first a string is so how can we define a string in Python so in Python we can define a string either using single quotation marks or we can also use double quotation marks there is one more way wherein we can use three double quotes by which we can define a string just take an example so let's say if you want to define a string we can provide single quotation marks then the second way is providing double quotation marks and the third way is providing three double quotes so these are three ways by which basically you can define a string in python so let's go to jupyter notebook and define some of these strings so i have opened my jupyter notebook let's rename the workbook let's rename the notebook as strings and i'll say okay so let's define a is equal to hello fine so if you'll go and print a it will be printed as hello v is equal to let's provide double quotes hello and b hello if i'll say uh, let's provide triple quotes hello it will also work fine so the same way if i'll say uh, let's provide triple hello it will also work fine so these are few ways by which we basically we can define a string uh, let's okay so let's try another one let's say e is equal to i'll give a nickname hello this is my first string program and if i'll print e you can see hello this is my first string program fine so this is the way by which we can basically define a string and print it so let's move on now we will be looking into string indexing so string indexing works exactly the same way as list indexing works the first character of the string will always start with zeroth index and the last character will be considered as the minus one index so if I'll take an example of, uh, let's say there is a string, hello world, and this is the string basically. So if I'll print a zero, so the same way you need to provide the string name, then you need to provide square brackets wherein you will be providing the index. Zeroth index is h, so that is why it is it will print h. If I'll say a is equal to one, a one, so it will print e. Then if I'll say a three, so zero is h, e is two, e is one l is 2 and then second l is 1 uh, l is 3 so we'll get l if i'll go for 6 so 0 1 2 3 4 5 and 6 1 is w so that is why we'll get w for a6 fine so the same way we can go for negative indexing wherein the last character in the string will be considered as the minus 1th index if i'll take an example of same hello world a minus 1 will be the last character which is our exclamation mark then a minus 2 will be the same exclamation mark a minus 4 will be d right because it is fourth and a minus 6 will be r fine so let's go to jupyter notebook and let's try indexing so i have opened my jupyter notebook i'll take the same scenario a e hello this is my first string program now let's print e0 e0 will be h if I'll go for E1, E1 will be E. If I'll go for E, uh, let's count these number 5, 0, 5, 6, 7. So 7 means it, the index will be 6. So it will be T. If I'll go for uh, minus 1, M, right? If I'll go for E minus 2, that will be A. If I'll go for E minus 3, it will be r and if i'll go for e minus 5 it will be o fine so this is the way by which we basically we can index our string so we 
always remember the first character of the string will be 0th index the last character of the string will be minus 1th index and whenever we want to fetch any uh, character from that string we can provide the string name then we can provide the double square we can provide the square brackets and then we can provide the index number fine this is the way by which basically we can uh, define our strings and we can also index our strings now let's move on to slicing these strings okay so how can we slice our strings so slice our strings is basically similar to slicing the list exactly similar what we need to do we need to provide the colon operator the first index between the colon operator will be the first uh, uh, the first the number which we will be providing before colon will be considered as the first index the number we will be providing is the after the colon will be considered as the uh, last index plus one fine so let's take an example of a is equal to hello world the same example if i say a and if i won't provide anything before the colon and after the colon then it will print the computer string we had already seen this we have already seen this in uh, list if i'll say a zero colon that means that it is starting with zero and 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 going till end so it will print the same hello world the computer string if i'll go for a one colon that means it will start with e right and it will go till end if i'll go for colon two colon two so it will start with the first index zeroth index h e and then it won't take two because the last index will not be counted and it will go till uh, the index before the last one so the last example 1 2 8 1 is e 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 8 means 8 won't be counted so it will come till o l o space o fine okay so uh, let's do this as well okay let's first go to jupyter notebook and try our slicing part then we'll go for skips skipping the elements okay Okay, so I'll take the same string e. If I'll say what I want to get is hello only. So I'll say uh, I, my string will start with zero, and uh, let's first try the complete string. Okay, let's go with zero, zero colon, and so we got the complete string in this case as well. Now I'll try with one and if you can see we have skipped h in this case now if i want to go till minus one okay so in this case it will skip m from last if i'll go to minus two oh sorry so if i'll go till minus two it will skip a and m right now uh, what i want i just want hello so i won't provide the index before the colon i'll just provide uh, my fifth index so it will give us hello if i'll give colon six it will give us a space as well the space which was there now i want hello this so i'll get colon if i'll go with colon 10 so i'll get hello this fine so this is the way now uh, instead of uh, so what i'll do i'll just say this is my first program so i'll start with 6 and go till end so this is my first program right so by this way we can basically slice our string now let's move on to the presentation okay so now we will see skipping elements while slicing so we have already seen this in list as well wherein we were providing one more colon operator and then we provided the number of elements that we want to skip okay so um, the same way if we want to uh, skip multiple characters we can provide like uh, take any string as a is equal to hello world so zero seven and one so it will give go till w hello w but it won't skip anything over here okay but if i say two that means it's, it will skip this every second element okay every second element will skip and it will print h then l then o fine now if i'll go for a3 then it will skip two elements fine 
and the last one so if we want to print the reverse of this string we can use colon colon and minus one fine so let's go to jupyter notebook and let's try this okay so what i will be doing i will just take the same string e hello this is my first string program now what will i do i will use uh, 0 to uh, let's say uh, 10 so what we will print hello this okay now 0 to 10 to 1 hello this right it won't skip anything over here now this for 2 it will skip now e it has a skip e then l then space then h then s now let's try with 3 let's try with 3 now h then ell -L, then l then o and space then t then hi then s fine now let's try and reverse this string now can you see the string string has been reversed if i'll go and reverse this string by minus 2 then it will skip each a in this case right so this is the way by which we can basically skip the elements if we want to and this is always remember this one if anyone asks you that how can we reverse a string then we can just provide colon colon and minus one and if you do not want to provide colon colon minus one what you can say you can say uh, minus one because it will start from and and it will come till zero so don't use zero in that case just pro don't provide anything okay let's say if you will provide minus if you will provide zero over here so the, then you can see can you see it is not considering h in this case why because we have provided zero after the colon now the element which is which has been provided after the operator is not being considered so that is why h is not being considered over here so if you want to do so so you can provide minus one don't provide anything over here and then minus one fine so in this way so this is all about string how can we define a string there are three ways using double quotes using single quotes and if you want to use you can use three double quotes or three single quotes okay and if you want to if you want to in if you want to get the particular index get the particular character from the string how can you get it you can get it the same way by which how we have uh, brought an element from a string from a list the same way if you want to take a slice of a string how can we do that we have already seen so try practice all these operations and if you have any issues just let me know so till then see you goodbye let's quickly look into the agenda for today's session so in our last session we had learned about strings so today we will be learning about some special methods that we can be that can be applied on a string after looking into these methods we will look into in and not in operator why do we use in and not in operator and how what is basically their use then we will also look into some useful operations which can be done using backslash so you have a backslash uh, button on your keyboard so we will be using that backslash button and uh, we'll be doing some operations fine so let's move on so string methods so let's take an example we have a string a hello world now just look at the spaces that we have before the string and the spaces that we have at the end of the string so just have a look at this and because what we will be doing we will be using several methods in order to remove these spaces now we also have a string wherein we have i love football so then we have one more string which is hello comma world okay so let's look into the string methods that we have so these are basically five string methods that we will be using today the first one is a strip method what strip method is going to do so as i told you the if you can see these string these spaces that we have before the string and these spaces that we have at the end of the string what strip method will do it will remove all these white spaces from beginning and end and it will give you this result wherein you won't be having any spaces before the string and after the string 
then the second one is lower so as the name suggests lower what will lower will do it will return it will uh, just make the whole string into lower case and you will get okay so this is one of the mistakes so it should be small i and it, you will get i love football then after that there will be b upper in which case you will be getting the whole string in upper cases and you'll get i love football like this then we will be using replace function replace method replace method what it will do it will take two arguments the first argument will be the first argument will be the one wherein we will be providing the string that we need to replace and the second argument will be the one what we need to replace instead of the first string so here what we are doing we are replacing love with hate now earlier i was loving football now i am hating football fine so then the last one which is a split so a split is pretty much useful very useful string method that we will be using several times so what it will do it will just find the you will provide a separator uh, okay so let me change this so let me correct this one okay so i have corrected both the results so the here we will be getting small i and the second thing is whenever we are providing split function then we need to provide a separator so here we will be providing a separator as comma and that to comma 2 will be coming into the codes okay we have to provide the codes otherwise we will be getting an error then it will convert it into a into a list where in the first one will be so all these all the ones which are coming uh, so in the whole string wherever you will be having comma it will separate all those and make substrings of it and it will create a list which you can see like that okay so let's go to jupyter notebook and let's do our hands on okay so i have opened my jupyter notebook let's rename the uh, notebook as uh, string methods <coughs> oh so pardon my spelling string methods okay so uh, let's create the same one as say a is equal to the first one hello I'll say world and let's give some spaces okay and I'll say have these exclamation marks as well b is equal to uh, let's try another one I love football okay uh, let's make this one as capital L as capital and then some dots now C uh, let's take C as I'll say just name of some city so I'll say um, let's say Berlin comma Tokyo comma Jaipur comma Washington DC okay so if you want any more so what we can do we can have London okay so let's run these statements okay so if I'll print a so this is a B this is B this is C right now what what we will be doing first let's try with strip method okay let's try with strip method so I'll say a dot strip now can you see all the white spaces before the string and after the string are removed and you also need to remember that strip will remove all these white spaces before the string and after the string only not between the string so our the space between the string is still there fine so this is the way by which basically we can remove these uh, if we want to remove the white spaces before the string and after the string we can use the strip method let's try another method let's go with lower and okay so lower a dot lower let's try a dot lower and you'll get everything in small lower caps right let's try b dot lower you'll get i love football in lowercase c dot lower you get 
you will get everything in lower cases right so this is the way way by which we can basically use lower so where if somebody asks you how can you uh, make the whole string into lower cases then we can use lower method okay this lower is pretty much useful because if let's say you are working on a project where what you want to do you have to you have to iterate a string so in that case let's say and we know that python is case sensitive so if the name somewhere you have provided the name as uh, let's say rita and somewhere you have provided rita rita so both these names are different because here we have capital r and here we have small r so whenever you are working on such conditions such project then what you have to do the best scenario the best possible way the best possible solution is either you can just make the whole string into lower cases or either you can make the whole string into upper cases so that that can be easier for you fine so let's try with upper and so i'll go with a dot upper so write b dot upper now i love football in caps c dot upper now all the cities in caps fine so this is the way by which we can basically uh, convert our whole string into upper caps let's try another method the one yeah replace is also pretty much useful let's go with a what is a a is hello world so what i'll say a dot replace i replace my hello with hi right so you got a a dot a is hi world so this is also oh, uh, so i would also like to tell you one more thing so whenever you you are using these functions these methods they are just uh, like producing the result but the thing is they have not basically modified or made any change to a okay so a is still hello world while this method has actually converted it to high world but a is still hello world so if you want to replace a with uh, high world then you have to use a is equal to replace and you'll say hello and you'll say hi now if you go and check your a now it is high world fine okay so let's try another one b what is b b is i love football now i'll say i'll what i'll do i'll just replace now earlier i used to love football now i don't love it i'll just okay let's let's try with the small caps okay i hate football now can you see it is still i love football why is it still i love football because the l that i have provided is lower case while the l which is there in the string is upper case so python is case sensitive and it will not allow you to do such replacement okay so let's try with love and let's go with hate i hate football now what i want just just look into this and what i want to do i'll replace all the a with e b dot replace so wherever you will be having a in this string it will be replaced with e so uh, okay okay so uh, let me replace this one b is equal to b dot replace now i'll try i hate football football fine let's go and let's try with c c is valid well tokyo jaipur what i want to do in this case what i'll do i'll just replace my wherever i am having spaces what i'll do i'll replace it with uh, sorry okay what i'll do i'll just replace it with i'll replace my spaces with um what shall i do i'll replace my spaces with uh let's say plus addition addition operators okay so can you see i have replaced my spaces with addition operators 
if you do not like addition operators let's replace it with some other let's say uh, let's replace it with some more spaces fine right okay so this is the way by which we can basically replace any of the substring in a string to another string fine let's look into the last method that we have split i really like this method because this is quite useful and it will be useful in many of the projects like whenever you are working on pandas numpy you will definitely use this function okay so let's go with a so what is the a a is high world okay so what i'll do i'll just replace no i'll just split the i'll just split with spaces okay i'll just split it with spaces okay so we had two spaces over here two spaces over here that's why okay let's go with this space okay empty separator doesn't work if you want to if you do like this in this case it will remove all the white spaces from the beginning and it will remove all the white spaces from the end now it won't be there but if you go and provide a split like this then you'll get like okay b b uh, let's do the same with b dot split and i hate football b dot split and if i say i'll get the same answer right now c c dot split what i'll do this time i'll split it with comma okay uh, i'll split it with comma now can you see washington dc london everywhere you got they are all got separated and are now converted into a list right if you want to split it with uh, space now well in Tokyo Japan and Washington is coming into one coming as one element DC is coming as another element then London is coming as another element right so by this way we, we can split our string and convert it into a list fine so let's move on to presentation and let's see in and not in operators okay so okay so now in and not in operator so let's say i have a string as a is equal to his marks is in physics chemistry history r50 60 and 70 let's say this is the one of the string now if i'll go and search for 50 in a i can search like 50 in a so it will say true yes it is there if i say 40 in a we know that 40 is not there so it will say false the same way if i'll go and search for 50 not in a then it will result false and if i'll search for 40 not in a it will search for true so let's go to jupyter notebook and try this out okay so uh, <coughs> i'll go with the same statement c one in tokyo jaipur washington dc fine so i'll say uh, b in a sorry b in c it's true now z in c false right now i'll say uh, berlin in c instead of berlin what i'll do i'll say london in c true now if i'll say in tokyo in c yes true as a rokyo in c do we have rokyo in c no we do not have rokyo in c it will say false but now if i say rokyo not in c it will result true. yeah it is not there if i say tokyo not in c it will result false so this way you can use in and not in operator if you want to find if it is an string or not uh, by the way you can use the same in and not in for list as well just try for list this consider this as an assignment for you and try in and not in in list as well moving on now let's see use of backslash so if we have a string like he is a legend in cricket so can you see we have provided this as a string with double quotes 
now in between we also have two double quotes for legend now don't you think it will be ambiguous for python to to distinguish this double quote with this double quotes these double quotes how will it be able to understand if this is the right one or not so let's go to jupyter notebook and let's see how what we need to do about it okay so let's create a string as x uh, let's create he is a legend in cricket so legend in cricket and uh, no. fine let's try this okay now can you see python is not able to understand what you have provided so that is why it has said it is saying that it is an invalid syntax fine so let's go back to the presentation now what can we do about it so in this case what we can do we can provide backslash to create such a string what we can do uh, we can provide so wherever we have double quotes and we do not want it to be considered as the beginning or the end of the string what we can do we can provide backslash before it like this and like this then it will not consider it as a beginning and ending and it will consider it as a regular a regular string okay so let's go to jupyter notebook fine so what i'll do i'll say x is equal to e is a legend in cricket okay so what i'll do i'll backslash over here and backslash over here now can you see all those black and black and green are over now the whole string is coming in red so if i'll go and try it you'll get he is a legend in cricket fine so this is the way by which you can basically use backslash in order to uh provide the strings wherein you need to use double quotes or single quotes fine now the same way we can also use backslash t for providing tabs while using print statement and we can also use backslash n for providing next line while using print statement so let's go to jupyter notebook and i'll show you how we can use backslash t and backslash n in print statements okay so backslash t uh backslash t okay so uh, let's take a string hello and backslash t world if you print x if you take x is equal to hello world t and if you print x it will show you the same string which you have provided but if i'll go and do print x then can you see it has converted this backslash t into a tab so this is basically a tab which is being used and uh, but always remember if you want to use this tab if you are using backslash t then you can use this tab only when you are using print statement fine same is the case with backslash n what i'll do i'll just give you the same statement i'll just take the same statement hello backslash n and world fine now if you go and print x it won't do anything it won't there won't be any change but if you go and print your x now can you see this backslash n is being used for the next line fine so backslash n is always used for next line if you want the next string to come into the next line then you can use backslash n and if you want to use tab in between the two strings then you can use backslash t fine so what do you have learned so far we have learned five methods strip lower upper replace and split then we also learned about in and not in operators then we learned about backslash and backslash t and backslash n so try all these operations if you have any issues just let me know and uh, uh, I have also provided an assignment go through it and do it by yourself so till then see you in the next lecture goodbye okay so uh, let's look into the agenda for today's session 
today we will be looking about for loops so why do we use for loops and how to use for loops in python we will be looking about it so first for loop so why do we use for loop so if let's say if i have a question what i want to do i want to print hello five times what you can do you can uh, open your console you can open your console and write code as print hello one time and then just copy it and write it five times so in this way you will be able to write the print hello five times but if let's say i want it to be printed thousand times or say ten thousand times or say twenty thousand times how will you print it then will you be copying it thousand times don't you think it is tedious so in order to save us from this tedious effort we have for loops we have loops and here we will be talking about for loops we have while loops as well we will be talking about while loop in the next session but for now we can use for loop in that case okay so we can use for loop if we want to iterate any sequence let's say if we want to iterate from 1 to 100 then also we can use for loop and if you also want to iterate list set and dictionary are also one of the objects if you want to iterate those then also we can use for loops so if you want to go and see for the syntax of for loop we have we start with for then we give we, go, we give our condition i'll show you what exactly the conditions that we give then we have to use the same colon operator which we had used in if and else statement and then we can provide these statements so let's go to jupyter notebook and see how we can create a for loop and how is it useful so i i have opened my jupyter notebook and let's rename the notebook i'll say for loop okay so what i will do i will say so let's start with for whenever you are using a for loop then you have to declare a variable for i i is basically a variable in whenever we are using for loop we have to use in and say range i'll say 0 to 5 now when you were learning about list what you saw that you can use 0 then after comma but if you remember we had used colon operator in between and the 5 was not included and it was including 4 and it was not including 5 so the same case we have over here in this case if i'll go and print i what you will find this is 0 1 2 3 4 it will print i so how is it going i in range 0 to 5 so basically 0 to 5 is 0 1 2 3 4 don't think that uh, it is storing it as a list i'm just showing you that 0 1 2 3 4 could be anything so it's a range and it is just iterating from it 0 then it is printing print i which is printing 0 then 1 2 and 3 and 4 let's try another one i'll say for i in range 0 to 100 print i then it will print till 100 till 99 right it's taking too much space so i'll say 10 and print it now let's try another one this time what i will do i will not print my i I will just say 0 to 5 and I will print hello can you see I can print hello 5 times right let's take in another example now this time what we will do we will do some different sort of operation what I will be doing I will say x is equal to 1 okay i will declare a variable as x is equal to 1 and i'll say for i in range 0 to 5 print 
x. Can you see one 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 printed? Now instead, what I want, I will say I don't want to print x. I will I just want to increase it. I just want to add i to it and then print it. I'll say x is equal to one. I'll say for i in range zero to five. Say print x plus i. One two three four five. Fine, starting with zero and adding i. Now let's try another one. What we will be what we will be doing this time is we will be taking the we will be doing the factorial. We will be calculating calculating the factorial of a number. Right? How are we going to calculate the factorial of a number? That we will see. We know that what is factorial. So if I'll say five factorial, five factorial is basically five into four into three into two into one, right? What I will do, I'll say just command this also that we won't get any error. Now I'll say for i in range. Zero to let's let's try with five only for i in range zero to not zero. I'll go with one, and I'll say till five. Okay, not five. I'll go with six. For i in range zero to one, uh, sorry, one to six. I'll print. I'll say x is equal to. X multiplied by i, and here what I'll say x is equal to one, and at last I'll say print x. Can you see I got one twenty? If you want to see how it basically worked, so I'll go and print x like this. Now, first it uh, first one. Went into the loop. X was one. Now x was is equal to one into one, which is one, and it printed one. Then two went into the loop. Then two into one is two. Then three into two is six. Then six into four is twenty-four. Then one twenty. Understood by this way. So this is by this particular operation, we are able to get the factorial of pi. But in case I do, I just want an input from an user, and I will calculate the factorial of that number. What I will do in that case, I'll say I'll declare a variable y is equal to int, and I'll say, uh, okay, before this, just okay. So before moving on, let's try another one. What I'll say, x is equal to ten. I'll say for i in range. Zero to five. What I want? X is equal to x minus one. And print i. Print x. Now, did you did you understand? Ten minus one nine. Then it printed nine. Then i went into the range. Or for easiness, I'll say i comma x. Now, when i was zero, it printed nine. Then i was one. Then it printed eight, two, three, four, five, right? Now, look, coming back to the question that we had, we will, what we will be doing, we will be calculating the factorial of a number which is we provided by an user. So, why I use equal to int input? Please enter number. Okay. I'll be taking as an input x is equal to one for i in range one comma what I'll say y plus one. There we were using five, so I provided six. Now I will provide y plus one. I'll say x is equal to x minus x. Uh, I'll say x is equal to x multiplied by i. 
let's correct this and I'll say print x okay let's let's print x over here so that we can give, get the cumulative result okay let's try this what do you want let's try it 5 1 2 6 24 20 again let's try it let's try it 2 1 2 let's try it 3 1 2 6 let's try it 20 1 2 6 24 120 can you see the big result coming up now what i will do i will just use this and it will give me the result as i want i will say 6 it should be 720 720 7 5040 5040 i don't remember 5040 multiplied by 8 but it is 40320 so in this way basically we can calculate we can create sorry we can find out the factorial of a number by using for loop now we use for loop in another conditions as well for iterating any python object let's take an example i have a list as one is equal to i'll say i have sam let's say i have different different colors black i have white i have blue i have red fine i have four numbers i'll say four for i in you do not need to provide range over here you can just say l1 and just print i you'll get all the four results this is one of the way by which you can basically iterate your list for i in do not need to provide range you can just say l1 now if you want to provide range the first thing that you remember just think about this for i in range uh, what do you want uh, okay let's say 0 comma 10 print you cannot print i what you can do you can use your i i is basically 0 in this case so what i'll go i'll do l1 i i know uh, let's try l1 0 because now for i in range 0 to 10 print l1 of 0 which is printing black 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 right because you are using range from 0 to 10 times so it will print 10 times now instead what i'll say l1 10 but i'll say l1 i okay it has printed black white blue and red but then it has given us an index error why it has given us an index error we know that the list is containing four elements only and after third after third index it is not having any value this means that it will give us the range out of range index error so what we can do in this case i'll just say len of l1 now we won't be getting any error so by this way you can iterate a list you can iterate any sort of loop and using for loop so practice have some questions i will i have also provided you an assignment just go through it and try to solve it and practice as much as possible if you have any issues just let me know till then see you goodbye let's look into the agenda for today's session today we will be learning about while loops so what are while loops why do we use while loops and how do we use while loops so let's move on so while loop is basically very much similar to for loop the difference is in for loop you provide the condition within for for i uh, in range 0 to 100 like that but in while loop what we do we first basically assign a value to a variable then we use it as a condition in while loop and according to which we create a loop then we can use while loop if we want to perform any task several number of times like if we want to print hello a number of times and we can also use conditions as well uh, like and and or using relational operators like and and or and so syntax for while loop is while then we give a condition and then we need to give a statement so let's quickly move on to Jupyter notebook and i'll show you how basically we can use while loop okay so i have opened my Jupyter notebook let's re uh, rename the uh, notebook as while loop okay so when we 
create a while loop, what the first thing that we need to do is we need to assign a, assign a value to a variable which we will be using in the while loop. So I'll say while and then I have to provide the condition. I'll say i smaller than 10, smaller than 5. And then I'll say print hello. And I'll say i is equal to i plus 1. So when i will be equal to 0, then first it will check the condition i is smaller than 5. Yes, we know that i is smaller than 5. Then it will print hello. Then it will go to the condition where it will say i is equal to i plus 1. Now my i will be 1. And then it will compare. So let's run this code. And can you see I got hello 5 times. Now I'll show you one more thing. So if I'll use i equal to 0. And then I'm saying while i is smaller than 5. I'll say print hello. Uh, this time what I'll do, I won't print hello, I will print i and I'll say i is equal to i plus 1, write 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 because the value of i is getting increased because of this statement. Now, in a case where we are not providing such a statement, i equal to 0 while i is smaller than 5 and I'll say print i. Now, I am not providing any closing condition for the loop so can you see the loop is going till infinity because the value of i is not increasing and it is always lesser than 5 so this loop will be an infinite loop and it will not stop and it has my kernel has just hanged okay so Understood. So what we can do in this case is i is equal to this time I'll say i plus 2 and now it will print 0, 2 and 4. Okay. Now let's try another one. I'll say i equal to 0. I'll say j, j equal to 0. I'll say while i is smaller than while i plus j is smaller than 10 print what I'll print I'll print i comma j so there is an invalid syntax because I forgot to mention colon over here and I have done one more mistake so this should be 0 not o oh so again I did the same mistake I this loop is going till infinity here I'll do i is equal to i plus 1 i is equal to i plus 1 I'll say j is equal to j minus 1 let's try this so it will also go till infinity so I'll say j is equal to j plus 1 j plus 2 so now can you see 0 0 then 1 2 then 2 4 then 3 6 now 3 plus 6 is 9 now after that i will be is equal to 3, i will be is equal to 4 and j will be is equal to 4 plus 2, j will be is equal to 6 plus 2, 8, so 8, 4, 12, so which is not satisfying the condition, so it will exit the loop. So we have to provide a condition such, such that there should be a statement for which it will be able to exit the loop, otherwise it will be going till infinity. Fine. So uh, practice while loops and compare it with for loops you take the same condition and do uh, take the same question and try for loop for it and try while loop on it then if you have any question just let me know till then see you goodbye let's look into the agenda for today's session today we will be learning about break keyword and continue keyword so what is break keyword how do we use it and what is continue how do we use it that we will be uh, knowing today so <clears throat> let's move on so first we will be seeing break so whenever we uh, create a loop let's say we are creating a for loop or we are creating a while loop now at some point of time let's say we do not want to iterate this loop further now what we can do we can exit this loop 
but how are we going to exit this loop we will be using break keyword in that case so for an example i am creating a for loop wherein i am providing the numbers from 1 to 5 range so the my output um in a normal condition my output should be from 1 2 3 4 right but here what i will do i will provide a condition that if my i is equal to 3 that means wherever my i is equal to 3 that time i need to break this loop and rest of the time i need to print my statement as print i now the output what will you get in this case it will be 1 because we were iterating from 1 so the first condition is 1 second condition is true that is 2 in the third condition when i is equal to 3 it will go to this loop this if else statement and where it will we have provided break so that means it will exit the complete loop so in that case what will happen it will exit the loop and it will not go and look into other conditions so by because of which we will get the result as 1 and 2 so let's go to jupyter notebook and see how it actually works so i have opened my jupyter notebook let's try the same example let's say for i in range uh, 0 comma 10 list this time and i'll say print i so can you see i'm getting 0 1 2 0 2 9 but now what i'll do i'll say if i is equal to 3 i'll just say <coughs> print i is 3 okay now can you see after 0 1 and 2 it printed i is 3 and then it uh, again printed i now what i what will i do instead of printing i is 3 i'll say print i is 3 and, and then i'll say break now it will print i is 3 and then it will break the loop yeah now can you see i is 3 and then it has broken the loop and now it is not going to iterate further in this loop now similar way let's let's try another one i'll say for i in uh, let's create a list l1 is equal to i'll create it as uh, 10 20 30 304 40 50 60 okay now for i in l1 uh i'll say for i in l1 if l1 if i is equal to if i is equal to let's say 40 break else and print what i will be printing print i now it will go to list 10 20 to 304 now when it comes to 40 it will break the loop right now let's try another example with while loop i'll say i is equal to 0 i'll say while i is smaller than 5 print i and i is equal to i plus 1 it will print 0 1 2 3 4 right now what i will do i'll say <coughs> print i if i is equal to let's say 3 then break okay so 0 1 2 it has printed 3 and then it comes to this if statement and it has break, uh, broken the loop now it will not iterate further right so this is a way by which you can use break keywords whenever you want to exit the loop you can use break keyword so uh, now let's move on and uh, I'll, I'll change I'll change the notebook name to break and continue now let's go to presentation and see how continue works now let's move on to continue so <coughs> uh, what we saw in break is that uh, whenever we want to exit the loop we use break keyword now if I say I do not want to exit the loop what I want I just want to skip one of the condition so let's take an example i have for i in range 1 to 5 now what i want to do i want to print 1 i want to print 2 but if i is equal to 3 i do not want to print 3 i just want to go to 4 directly so i'll say continue and it will not print the further statements in this continue and it will move further and it will print i 
So can you see the results? Can you see the output? The output is 1, 2 and then it has skipped 3 and then it printed 4. I think 5 will also not come in this case because we have uh, the loop will go till 4. So I'll uh, just uh, correct it and so I have corrected the output. So the output will be uh, will be 1, 2, 4 here. So let's go to Jupyter Notebook and see how it actually works. Okay, so I have opened my Jupyter Notebook. What, what we are going to do here, we will be writing continuous statements. Okay, so I say for I in range uh what i will do i'll say one two five i'll use the same same uh example that we had in the presentation so i'll say print i now in that case you will get one two three four right but what i'll do i'll say if i is equal to three and what i'll do i'll say print uh we are printing three Okay, so you get 1, 2, then we are printing 3, then 3 and then 4. Now what I will do, I will use the same place. So let's write it again for i in range 1 to 5. I'll say if i is equal to 3, <coughs> I'll say print. We are not printing. We are skipping 3 okay and i'll say continue and then i'll say print i okay can you see one two we are skipping three and then four by this way you can basically uh, write the continuous statement if you want to skip any iterator you can use continue if you want to break out of the loop you if you want to exit the loop you can use break let's take another example l1 is equal to i'll take a list so 10, 20, 30, 30, 20, 50. Okay. So I'll say uh, for i in L1, uh, print i. Let's first print all the uh, all the elements in list. Now what I will do, I'll say if i equals to equals to 30. And then I'll say print uh skipping 30 and i'll say continue now what will you see instead of 30 both the times we'll get skipping 30 okay i'll just print it now can you see this and if you if you do not even want skipping 30 let's quickly run it so i'll just copy the whole stuff in order without wasting any more time i'll just copy it up and paste it here and now what will i do i will just remove this print statement or else what i can do i can just comment this out now let's print it so 10 20 20 and 50 so we are basically skipping this now what will i do in this case i will say if i equals to equals to 20 break i'll say print breaking the loop uh what i will do i'll add 30 over here as well okay breaking the loop and i'll say break fine and here i'll print skipping 30 and i'll say continue okay now why i'm basically doing it i'm just trying to give you all the examples uh, in order to uh, get you uh, enough enough questions to practice so the same way try each and every possible way whichever you can find and so that this you should do not need to mug it you just need to understand it and you'll be able to uh, so you can think of various situations where you can use these continue and break statements Okay, so let's try this one. Yeah, so first it went to 10, then it printed 10 because it is not been provided in any of the if statements, then it goes to 30. So there 30, it is skipping 30. Now then it is, it went to 20 and for 20, we know that it is going to break the loop, right? So that's why it, break, it has broken the loop and now it has already 
exit okay so by this way you can uh, uh, by this way you can uh, do practice on break and continue and if you have any issue just let me know uh, so till then see you and goodbye let's look into the agenda for today's session today we will be learning about functions what are functions how can we define function and how can we call a function so all this we will be knowing in this session so let's move on so what are functions so function is basically a set of statements or a piece of code grouped together to perform a specific task right so in python if you remember we have numerous built in statements built in functions like len like apps so len is basically used in order to get the length of if you remember list we use len function to get the length of the whole list so the same way we have created a function which will whenever we are going to execute it it will give us the result directly okay and now let's move on to defining a function how can we define a function in python so whenever we are defining a function in python we have to give def as the keyword def keyword then we have to give the function name and then we can provide the arguments arguments are basically like x y so what all uh, values that we are going to use in the uh, function that we will be providing as an argument so then we will be providing these statements so you must always remember that uh, about the indentation that i had told you about so whenever you create a definition a function name then after colon in the next line you have to give a tab then you have to write these statements okay same way then last is return either you can return a null value or you can return any value from return keyword okay so how to call a function so basically whenever you have defined a function then we have to call it so we'll give the same name that we have given to a function so we'll provide the function name and we'll provide all the arguments that needs to be that needs to be given always remember so the function cannot be called before defining so you have to first define a function then only you can call that function so you have to remember this and let's move on to jupyter notebook and create an actual function okay so i have opened my jupyter notebook uh, let's try a simple example let's say x is equal to 3 now what i want i want the square of x x is square 3 okay now i want to find the square of 4 so i'll say x to 4 so this will give me the square of 4, uh, 4. now instead of writing it a number of times what i can do i can just make it generic so what i'll do i'll create a function i'll say def <clears throat> then i'll create the name as a square and i'll say x x is the argument which is basically we will be getting it as an input right then colon then enter so if you can see this is the differences of tab so i'll say y is equal to x to the power square 2 right x square what i will be doing this is my statement this is my statement now i will be returning y fine so i have created a function def square then uh, after giving colon i on the next line i'll give the statement the statement will be y is equal to x to the power 2 and then i'm returning y so i'll say shift enter now what i'll do i can just say square two four square square three nine square ten hundred square minus ten hundred so by this way you now you do not need to define x each time and you have to get the result you can just say square and you can get the result now let's try another one this time what we will be doing we will just get the cube of the uh, statement we can just get the cube of the uh, x let's say so i'll say cube and i'll say x and i'll say y is equal to x power 3 now what i will do i will just say return and y fine now what will i do i'll just say cube and say 3 27 cube 10 1000 cube minus 20 
minus 20 minus 8000 so this is the way by which you can create a function and you can do whatever you want if you want to print anything over here you can just print as well so instead i say i do not want to return it so what will i do i'll just create a, another function i'll say def this time what i will be doing i will just do addition of x comma y comma z okay and i'll say y is equal to no not y a is equal to add is equal to x plus y plus z and i'll say uh, print add fine this time what i will be doing i won't be running this statement i'll just create a new new shell and i'll just say addition and i'll say 10 20 and 30 now can you see name addition is not defined so first you have to define the function first okay so i'll say define now as you can see i have already pressed shift enter now this statement got executed now when i'll try this i'll get 60. so if you want to print a directly add over here you can use addition directly otherwise what you can do you can also provide return so uh, let's try another one define this time what i will be doing i'll say add and multiplication sum and add and add and multiplication add mul and we'll say x comma y comma z this time now i'll say add is equal to x to y multiplied by z sorry x plus y plus z then i'll say mul is equal to x multiplied by my multiplied by z and say print add and print mul okay add mul you have to provide 10 20 30 you'll get 60 and 60 hours and let's let's give some name to it add is add addition is and i'll say product is fine and let's try this addition is 60 and product is 6000 now what i want to do instead what i want i don't want to print it i just want to return it so i'll just copy this up and print it over here so how can we return multiple statements so let's try one simple way return add comma mul and if i'll say add mul 10 comma 20 comma 30 oh case sensitive 60 comma 6000 now what i will do i'll say uh, a is equal to add is equal to um i'll say a string addition is and i'll say comma str because the number that that uh, add what is add returning over here add is returning an integer so i'll say str add just copy this and say mul and multiplication is multiplication is and i'll say str mul let's try this let's try this addition is 60 and multiplication is 6000 now uh, we got this result but i would really like to know what's my type of add mul it's a function but what's my type of admiral this the result the output that i'm getting it's a tuple right if you want to get it as a list you can just say like this you will get a list right so this is the way you can create a function and uh, decrease the number of statements number of lines if you want to now create a last function that is being used mostly 
so what we will be doing we will be creating a factorial and we are going to do it without recursion let's uh, let's just change it now okay so def factorial x right for i in uh, range 0 comma x plus 1 no not 0 i'll say 1 comma x plus 1 x plus 1 and i'll say over here fact is equal to 1 i'll say fact is equal to fact multiplied by i right right and what will i do over here i will return fact now factorial 5 120 factorial 3 6 factorial 4 24 fine so in this way you can also find the factorial by just uh, defining a function as factorial and you can provide all the condition and you can return your values if you do not want to return it you can also print it okay so try and practice functions i'll rename this notebook to functions so uh, let me know if you have any issue so till then see you in the next lecture goodbye let's look into the agenda for today's session today we will be learning about recursion so first we'll see what are recursive functions and then we'll see how can we define a recursive function then we'll see how can we call a recursive function so let's move on so first recursive function a recursive function is defined as a function that can call itself repeated directly or indirectly so when you define a function you know that uh, you'll provide all these statements and then you'll provide a written statement but in recursive function what you do you again you return the same function with some arguments okay so when you call the same function again into that function then it is a recursive function okay so that is called as recursion now uh, we already know that uh, whenever we are calling a uh, we are calling a function then we need to define it first fine so this is the way by which we basically you can create a recursive function or uh, we can do recursion so let's go to jupyter notebook and uh, ha have our hands on on recursion so i have opened my jupyter notebook let's rename the notebook as recursion and okay so what i'll do uh, in recursion what we'll do we'll take an example of uh, factorial okay factorial of a number fine so what we'll do i'll just correct my spelling i don't know how many times i do it so okay so um, let's create a, a function def factorial and we'll take the argument as x for which we need to find the factorial so what we will do we know that uh, uh, in a factorial whenever we find a factorial the factorial of 1 is 1 the factorial of 2 is 2 into 1 the factorial of 3 is 3 into 2 into 1 right so what we will be doing we'll say uh, what if the x is equal to 1 i will return 1 else what will i oh sorry so else what will i return i'll say whenever x is greater than 1 i will return x multiplied by factorial x minus 1 right so what will it do if i take an example of 5 so 5 will go into the function now 5 is not equal to 1 so it will not um, loop into this statement it will go to else here what will it do it will return x that is 5 multiplied by factorial of 4 now it will go to 4 then it will return 4 multiplied by factorial of 3 then it will go to 3 the same way it will go till 1 where it will return 1 so in this way 5 multiplied by 4 then multiplied by 3 then 2 then 1 so it will go that way so i'll run this statement 
Oh, I have made a mistake. Okay, so else after else I need to provide a colon. And don't forget about indentation. Always put a tab before else if for while and in function. Let's try factorial 5. It should come 120 and yes, we are getting 120. Now try with 6. It should return 720. Factorial 7. It should return. Oh. Let's, I need to correct my statement. Uh, I need to correct my spelling. Factorial 7 is 5040. If you want to try factorial of 1. Factorial of 1. It will return 1. Factorial of 2. It will return 2. Factorial of 3. It will return 6. Fine. Okay, okay, so we have understood how we can basically do uh, how we can basically get the factorial of a number using using what using using recursion. Now let's take an another example wherein we will be using recursion. I'll take an example of Fibonacci series. So if you know about Fibonacci series, it is zero, then one, then we add two numbers before to uh, add two numbers before this number so it will be one then we'll add two numbers one plus one two then two plus one three then three plus two five then five plus three eight then eight plus five thirteen so this way this is the Fibonacci series okay if you want to google it you can also google it so what we need to do we need to create a Fibonacci series okay now what we will be doing how are we going to do this so let's create a def, uh, let's create a function def fibonacci x and uh, i'll say um if x equals to 1 x equals to 1 so 0 is my first number right 1 is my second number right so I'll just uh, give a condition for x is equal to 1 and 2. If x is equal to 1, then return 1. Uh, sorry, return 0. If lf x is equal to 2, then return what will it return? 1. Fine. So let's let's run this. Okay. So if I say Fibonacci Pardon my spelling, let's let's correct it. Fibonacci is zero. Okay, one. So Fibonacci one is zero. Fibonacci one is zero. Okay. Fibonacci two is one. But if I'll go and try Fibonacci 3 okay Fibonacci 3 it will not return anything because we do not have we have not provided any statement any return value for Fibonacci 3 so what will we do in this case else else what will I do return Fibonacci x minus 1 not Fibonacci, it's Fibonacci. X minus 1 plus Fibonacci X minus 2. Fine. So if I say 3, it will return 3 minus 1, 2. 3 minus 1, 2. And 3 minus 2, 1. So 2 plus 1. It will return 2 plus 1. So 2 plus 1 will be 1 plus 0. Fine. If I go with 4, so it will return Fibonacci 3 and Fibonacci 4. For Fibonacci 3 it will go and create a loop and it will perform the operation. Now let's try this. Fibonacci 3, so Fibonacci 1, we got it. Fibonacci 2, we got 1. Fibonacci 3, we got 1. Right, this is the third one. Fibonacci 4. Again, I made the same mistake. Fibonacci 4. We get 2. Let's try here. Fibonacci 5. 3. Fibonacci 6. 5. Fibonacci 
seven, eight. So we are getting correct numbers, right? So our function is correct at this moment. But what I want, so I want an input from an user. So he'll say, I want ten numbers. I want twelve numbers. In this way, he'll say, and what I'll return to him, I'll return all the numbers, and I'll return all the numbers in a list. Let's say. Okay, so what I'll do, I'll just take an input as x is equal to int input, and I'll say enter number for Fibonacci series, right? So he'll provide a number over here. What will I do for i in range one comma x plus one? I'll say uh, let's create a list over here. I'll say L1 is equal to blank list. And uh, if you do not know what is this, this is basically a blank list. Now, in this, we will be appending our further results. Uh, for I in range 1 to x plus 1, I'll say uh, L1 dot append. What will I be appending? Fibonacci i. Fine. Now I'll say 10. Oh, it is not returning me anything. Okay, now I need to print L1. Yeah, so can you see 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34. Now let's print L1 over here directly. Let's run it. I'll say 20. 0, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 24, 35. Okay. Right. So in this way, you can get all the results. Fine. This is basically the way by which you can print all the results. Now, if you don't want to print it this way, let's let's try it once again. I'll say five, and you'll get the result like this. Now, if you do not want the result in list, if you want the result in a string, what we can do for i in l1. Uh, I'll say str1 is equal to just a normal string and I'll say for i in l1 str1 is equal to str1 plus space plus i. Uh, what will I do over here? I'll I will not declare str one here. I'll declare it here. Okay. So plus i, and then at last print str one. Now let's print it. Oh, we cannot concatenate into it string. So this is a str. Okay, zero one one two three. Right. What will I do? I'll just copy this. Uh, copy. I'll just cut it and paste it over here. Now, let's do this. So, for 5, 1, 2, right? Now, 10, right? 20, 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 3, 8, 8, 5, 13. Let's try over here. Uh, 7, 3, 10, 7, 3, 10. Okay, this is also correct. This is correct. Perfect. So this way, we can uh, produce our Fibonacci series and so try both the operations. I have also provided a assignment, provided an assignment, go through it, try to do it before looking into the solution. After all, you are the one who has to get the solution. So try each and every possible way if you want to search as well, you can also search. but I can I, I will really suggest that if you are pretty much confident that you are not able to do this if you are not able to get the solution then only go and look at the solution otherwise try to do it by yourself if this is for the first time if you are able to get the solution for that assignment I am pretty much sure that in further in future if you will get any question any such question you will be able to do it so till then Try and solve the question by yourself and see you in the next lecture. Goodbye. Let's look into the agenda for today's session. Today we will be discussing about sets.
so what are sets how can we define a set in python and uh, what are some useful set operations that we can perform right so let's move on so sets set is a collection of unordered data items which can be of different data types so as we saw in list so set also uh, contains different elements it is basically a data structure which is having different number of elements and all the elements can be of any data type they can be of integer they can be of float they can be of uh, string and the the most important part is set is unordered so in list like you had index so the same way in set we do not have any indexes the elements are unordered fine so sets are defined in curly brackets list uh, we know that lists are defined in square brackets but sets are defined in curly brackets moving on this main the main part so in set all the elements are unique so if you define a set which is having uh, let's say duplicates then all the duplicates will be removed when you uh, execute that set i'll show you how it works so let's take an example of set a 1 2 3 hello and true so these are different elements string is there boolean value is there integer is there and all are defined in a curly bracket so these are set okay so let's move on to jupyter notebook and i'll show you how we can basically uh, define a set and how the elements are unique so i have opened my jupyter notebook let's rename this notebook as set and let's go with a equals to i'll define 1 2 3 the same one which we had in in the presentation and this is sam okay so let's print a a is 1 2 3 hello and sam oh why are we not having true over here right so that is why we are not having true over here because true is considered as one so if i'll do this once again i'll say one comma so can you see set doesn't contain set doesn't allow any non unique value let's say false so if i'll go and search for a so you have two three false hello sam and true so these are unordered as well if i'll go and go for one and if you'll go and try a so 1 2 3 and false is over now let's add zero as well and if you'll go and check your a now false is also gone so we know that sets are unique so the main part is all the elements if it is a boolean value as well then also true is considered as one and false is considered as zero so if you have false and zero both are in the sets both in set then only one of them will be allowed so if let's say i'll define b equals to i'll say true false okay let's do this true false and true and false and let's say 1 0 20 30 and 30.0 and 50 and 50.25 fine now let's see how many will remain there and let's go with 50.25 as well okay okay so let's go with v now so true and false are there but 1 and 0 is not there because the one which is uh, the one which set has find uh, earlier than the second one so it has removed the second one and it has considered the first one only right so true and false are there false and true are there the string will be there 50.25 as a string is correct and 50.25 as an int as a float is different now 50 is there and we have provided two twos over here now let's let's go with 50.0 as well uh okay the so it is 30.0 and let's try b so can you see 30.0 has not been considered over here right so 30 and 30.0 both are same but 50.25 and 50 both are different guys right? are you able to understand the difference over here 
so basically true is considered as one so that is why either two or one will be there both will not be there now if you want to go and check the type of b so it is set right so this is basically a way by which we can define a set set does not contain any duplicate values so i'll show you one quick method so let's say let's define list one okay not list one is your list and i'll say just have some numbers in it one two three four four five five point zero six point six and seventeen and seventeen point two five and eighteen and let's say let's have true and false as well right so list not be having any issue and it will show you all the results right but let's convert this list into a set i say list one and i'll say now in this way you can convert a list into a set by using set operator set as a set method this is a constructor so we will be providing set and then in set we will be providing the list now can you see uh, false is there because we had not provided zero so false will be there but true has gone because we have one 0.6 is there 6 is there 5 out of 5.05 5, 5 is there 4 is there 17 17.25 18 now are you able to understand the difference between the set and the list so this is the difference and okay let's iterate the set now for i in uh, let's make it c is equal to okay now for i in c print i now this way you can iterate the set the same way we, where we were iterating the list the same way we will iterate the set as well for i in c print i so we will get all the elements in set all the unique elements okay so let's move on to the presentation once again okay so we have covered the uh how we can basically define a set and how we can basically iterate a set how is this how can we convert a list into a set we have already seen this now what we are going to see is some important methods that are applied in set so let's say there's a set one two three and these are some of the methods that needs to be that can be applied so if you want to add some element to the set you can use add up add method if you want to so we cannot provide the place we cannot provide the index where this four will be added it can be added anywhere so here if you can see it is it has been added at the end so no matter it is unordered we do not need to know we do not need to know if it is being stored at which place now update whenever you are using update you can provide the multiple values by using list even by using set as well Let's, we'll try if we are able to provide the set as well and then if you want to find the length of the set the same universal len operation len method which can be used for list which can be used for uh, string and the same way here which can be used for set as well in tuple in dictionaries also we will be using the same now this set dot remove to will remove the element whichever element you will provide it will remove that this set dot pop will remove the any element from the set any one element from the set okay clear will remove the complete set okay so let's let's try this these operations add update length remove pop and clear okay so i have opened my jupyter notebook uh so let's define a set so a is equal to i'll say one two three four five four three two uh, no uh, let's not have any duplicates we already know that it doesn't work and 23 okay so let's print a so the first method method we will be trying is a dot add we will be adding 100 now let's go and print a so a is having 100 now let's try lan method and lan is 10 so uh, let's try once again so I'll say a and a is this now lan of a is 9 right now when we will add a add 100 to a 
then length of a is, has changed so this is one of the easiest way by which you can basically understand uh, you can basically know if your uh, if your element has been added or not now let's try a bit update one so what i'll do a dot update and i'll be adding let's say i'm adding a list one comma two comma three oh one comma two comma three is already there so it will not be appended let's say 200 150 and 300 okay let's try a okay so 150 200 and 300 uh, 200 and 300 are already have already been appended now let's try and ca it is 13 now now let's try another one update and what i'll do this time i'll just add one two uh not one two i'll say 150 and comma let's say 250 now go and check a now 250 got added but 150 doesn't sorry 150 doesn't if you want to check if it is correct or not length of a and if you can see 40 so from 13 it has been 40 now now let's try and update the set with a set so let's see if it works or not so what i'll do i'll just use 10 comma 20 and a yes it works so 10 comma 20 has been added we can try you can see yes 16 fine uh, moving on to the next operation so we have covered length we have covered update we have covered uh, add now we will be covering remove so i'll do what i'll do i'll just remove and we already know that all inside we have only the unique elements so there will not be any inconsistency that if you have provided 74 then uh, will all the 74 will be removed or not so we do not have such inconsistency over here you, whatever number we will provide let's provide 74 let's print a and 74 which was there now it has been removed now if you want you can check a and of a so earlier it was 16 now it is 50 fine okay so let's try another one a dot pop in pop you do not need to provide any element if you will try to provide any element it will give you an error so we do not need to provide any element over here we'll just give a dot pop and it will element it will it has removed one now right now if you'll go and check a it is 14 and if you want to check a now one has been removed. let's try a dot pop once again and now it has removed two okay so it is also unordered not necessarily if it is going to remove two it might remove 300 as well okay so if you go and check a it is and length a 13 fine okay so what's the next one so let's try a dot clear so a dot clear what will it do it will remove all the elements from this set now if you go and check your length check your a now if you go and check your length of a it is zero right so now basically we have an empty set so let's move on to the presentation and see if there are any other methods available okay so there are several uh, important set operations that we need to perform so we have uh, let's say a as one two three seven eight b as one seven four five six so if you can see we have one and seven common in both the sets now there are few operations which are very much useful in set if we'll do a dot union b a dot union b if you remember in mathematics in algebra we in set in set in a we have a union b which basically combines both the uh, data and give you the unique result so give you the unique result give you the union of both so what will you get in that case you will get all the elements from a and you'll get all the elements from b but all of them will be unique none of them will be duplicate like one is there so you won't get one two times over here right a dot intersection b is the same one intersection means when you will be having the common elements between a and b right the same mathematical mathematics operation so here one and seven are the common ones so you'll get one and seven a minus b a minus b is basically when you you will be removing all the elements which are there in b so one is there in b seven is there in b so you'll get two three and eight right b minus b a same operation you will get four five and six because one and seven are already there in a so you won't get one and seven now a and uh, i don't know what we can call this operator a cap b we can say so if you can see in this one you will be getting all the elements this is basically disjoint set 
so a disjoint b where you will be getting all the different elements all the elements which are not even there in a which are not common in a right so one and seven are common in both so you'll get two three eight and four five and six okay let's go and try these out in jupyter notebook okay so i have opened my jupyter notebook let's try with uh one i'll say one two three four five six seven and b as one and seven and let's say eight nine and ten right okay so these are two sets that we have now a dot union b what are we going to get from this we will be getting all the elements from 1 to 10 right because it will be the unique set of both of them so 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 union is basically you will be combining both these sets and you will be getting as the output wherein all the elements from a and all the elements from b will be there but the thing is there will not be any duplicate so if there is an element one which is there in a and which is there in b as well so you won't be getting two ones over here and we already know the set doesn't contain any uh, multi any duplicate elements so it will be unique so we can say that yes we have included all the elements but then we have removed one of the duplicates right now let's try another one a dot intersection of b so what will we get in this case one and seven right yeah we got one and seven right now let's subtract a from b what we will get from this we will be we will not be getting the elements which are there in b so one and seven are there in b a minus b means remove b from a 8, 9, 10 is already not there in A, so we will not be worried about it. But we will be worried about 1 and 7, which is already there in A, so we will not be printing 1 and 7. What you'll get 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Right? If you'll go and try B minus A, it will also result 8, 9, and 10 only because we know that we want to remove the elements which are there in A. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 are not there in B, so we will not be considering them. But 1 and 7 are there in A, so we will remove 1 and 7 right so the last operation which is this joint a and cap b what you will you get you will get all the non-common elements between a and b right so you will get two three four five six seven and eight nine and ten so these are some of the operations that we will be doing in sets that we have done in sets so let's revise one once again so what we what are the basic properties of set it will be defined in curly brackets the second thing is there will not be any duplicates in the set if you have true it will be considered as one as i had already told you in boolean values and false will be considered as zero so you will be removing you will be retrieving either one or true or either false or zero right 50 and 50.0 bo both are same float and integers if you want to know the type of the set, you can just try type B and you'll get the set. Type and name of the set and you'll get the set. Then, if you want to convert a list to a set, just provide set as a method and in set method, provide list word in parenthesis. List, what is the name of the list that you will be providing in the parenthesis, right? If you want to iterate a set, you can say for I in name of the set and then print I. You will get all the elements, which will be unique. Then, there are several methods that we have discussed one is if you want to add anything any number any element any string you can use that method if you want to add multiples you can use update by using a list or by using a set and even you can use tuple, tuple as well so we will be discussing about tuples in the next lecture and then if you want to pro find the length of the set we already know that is a universal len method that will be used then we have update is already done then we have the remove one wherein what we will be doing we will be remove the element which we have provided if you do not want to provide any element you can just use pop method where you will not be providing any element and you will it will take uh, it will remove any element from the set okay and then if you want to just remove all the elements you can use dot clear method right now the last one wherein we will be seeing some some various mathematical operations that were used in sets so these are some of the operations one is union wherein you will get the union all the elements from a and b 
you will get the all the elements from a and b using a dot union b if you want just the common elements between a and b you can use intersection b if you want the elements of a which are not there in b you can use a minus b if you want the elements of b which are not there in a you can use b minus a and if you want to find out all the elements which are not either which are not common in a and b you can use a disjoint b fine so uh, just one thing i think a disjoint b this is correct if if it is wrong just drop me a comment and i'll correct it fine so till then practice as much as you can if you have any questions just let me know i have already provided an assignment go through it and try to solve it by yourself uh, till then see you in the next lecture in the next lecture we will be discussing about tuple so see you then goodbye let's look into the agenda for today's session today we will be discussing about tuples how can we define tuples and then we will see tuple indexing and then we will see tuple slicing okay so let's move on so tuples Tuple is a collection of order data items which can be of different data types like we have in list wherein we have uh, wherein we have a, a data structure which can contains different number of elements it could be a boolean value it could be an integer it could be a float and it could be a string and tuple is as list is a collection of order data items so here also we will be having indexing that uh, if an item is placed at a particular position then it will be uh, stick to that particular position and we can fetch that uh, particular data item using its index so tuple are immutable that means they cannot be changed they cannot be changed so like in list we can modify the item in a list but in tuple we cannot modify an item uh, modify an item tuples are defined in parentheses so this is one of the example so in list and in set in list we had square brackets to define a list in set we define a set using uh, curly brackets but in tuple we define a tuple using parentheses so let's go to jupyter notebook and define a tuple okay so i have opened my jupyter notebook i'll rename it to tuple and let's define a tuple a is equal to i'll say uh, parenthesis and I'll say one two three and hello and true and Sam okay let's print a so if you can see a has been printed the same way so the difference in the list and uh, tuple as this point is you define a list in square brackets while you define a tuple in parenthesis so let's say if you want to convert a list to a tuple so I'll define a list as b is equal to 1, 2, 3 and let's say um, 40, 25. Okay, now list. So if I'll go and check the type of b, it is list. Now if I want to convert this list into a tuple, I'll just say tuple, tuple and I'll say b. Okay. Now can you see 1, 2, 3, 40, 25 has been converted to a tuple. Now if you, let's save this tuple into a, into a variable C. Now if you go and check C, this is C. And if you want to check the data type of C, it is tuple now. Right? Now if you want to iterate a tuple for I in C, the same way we do for list, the same way we do for set, we can also iterate the tuple using uh, uh, using for loop so print let's say i and if you can see all the numbers all the elements that were there in tuple are printed in an order fine so let's do a, get back to the presentation okay so now we will look into tuple indexing so elements in tuple always start with the zeroth index as we had in list here also the first element as is considered as the zeroth index and the last element is considered as the minus one index. So if let's say this is a tuple wherein we had the first element is Sam, John, Sarah and then Karthik. So if I'll go and check the first element using the square brackets and zero, the same way we have in a string, the same way we have in list, the same, same follows in tuple as well. 
so we'll get Sam for zero, for one we'll get John, for two we'll get Sarah, and for three we'll get Karthik. So the same way as we had in list, negative indexing also works here. The last element in tuple will always be considered as a minus one index. So we'll take the same example: Sam, John, Sarah, and Karthik. Tuple one minus one will be Karthik, minus two will be Sarah, minus three will be John, and minus four will be Sam. Right? So let's get back to the Jupyter notebook and try this out. Okay, so I have opened my Jupyter notebook. Let's create a tuple as x, and I'll provide Sam, John, Sarah, and let's say Kevin. Okay, now print x. This is our x. Now if I say x zero. It will be Sam x one. It will be John x three. Will be Kevin, right? If I'll go and search for x minus one, it will be Kevin. If I'll go and search for x minus two, it will be Sarah. If I'll go and search for x minus three, it will be John. The other way, so if you want to find the length of this tuple, you can say ln x. So if I'll go and search for x ln of x it will give me an error because it is tuple is index is out of range because ln x is 4 and x4 we do we know that it doesn't exist so let's say ln x minus 1 now it will print me kevin right so this is the way basically we can do indexing in tuple it is as similar to list okay so let's move on to the presentation and see what's next okay so now comes up tuple slicing so it is also as similar to list if you want to slice multiple values from a tuple, we can use colon operator. So this is the same tuple that we have. If I'll go and provide the colon, and if you if I won't provide the uh, any number before colon and the end of colon, I'll get all the results. If I'll provide zero and colon, so that means that zero will start with the zeroth index, and it will also print all the values because we do not have provided any index at the end if i'll go with one and then you know that one is john so it will skip J sam and go with john sarah and karthi now if i'll provide colon two that means that it will start with zero but it will end to one so sam and john will come over here if i'll go with one two three it will print john and sarah right because two three will be skip and you'll get John Sarah only. So let's go back to Jupyter Notebook and let's try these operations. So I have opened my Jupyter Notebook. Let's print X once again. So X is Sam, John, John Kara, Sarah and Karthik. I'll go and search for G zero. I'll, I won't provide anything over here. So you'll get all the values. If I'll provide zero and then, so then the first index is zero, but we have not provided the second index. So that means it will start with the first index and it will go till the end. Now, if I'll provide zero and then if I'll provide three, let's say three is my last index because, or let's say if I'll provide ln of x here, it will print Sam, John, Sarah, and Karthik because ln of x is four. So zero to four. So zero, one, two, three will come over here. Now, if I'll go with zero and I'll say ln of x minus one, that means it won't print Kevin over here because it is as similar to zero colon three, right? If I'll try one colon two, one colon three, it will give me John Sarah, right? It will skip Sam over here. Now, if I want to try with negative index minus one, two, three, it won't print anything. If I want to try minus one, two, zero, it won't print anything because it is going forward. Now, if we want to go backward, we know the way. So let's go back to the presentation and see how it works. Okay, so as we had in list, we can also skip elements while slicing in in tuple. So if we want to slice multiple values from tuple, we can use colon operator. But if we want to skip few elements, we can do so by providing numbers to be skipped. So this is my tuple essay. I have included two more values. Now tuple one. If I'll go from 0 to 6, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So it has basically 6 elements. So 0 to 6 means it will it will provide, it will produce 
it will retrieve all the elements and because we have provided one so it will not skip any element but if i provide two that means it, it will skip every next element so if one sam then it will skip john then it will come to sarah then it will skip karthik then it will come to jason if I'll go with three, that means from Sam, it will skip John and Sarah, then go for every third element, which is Karthik, and then every third element, but we do not have any other element after Matt, so it will go till this. Fine. So let's go back to Jupyter Notebook and let's see how it actually works. Okay, so uh, let's try another one. Why? And this time I'll provide 10 elements. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay. Now what I'll do, I'll say Y and I'll print everything. Now I'll say 1 and I'll provide 2 column and last with 1. Fine. It will print all the elements. Now I'll drag 2 columns and I'll give 2. So this time what it will do, it will skip every second element. Now 1, then skip 2, 3, then skip 4, 5, then skip 6, 7, then skip 8, 9. Okay, if I'll go with one, uh, let's go with one colon and I won't provide anything, I'll just say two. So this time it will start with two, right? Because two is the first index. Two, then four, then six, then eight, then ten. Now let's try with three. So you'll get one, then skip two and three, then third element is four, then five, six, then seven, then ten. So if I'll go with four it will give 1, 5 and 9, right? Now, if I want to print my list backwards, the reverse of the list, I'll use minus 1 and it will go from 10 to 1, right? The other way out is, if you can provide 0, if you'll provide 0 to 9 and then minus 1, it won't give you anything. Oh, just as I'm really sorry, I have used list in this case, I'll use and do the same operations so the result won't change only the square brackets will be converted to the parenthesis here one to two right now three and then four one five nine and minus one the same the reverse now zero to nine will not give you anything what you need to do in this case, you need to provide the last element. The last element will be uh, minus 1 and you won't provide anything and you'll say minus 1 over here as well. Now 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, right? If you had provided 0 as the last element, then you will not be getting 1. So instead what you can do, now try with minus 2. Then you'll get 10, then 8, then 6, then 4, then 2, right? So this is the way, way by which basically we can slice our tuple. Try and practice all these operations and if you have any issue, just let me know. Till then, see you in the next lecture. In the next lecture, we will be learning about several methods that we can be applied on a tuple. So till then, practice as much as you can. See you in, goodbye. Let's look into the agenda for today's session. In our last lecture, last lecture, we had studied about tuple and we had learned about indexing, slicing and how can we define a tuple and then how can we iterate a tuple. But in this lecture, we will look into several methods that can be applied on a tuple. So let's move on. So there are, so let's say we have a tuple as A equal to 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 and 20 then these are some of the methods that can be applied on a tuple we cannot basically modify our tuple but there are ways by which we can modify our tuple as well so uh, before it what we can see is length we have already seen which will basically give us the length of the tuple then del a del is basically used for deleting the tuple if you use del then it will delete the complete tuple if you want to count the if you can provide a number of provide an element from a tuple and if you want to find the count of that uh, number you can get it using count method the same method the same count method that we used in list and the same index method that we used in list can be used over here so let's go to Jupyter notebook and let's try the all these operations 
Okay, so I have opened my Jupyter notebook. Let's rename this to tuple methods. And let's create a tuple. I'll say a equals to, I'll provide. So a equal to 10, 20, 30, 40, 20, 30, 50, 60, 70, 20. Fine. And let's print a. This is a. Now, if you want to find the length of a, it will give you 10, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So, these are number of elements that we have in a. So, I'll just comment this length of tuple. Okay. Now, uh, what we can do uh, before deleting this tuple, what we can do, we can find the number of 20 we have in this tuple. So, I'll say a dot count. And I'll provide 20. Can you see we got the number 3? 1, 2, and 3. Right? Let's try another one. A dot count and we'll try 30. It will be 2. Because we have two 30s in the tuple. If you want to try with A dot count and 70. It will give you 1 because there is only one 70 in the tuple. If I, I want to try any number which is not there in the tuple, it will return 0, right? This is for counting the element in our tuple. Now, uh, what's next? So, we need to find, if we need to find the index of let's say 70, this is 8, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. If you want to try for index of 20, it will give you one, only the first index. It won't give you index of each and every element of A. It will give you only one. So, we already know that we cannot do any modification in a tuple. So, you cannot remove 20 in this case. There are other ways as well by which you can basically remove the tuple, uh, remove the element from a tuple. So, these operations I have basically given you as an assignment. You have to find it out and you have to try it. Then if you won't be able to do it, then you can go and check the solution. Okay, so last operation, delete of A, what it will do, it will just delete, it will just delete the tuple. Uh, before doing this, uh, what I'll do, I'll just try to provide the number in index, which is, which basically does not exist in the tuple. Why I am trying to do this? Because let's say you are building some, you have some task or you are doing or you are working on some project, wherein what you are trying to do, you are using this index or count method just to get the total number of elements or just to try to get the index. Now, what can happen? There are several methods which can which are even which are when used in tuple or in list say. If, they are, if the element is not present in the list or in the tuple, it will give you an error that the element is not there in the list or it will give you the count as zero. So, if you are working on a project and if you have some situation like this, then use count because it will give you the result as zero and it will not give you an error. Otherwise, if you are using some other method which is not able, which if it is not able to find that particular element in the list or a tuple then it will give you an error so this is the difference between remove and clear i guess so just uh, try and find it out so whenever you are working on some project try to use the method which won't give you an error if the element doesn't exist okay so delete a and if you'll go and try for a a is not defined right so this has basically deleted the tuple oh uh, i need to ch check for index 100 so let's define this tuple once again and let's print, print it as well. And let's go and check if index 100, what does it say? Okay. So, can you see in this case, it is giving you an error that x not in tuple. So, basically 100 not in tuple, so it is giving you an error. So, the same way if you are trying to find an index, if you are working on a project and if you found out that you need to search for an element which is not there, then it will give you an error and your code will not work after that. So, you can use index as well in that case also. So for this purpose, we use try and accept. So we will learn about try and accept in the 
last lecture which is exception handling there you will be able to learn how we can basically uh, try to avoid this situation so for now we can just say yeah for index no, for tan the index is zero so we can work like this and if you want to print a and let's try to delete it once again and okay so a is not fine so uh, let's close this lecture for now and uh, practice all these tuple methods if you have any issue just let me know and i have also provided you an assignment wherein what you have to do you have to remove the elements and you have to modify the elements you have to update the tuple how will you be able to do it because we do not have any such operations in tuple so how will you do it you have to figure it out so till then see you in the next lecture goodbye let's look into the agenda for today's session today we will be discussing about dictionary what is dictionary how can we access items in dictionary then we will see how can we update items in dictionary then we will also look into some dictionary methods and then at the end we will learn about nested dictionaries fine so let's move on so dictionary is an unordered collection of key and value pairs where the keys and values can be of any data type so uh, you have you have already learned sets list and uh, tuple so far so what you have learned in tuple we provide directly values in list we directly provide values like 75 85 90 and 99 but in case of dictionary what we do we provide a key and value pair so john will be considered as a key and 75 is considered as a value gary is a key and 85 is a value so basically if you are going to look into the dictionary of student so you will be doing it using john like if you search for john then it will give you a result of 75 so instead of 75 if you want to store multiple values you can store multiple values as well if you want to store a list instead of 75 you can store a list into john as well right so this is basically a dictionary just remember that uh, list and tuple and set contains the data items and uh, contains the data items and just the values while dictionaries contains the data items as a key value pair right so john is basically a key while 75 is basically a value right okay so now how okay let's go and uh, uh, create a dictionary in jupyter notebook okay so i have opened my jupyter notebook i will rename my notebook to dictionary okay so <clears throat> let's define a dictionary uh, i'll define a dictionary as a student only so when you are defining a dictionary you have to provide curly brackets as similar to set okay now let's provide keys first john and then let's provide a value 75 let's have mark and i'll give a value so let's say these are marks of students in mathematics okay and let's say mark after mark i have let's say sarah sarah and sarah got 80 marks and if you want to give spaces in between you can give spaces if you do not want you do not need to and let's say have one more let's say peter so peter got 98 right and if you go and check your student so you'll get your student as john is having 75 marks mark is having 85 sarah is having 80 and peter is having 98 so if i'll go and uh so what, sh uh, what shall i do over here uh, okay so let's get back to the ppt and see uh, how can we access items from a student okay uh, before before moving on so let's see what is the type of type of student so i'll go and check so dict dict is basically a dictionary this is the type of the variable that we have created the object that we have created okay okay so how can we access items in dictionary so let's say this is a dictionary that we have um, john is john got 75 marks gary got 85 martina 98 and joseph 99 in mathematics now let's say if you want to access john how much how many marks how how many values or what values do 
does John have? So if you want to, you can just provide the name of the dictionary. You can provide uh, square brackets and then you need to provide the key. Okay, you'll get 75. Similarly for Martina, you'll get 98. Now there is another way as well. So where, wherein what you have to do, you have to just provide the for loop. Okay, so let's go back to Jupyter Notebook and I'll show you how it ex exactly works. So we have already created our uh, dictionary. The most important that you need to know about is the dictionary is also an unordered. The dictionary also contains an unordered data items, right? So it doesn't matter. You do not need to provide any index. You can always, if you want to find what is there in a dictionary, you have to provide the name of the key in square brackets, right? So you have provided John. If you will say if you can provide one, it won't work, right? So it doesn't work. So instead of one, what you can provide, you can provide mark. Mark is my key. Okay. So you'll get 85. Similarly, if you'll go and check for, uh, if you want to know what is Sara having, you'll get 80. Right. If you want to know what is Peter having, you'll get 98. But each of the time what you have to do, you have to know about the key. So in order to know what keys are there in a student, what we will be doing, we will say for keys in or say for I. So why I removed keys, why I replaced keys with I because I'm saying that I is just a variable. So for I in student, the same thing where the same loop that we used to that we used for list, we used for tuple, set, everywhere. For i in student, print i. Now let's see what i will return. So now, can you see it has returned all the all the keys that we have, right? So I'll say for i in, if I'll say for i in student <coughs> and uh, uh, I'll say so we know that I is the key so what I can do I can just say print and I can provide my student as my dictionary and I'll say I I is my key so you'll get all the values now if you want to check if these are correct or not I can just provide I and comma now, can you see John 75, Mark 85, Sarah 80 and Peter 98 or oh, you got all the values. Now, instead, if you do not want to be, uh, do not want it like this, what you can do, you, you just, if you just want to print, if you just want to print values, you can just say values and, oh sorry, you can just say values and say print. I. Now in this case, what you what you will get, you will get all the values, student dot values, right? So let's say what you want, you want keys as well, key comma values. Instead key comma values, what you can use i and j as well in student print key comma values, right? Oh. What you have to use over here is student not student student dot items. I have also provided this syntax in presentation. Now can you see you got all the values, right? Fine, good. So let's create another one. I'll just show you that instead of 75, you can also provide different different sort of uh, values as well. So let's create student and uh, let's create a dictionary now in the dictionary what i will do the first one is mark and we have to provide the colon colon operator in this case because in dictionary we have to provide the colon operator and in list let's say i'll provide 60 65 63 64 62 3 and 93 these are some of the marks that mark got and let's say sarah Sarah is having 82, 83, 84, 85 
and 87 right now if you go and check your student you got this now if you want to check using for loop for i in uh, okay let's first try with student and sara and you'll get the list right if you want to iterate this list what you can do for i in students of sarah and print i right okay so if you want to do like for uh, <coughs> i in student print i comma student i Sorry, this is um, you are getting this message because student is considered as a as a function because whenever you are providing the parenthesis, that means you are using it as a function. So we'll provide the square brackets. Now, can you see you got all the results like this? Now, let's say let's make it more convenient. I say for a student, uh, what I'll do, I'll say for j in i print i comma hmm, i comma j oh so for j in i it should be okay so for j in student what we need to use student i because student i is basically student sarah like this okay now i think now we will get the correct result yeah now can you see mark 60 mark 65 mark 64 mark 63 mark 93 the same way right okay so let's go back to the presentation now the next part is adding items to a dictionary. So we have a, dic a student dictionary like this: student John seventy five, Gary eighty five, Martin ninety eight, and Joseph ninety nine. Now, um, if you want to access James, now if you want to add James, a student James. So what you have to do? You have to just provide a student your dictionary and square brackets. If you can provide the key and if you can provide the value, it will be added. Right? Now no matter. It doesn't matter that it will be added at the end or it will be added at the beginning or it will be added at the between at between so it doesn't matter because dictionaries are unordered so it can be added anywhere so before moving on to some important dictionary methods I'll just directly show you how we can update it okay so we have student you can see student this is my student now, now let's add student James I'll say 75, 72, 85, 86, 87, and 48. Now, if you go and check your student, fine. If you want to add one more student, and let's say Kevin equals to 28, 29, 30, 31. Okay, let's add four only. So we'll go if you'll go and check your student, it will be like this, right? It doesn't matter how many keys, how many values you provide in a list. It doesn't really matter. You have to just provide the numbers. Fine. So let's get back to the PPT. Let's get back to the presentation and I'll show you what are some important methods that we can use in dictionary. Okay, so some important dictionary methods. So let's say this is a dictionary, John, Carrie, Martin and Joseph. And here are some values, some marks. Now, these are some of the important dictionary methods. So, len, the universal len method, which can be used for finding the number of dictionaries. If you want to find the number of uh, values each dictionary, each key is having, then the there is a different way. Delete student will delete the complete dictionary. If you say delete student John, that means it will delete only John from student. If you want to remove Gary, student.pop can be used and what it will do, it will return values Gary, it will return what are the values there in Gary and it will delete Gary. 
then you can use student dot get martina it will return martina martina sally so let's get back to the jupyter notebook and i'll show you all these methods okay so <coughs> what do you have what do we have in a student this is our student okay so what i'll do i'll just first use the get method and what we will be doing we will just look what is sara having so instead of using student and sara if this is not convenient for you you can use this method <coughs> get method fine so let's try the next method uh, len of student what it will give you for right now if you want to know how many items are there in this list so what you can do uh, you can just say student and uh, if you want to see mark it will give you five right len so student mark is basically a list and if you want to find the size of the list you can use len method if you want to find for all of them for i in student and <coughs> print i comma what i'll do len student and i it will give you the results like mark is having 5 sara is having 5 james is having 5 and kevin is having 4 let's let's move on to the next one so if you want to delete any so before delete i'll just show you pop operation so student dot pop and what do you want to pop this time so we'll pop kevin because it is having one less value so i'll pop just kevin now can you see the all the values that we had in kevin are returned 28 29 30 31 28 29 30 31 now if you go and check your student kevin will not be there right now let's remove mark from the student this time what i'll do i'll just use del as a keyword student and you can provide mark now it will not return you anything it will just delete mark from it and if you go and check the student it is now having sara and james and if you want to check student and mark invalid keyword right similarly if you want to search for kevin you'll get invalid right so this is the way by which basically you can delete what is there in the dictionary if you want to delete the complete dictionary let's delete the complete dictionary this time and student has been deleted if you'll go and check for student you will get student is not there fine so this is the way by which we basically we can delete a student so <coughs> what we have learned so far we understood how we can create a dictionary so the main important points are dictionaries are unordered they have key values pairs and they are defined in curly brackets now the second thing is if you want to know the type of the dictionary you can use type student right if you want to access a dictionary you can provide the name of the dictionary then in square brackets you can provide the key in in your in uh in this course in quotes okay now if you want to access <coughs> the uh dictionary some other way so if you want to know the keys for i in student print i will give you all the keys if you want to know about the values you can use student and in bracket i or else what you can you also use a student dot values if you want both keys and values in a single line you can use key comma values in student dot items if you want to store list in list in the keys you can store list as well fine and if you want to know what is there in the list you can use student and you can provide the key and you will get the list fine so similar way if you want to know what uh, so this is one of the example which you had learned and then if you want to update your if you want to add any more elements to the dictionary you can use dictionary and then you can provide the key and then you can provide the values even if you won't provide the values in list if you provide the values like 75 directly it will also work you can try it out similarly student dot get method can be used to get the value of a key 
LAN method. LAN is a universal method that can be used for finding the number of keys. If you want to find the number of values in a particular key, you can use LAN and then you can provide the key. And if you want to remove any element, you can either use pop or if you want to remove, you can also use delete. Delete will not return you anything. It will just delete the particular key or the dictionary as well. But pop, what pop will do, it will return, it will give you the values and will delete the key. Right? So this is the way try and practice all these operations. In the next lecture, we will uh, discuss about nested dictionary. So till then, uh, see you and goodbye. Let's look into the agenda for today's session. Today we will be learning about nested dictionaries. So in the last lecture we learned about dictionaries and today we will see how we can build a dictionary into a dictionary. Fine. So let's move on. So let's take an example. Student is a dictionary. The first key that we have is Gary. Under Gary I have provided mathematics science. These are two math uh, two subjects. So if you can see this is also a dictionary. Right. So the same way I have provided for Martina and these are the values so let's go to jupyter notebook and create these dictionaries create this nested dictionary and see how it actually works so i have opened my jupyter notebook i'll rename my notebook to nested nested dictionary and let's start okay so student is equal to just provide this so let's just move this a little bit now first student so John now I'll create five marks okay so let's move this as well so let's first have history John got 85 in history then let's say we have uh, physics John got 98 in physics then let's say we have Chemistry, John got 65 in chemistry and let's say we have the fourth one, um, what shall be the fourth one, let's say, um, let's have geography and for geography he got 88 and last one mathematics now he is weak in mathematics so he got 50 okay <clears throat> and let's close this bracket where is our another bracket I'll just copy this whole one and then what will I do I will just give over here and I'll create another student three so let's let's go with three students okay so I'll rename this student to Martina and let's rename this student to Karthik fine now in history Martina got 95 in physics Martina got 91 Chemistry, Martina got 94. Geography, Martina got 88. But in Mathematics, Martina got 84. Now, Karthik. Karthik got in Mathematics, 98. Geography, 86. Chemistry, 95. Physics, 95, 98. In History, let's say 78. Right? let's oh I have made a mistake so what mistake I have made oh so I have not provided any separator so comma is a separator that needs to be provided right so okay so let's go and check our student table yeah so this is our student not table student dictionary if I want to access student uh, what shall I access first John okay fine now if you want to access let's let's try what so student then John 
then if I want to search for history how much how many marks you got in history okay so basically what you can do if it is an access dictionary you need to provide the key the first key then the second key right now let's go for a student Martina and check oh it's a capital it's case sensitive Python right Martina and this is also wrong I don't know what, how many times will I do it incorrectly and if I'll go and search for history I'll get 95 right so let's create a loop instead of wasting our time like this for I in student print what shall I print I comma student 5 right okay fine but I don't want I just want I just want history I'll say history right yeah so John got 85 in history Martina 95 in history and so what I'll do I'll just say let's make it got these many marks in history John got 85 marks in history, Martina got 95 marks in history, Karthik got 78 marks in history. Fine. So this is the way by which basically we can create a um, nested dictionary and if you want to access elements you can also access like this. Uh, is there any other method that we need to use? What do you think? So let's, let's find the length of student. This will give you 3, right? but if I were to find the length of student and I'll just say so we'll use the same loop for I in student print I comma len of student I so this is basically returning you the values how many values are there in each of the student marks fine now let's try another one so what you want to do what you want to do is if you want to find who got highest marks in each subject this is a question so I'll say for I in student oh protection okay for I in student uh, print I and what will I do so how will I get it Mm, maximum marks in each subject um, okay let's first print how many values are there in the second one okay for I come a form print student I okay so student I is basically printing all these but what I want I just want the keys right what I can do for J in student I print J right so we got history physics chemistry geography mathematics these are the keys that we have now uh, let's let's put these keys into our list so I'll say uh, subjects subjects is my key and what I can do, I can just put, I can take any of the student, I'll take student, uh, okay, let's take student as, as Karthik, okay, and I'll put all the subjects in two subjects, uh, subjects dot append i. Sorry, Jay. Oh, so what is wrong? Okay. Now, if I go and check my subjects, so it has all these values. Okay. So, what I'll do for I in subjects.
for i in subjects uh, what will i do i will just say for i in subjects uh, student for i in student and let's create another list l2 uh, this list will be marks what will i be doing i will just be appending all these marks student i uh, let's make it j student j and on then i fine so if you want to print what is there in a student j and i you can just print it right you got that so i'll show you how you will basically get it so mm, let's append marks dot band student j comma i and then what will i do i'll just say instead of doing like this what i'll do i'll just put it over here now it will be easier so i'll just print <coughs> max of marks right and i will print now student won't be printed in this case so if you want to check you can just check so uh, the first one is history in history the maximum marks are 95 right in physics the maximum marks are 98 in chemistry the maximum marks are 95 in geography 88 and in mathematics 98 right so by this way we can basically find the maximum marks that the student got in each subject now if you want to find which one got the maximum marks which person got the maximum marks, so I have provided a, an assignment onto it do that assignment then if you if you are not able to do it then go and check the solution so uh, let's let's try this once again so i'll just instead of putting all the statements all the statements in different in different cell i'll do what i'll do i'll just copy all this and put it over here okay so if you want to find the with who got the maximum marks who got the maximum marks that will be your assignment for now what i have provided you that how my how what are what is the maximum marks in each of the subject fine so till then practice as much as you can and see you in the next lecture goodbye let's quickly look into the agenda for today's session today we will be learning about lambda function what are what is lambda function and how can we implement lambda function in python we will learn about it so let's move on so lambda function a lambda function helps in creating small anonymous function it takes any number of arguments but can have only one expression so it will be a normal same function but the thing is we will be providing a lambda keyword and arguments will be like x comma y and then we'll give a colon colon and then we have to provide an expression so the same thing that we do in functions we will we won't be using def over here we will be directly using lambda keyword uh, let's take an example like y is equal to lambda x and here in this case what will you get you will get the multiplication of x square you will be getting there is another one wherein what we will be doing you will be okay let's go to jupyter notebook instead and i'll show you directly how it actually works Okay, so I have opened my Jupyter notebook. Now let's rename it to lambda function. Okay, so let's create a small function def square and x. And what are we going to return? We will be returning x multiplied by x, right? Fine. So this is a function by which you can basically get the square of a number so if i'll go and search for 2 square 2 and if i'll go and 
do for square four. I'm really sorry, square four. Square four, you'll get 16, right? So instead, I do not want to write the expression like this. I will, what I will try to do, I will create a function, lambda function, which will do the same operation, but in a single line. So I'll give the name of my function as a square and I'll say lambda. Lambda is basically the keyword that needs to be used. And then we have to provide the number of arguments. So how many arguments are we providing over here? We are providing only one argument. So we will be providing only one argument after which we will be using the same colon operator. Now the expression, what do you want in return? You want X multiplied by X, right? This is done. So now let's, let's press shift enter and C square of 20. 400. If you really feel that it is not working, I'll just rename it to square lambda and this is square plus go lambda and I'll go for tan. Now, can you see the result? Square underscore lambda and I'll say 15, 225, right? So, let's create another one. This time I'll say q and I'll create lambda. I'll use x as an argument and I'll what I'll do I'll just provide x to the power 3 right if I'll use q and I'll say 3 it will give me 27 3 to the power 3 is 27 4 to the power 3 is 64 right so this is the way, way by which we can basically create a lambda function and in a single line we can give the expression now let's try another one. We'll, this time what we will do, we will get the addition of two numbers, x and y. Okay. So what we will be doing, uh, we'll take add is equal to, add is equal to x plus y. And what we will be doing, we will be returning add. This is our function. Now if I'll go and try for addition, addition 20 comma 30 I'll get 50 now instead what I will try to do I will try to get I will try to create a lambda function instead of this so I'll say this time add as my function and I'll provide lambda now we know that after lambda we have to provide the arguments so let's try I'll provide x x y z three arguments over here and what I will try to do, uh, what I need to do, I need to provide the expression. So basically what we, are, what we are basically going to return over here, we will be providing the, we will be returning our summation. X plus Y plus Z. Right? Now, add 10 comma 20 comma 30. 60, right? 10 plus 20 plus 30 is equal to 60. Add 20 comma 30 comma 40. 30, 20, 50, 90 will be the result. Right. Can you see this? We can use multiple arguments. We can provide colon operator and the, then we have to solve. Let's try prod. And this time what we will be doing, prod is equal to lambda. Lambda, we will be providing product, product of x and y. And I'll say x multiplied by y, right? Now prod, 3 comma 4, 12. Prod, you can provide anything over here. Prod. And if you want to provide like 2.5 comma 3, you get 7.5 prod 2.3 comma 30, you get 69. Right? Now let's try, let's create a function. This time what we will be doing, we will be using if and else statement. Okay. So I'll say uh, define and what we will be doing, we will be just trying to find if the number is greater than 15 or not okay so i'll say greater and i'll take x i'll say if x is greater than 15 print greater than 15 else print uh, lesser 
will just say lesser okay now if i'll go and try for greater than lesser greater 20 greater than oh i have uh, i need to change this spelling greater than and greater than right if i'll say greater 14 lesser greater 15 it will be lesser right greater 16 will be greater than 15 right so instead i do not want to cover this space i just want to create a lambda function which can take the whole expression in a single line what i'll do i'll just say larger is my function now lambda this time i'll provide x our argument is only x now what we are returning over here if you can see we are returning greater than 15 so i'll get the expression as greater than 15 always remember this greater than 15 the one that we are returning greater than 15 if my x is greater than 15 else what we are returning lesser right now larger i'll use the same operation tan lesser larger 20 greater larger 14 lesser larger 15 lesser larger 16 greater right now let's try another one this time what i will do i will say sum is greater than tan okay this uh, it seems to be quite big but fine so lambda this time what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to uh, okay let's create a function and then you will be able to understand so let's create a function then def and add and x comma y i'll say if so let's create another function add is equal to x plus y if add is greater than 15 or uh, not 15 i'll say 10 print uh this a return uh what i will return over here say greater i say return return true okay return true and else oh i need to provide a colon don't miss a colon and tem and don't miss indentation return false fine so let's create another cell and let's try a add add 10 comma 15 true 10 comma 0 false 5 comma 5 false right because 5 comma 5 so it tells sorry 5 comma 5 is 10 and 10 is not greater than 10 so we will get false now what we will be trying to do we will be doing the same operation using lambda x comma y uh, so we will be returning what we will be returning first true if x plus y is greater than 10 else what we will be returning false right so i'll use the same function that we have created and this time i'll say tan comma zero will get false tan comma one will get true five comma five will get false and six comma five will get true and if i'll use five point one comma five then also i'll get true right now let's try the last question what i will do in this case i will try to let's first create a function what i will try to do i will try to find the even numbers even uh, what i will do i will take the argument as x if x percentage 2 is equal to 0 return even else return 
or right and if i say even 3 odd even 1 is odd even 2 is even even 0 is also even even 1 0 1 0 1 is odd even 1 0 1 0 is even right now let's create a lambda function for this so what i will do i will just get odd okay lambda i'll take an argument as x if x is greater than x percent is 2 is equal to is not equal to 0 what i am returning odd else I have just changed the condition over here. Can you see? I am not providing double equals to, I am just providing equals to. Else, what we will be re returning? We will be returning even. Right? Odd 2, even. Odd 3, odd. Odd 1010, 1. Odd, odd 100, even. Fine? So, this is the way by which we can basically create lambda functions. Lambda functions are nothing but just a simple anonymous function which can be in which the expression can be written in a single line. You do not need to define a large function and have some space, get some space, use some space. Instead, what you can do, you can just create a lambda function which will be useful. These lambda functions are pretty much useful when we will be working on pandas. So, till then, practice as much as you can. I have also provided an assignment. Do it. If you have any issue, just let me know. So, till then, see you in the next lecture. Goodbye. Let's look into the agenda for today's session. Today, we will be discussing about map function. Uh, what is map function and how can we implement map function in Python? So, let's move on. So, map function takes a function as an argument and uh, iter as an argument and returns a map object of all the results, which is an iterator after applying the function to all the elements on iter. So, what map will do, it will take the function, you have to define a function and you have to provide an iterator. So, basically the iterator could be a list or a tuple or a set. So, all those elements and the function that you have provided. So, what map will do, it will go through each element in the iterator and it will do the operation, it will do apply that function which you have provided on each of the element. Let's take an example. So, let's say we have a list 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now, what we want to do, we want to get the square of uh, each and every element like 1 square is 1 and 2 square is 4. So, we want to get the square of each element. Now, we can define a square function, define a square, return x to the power of 2. What we can do, we can provide y is equal to map square and x. So, square is your function, x is your iterator. So, what it will do, it will return you, when you will say list of y, then it will return you all the numbers with their squares, fine. So, in this way, you do not need to go and uh, use for loop or some loops to get the results and then put it in the list. You can just use map function to get the square, fine. So, let's go to Jupyter Notebook and try it out. Okay, so, I have opened my Jupyter Notebook. What I will do, I will just rename my notebook now let's create a list 1 2 3 4 5 and 6 okay now what i will do i will create a function define square of x so it is basically taking the argument as x x into square and what it will return it will return x to the power 2 right x to the power 2 now what I can do in this case, I can just provide, I can just create a new, uh, let's say function and let's variable map, variable as y and I will provide map. In map, the first argument is function always. So function is a square and then the iterator, iterator is x. Now if you go and see y, y is basically a map object. Now if you want to see the elements. So, what you can do, you can just say list of y and it will give you all the results in this format. Okay, list of y, it will result, it will give you the result as 149, 16, 25, 36. Right? 
let's try another example let's say i have created a function using i have created an iterator and i have created a tuple as 10 20 30 40 50 40 and 50 okay now what i will try to do i'll just create a function define um, add x uh, what i will be doing i will just adding uh, what i will be doing i will just adding uh, let's say 100 to each element right now i'll create a map function b is equal to map what i will be providing the function add and then the iterator a now if you go and check b b is a map you go and check tuple of b it will return you the result okay so by this way you can get the result now uh, <coughs> so this is the way by which we can basically use a map function now let's try another example another one so at this time if you if you really think that uh, uh, can we provide only one argument so this question must must be there in your mind so can we provide only one argument no we can provide multiple arguments as well so let's create uh, x as 1 2 3 4 5 6 and y as 10 20 30 40 50 and 60 right now i said define add x comma y and return x plus y right we have created the add function now let's let's try with z is equal to map what i will be doing i will just provide my function then i'll provide all the arguments x comma y you go and check your z it won't give you anything but if you just go and check list of z it will give you 11 22 now let's let's try one more time what i will do this time i will provide three elements one two three and what i will do i will just provide 10 and 20 fine and i'll use the same operation add x comma y i'll say z is equal to sorry i'll just say z is equal to map and i will try add comma x comma y now let's see what is that list of the will directly print list of that now can you see the one which has less number of elements it will give results result for that one if you want to try it out once again let's give uh, one two three for x y as 10 20 30 and 40 and let's try z is equal to map of add comma x comma y right and let's try a list of z so you'll get only three elements because out of four three and four in x and y the one which is having less number of elements the operation will be performed on that particular list fine so let's try i think this is enough uh, if you want to try let's try another one what i will do in this case uh, what i will do in this case i will uh, take a list as 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 fine okay now what i will do i'll create a function define and i'll say odd or even and i'll take argument as x and what i will do if x percentage 2 is equal to 0 return what you will return even else what you will return odd fine right? now now you must be able to you must get this i guess so what are we exactly going to do i'll say y is equal to map what i want to do i actually want to know 
that which one is odd and which one is even right i'll just say map of odd or even comma i'll provide x as my second argument right now if you'll go and check your y list of y even odd even odd even odd even right so do you able to understand the difference between the lambda function and map function lambda is basically used when you want to perform a single operation right and it is just a simple function which can be used instead of another big function which you can define even this operation this function can be defined as a lambda function and can be used over here i have provided a similar assignment to you wherein you will be using a lambda function and map function both and try to do it if you have any issues just let me know and uh, before looking into the looking into the solution try to do it by yourself um so till then see you in the next lecture goodbye let's look into the agenda for today's session today we will be learning about exception handling so first we will see what is exception handling then we will see about try and accept block then we will also see about finally finally block then we will see several errors which usually occurs in python those are name type value zero division some other errors are also there but we will primarily look into these errors then we will look about raise exception and how can we use it fine so let's move on so exception handling whenever an error or exception occurs during code execution python stops and throws an error message due to which the code does not work further okay so in order to avoid such exceptions uh what we know uh, what we call it as exception handling so in python we can do it using try and try block okay so this is try and accept block what we do is let's say we have defined a variable let's say there is a variable x which we have not yet defined okay now if we we'll go and directly print x it will definitely show you an error and code execution will stop right so instead what we can do we can provide x in try except block when it what it will do it will just so what we will be doing we will just say try and then we will try, provide the uh, print x as a value and in except we will provide that print x is not defined if it throws an error then this x except block will work okay so i'll show you directly how it actually works let's go to jupyter notebook okay so i have opened my jupyter notebook i'll rename it to exception handling and let's start okay so what i'll do i'll just say print x okay yeah now can you see we got a name error so this is one of the error which is defined in python already wherein we got the error as name x is not defined so basically we have not defined x so that is why we are getting an error now let's what we can do try and i'll just put this put my code that needs to be executed in try block and i'll put accept block now what will this accept block will do as we have not provided x we will say it will say please provide x please define x okay okay so now let's if you'll run this code you can see please define x printed now if i'll go and define your x x is equal to 12 now if you'll go and run this code again you'll get the value right now it is not saying please define x because this time we are not getting any error right so that is why we are getting the value now let's look into some other example let's say i have defined x is equal to 12 now what i will be doing uh, let's define x is equal to hello okay now if i'll say y is equal to int of x and i'll say print y now you will see an error which will occur why because we are converting hello into an integer and what but we know that hello cannot be an integer so that is why we'll get an error of value error over here so let's try so can you see we got value error y invalid literal for int with base 10 hello 
if you'll go and change it to float as well then also you'll get an error you'll get the same value error right because this cannot be converted into a float or this cannot be converted into an integer so how can we execute this code what we will say i'll i'll define it directly here we'll say x is equal to hello okay now i'll say y is equal to i'll say try block because in try block we will provide the code and in accept block we will provide the uh, all the errors and what we need to print for those errors so once we'll say accept we'll say print and we'll say enter number right and i'll go and print my y over here now can you see we got the message as enter number directly okay now what i'll do i'll just rename this to hi then also you will get the same result why because it cannot be converted to x it is basically throwing an exception now what i'll do i'll just provide 12 over here now it will be converted easily because this is this time we are not getting any exception we are not getting any error so this try block will get executed and you'll get y now if i'll go and 12.25 this will also work if i'll go and do like 100 this will also work right so this is the way by which basically we can define try and accept block now let's try okay first i'll show you uh, let's go back to presentation and then uh, after finally block i will show you what exactly uh, i'll show you some more questions okay so uh, okay uh, without going to presentation i'll directly show you what finally block will do so finally block is basically provided at the end like after try and accept then we can provide finally what it will do no matter if try is getting executed or accept is getting executed at the end it will it will just give you the comment from finally whatever print statement you had provided in finally that will give you so if i'll show you the same one x is equal to 100 i'll try y is equal to float of x and i'll say print y and in accept block i'll say print and a number oops number and then i'll say finally finally is my last chunk of code and here what i'll say print finished okay this is basically an ending that your code has been executed if you go and try this you get 100 and you'll get finished now what i'll do i'll instead of 100 what i'll provide hello now it will say enter number and it will finish fine so this is the way by which basically we can do this okay now let's try another one so this time what i will do i will take the input from a user x is equal to int not int i'll say input and i'll say enter number enter age okay and let's say y is equal to int uh, y is so let's say x is person's age and y is father's age so y let's say is always 25 years greater than x now if you'll go and just print it uh, so let's try age as 24 and you'll get an error because we cannot now this is the type error because you are basically summing up uh, a string with an integer now what i what i will doing here i will convert this to int x if you'll go and do this you'll get enter age is equal to 24 okay now what we will do we will just print y as well so enter age 24 now you got 49 right but let's say if i'll print it once again and if i this time i'm saying hello so this time it will not be able to convert it into int and so it is basically giving you an error so what i will do in this case i will just provide this into try block 
I will provide everything in the try block. Okay. And print y and then I'll say accept and I'll say x is equal to oh, okay. I'll say print enter number okay and I'll say finally print finished. And if I'll try this, you say 24 finished okay. If I'll go and do for hello, it will say enter number and finished. Right now, each time you have to go and run this code. So instead, what I will do, I will just provide the whole code into a function. I'll define a function age. I'll put my code entirely into this. Okay. And finally, and this is basically a recursion function, recursion that I'm basically trying to apply. And here, if it happens, I'll say age once again. And now run it. Oh, so I need to call my function as well. I'll call it once I have defined my function. Now, each, if I'll say hello, enter number, right? Hi and a number now i'll say 24 now it is finished but this time you are getting three times finished right so beware about this so what i can do in this case okay so i have removed my code now we will try the same again so if i'll go and select 24 it will work i'll go and do hello then i'll provide 25 so it is working this time we are not providing any finished statement so let's move on let's move on to the presentation and see what we have next so the next was finally block wherein we uh, we will execute no matter what happens now we will go with this some errors so first is the name error name error is an error which basically occurs when a variable is not defined so we have already seen this wherein what we saw that uh, we had defined x we had not defined x but we were trying to print x so it was giving it was giving us name error so if let's say if you want to do this instead of accept only you can also provide accept name error which will also work and let's let's go and do this okay so i have opened my jupyter notebook let's try this so i'll say uh, print x and i'll provide try print x and accept this time I'll say name error and print what I'll say enter define x okay x is already defined with hello so what we can do in this case I'll just try go for something else I'll go for a now it is saying define okay let me change define x to a define a right now if you really think that this name error should not be correct if i'll go and change this now can you see this doesn't work because we basically are providing this value error in except if you are providing except then it will be universal that means if you'll get any such error any error it will go to this block but here if you have provided value error that means it will go only for value block if you have any value error, error then only it will go to this block so here if i am going from name error then it should be a name error okay let's get back to the presentation now the next one is type error so type error is an error which occurs when two variables of different data type perform an operation so if let's say x is equal to 2 and y is equal to high so basically one is an integer and other one is so one is integer and the other one is string so we, what we can do we can try print x plus y and if it is a type error then it will give us an error only integers will be allowed right and if you want to provide finally as well then we can provide finally as well so let's get back to the jupyter notebook okay so let's try value error not value error so th this is type error and 
I'll say try and print not print so first I will defy x is equal to 2 and y is equal to i and I'll say x plus y and if I'll go and check except and I'll say print both should be numbers and I'll say finally print finished right both should be numbers right now if I'll go and do type error let's see if this is a type error or not both should be numbers right if I'll go and change this to 3 now it will work right so this is basically a type error so why I am telling you all these errors because these are pretty much useful you always get these as an uh, as an error always in Python and whenever and these are pretty good questions when you are giving an interview so if you are an interview in if you are giving an interview and they might ask you what different types of error you get in Python so when you will be working as a developer you will always have to address these exceptions and you will also you will need to help handle these exceptions so how can you handle these first you need to know what type of error do we have in python okay so let's go back to the presentation now comes up value error so in value error what occurs when a variable receives an argument of correct type but improper value so let's say if i'm saying int and hello so this is basically incorrect data type so you'll get a value error in this case okay so x is equal to hello try print int x and you'll get a value error okay so let's go back get back to the present uh, get back to the Jupyter notebook okay so what i'll do i'll say x is equal to hello i'll say try print int of x First, I'll go with except and I'll print enter number and I'll say finally print print finished okay so enter number right now if I'll go and change this to value error So V is greater, I guess. Yeah, enter number, right? If I just try and do the same for type error, will I get the same one? No, you'll get an error. So but this is basically a value error. So you have to provide specifically as value error. Right? If I'll go and change this to I'll provide a string only, but I'll change this to 25. 25 finished if I'll change this to 25.2535 then also it will show you an error okay fine so let's get back to the presentation okay so the last uh, error that we have is zero division error so zero division error is pretty much important so whenever you have defined anything now if you are dividing something with zero you'll get an error so for which we have zero division error so if you are trying like print x divided by y which is basically x is equal to 2 and y is equal to 0 so you will definitely get an error exception okay so except zero division error and division by zero is not allowed and if you want you can provide a final statement so let's get back to the Jupyter notebook and see how it exact exactly works. okay so uh, what i'll do i'll first x is equal to i'll define x is equal to 2 and I'll say print and I'll define y is equal to 0 and I'll say y x divided y now can you get did you, can you see 0 division error we got so we'll say try and print x comma y x divided by y except and print uh, 
कैन नॉट बी डिवाइडेड बाय जीरो एंड फाइनली व्हाट वी विल प्रिंट फिनिश्ड ओके सो कैन नॉट बी डिवाइडेड बाय जीरो नाउ दिस टाइम वी आर नॉट गेटिंग एनी एरर सो इफ आई गो एंड चेंज दिस टू वैल्यू एरर यू गेट द सेम exception why because we have provided we are getting zero division error while we have provided the exception for value error so what i'll do i'll just change this to zero division error these sort of errors you will definitely get whenever you will be working on some good projects okay cannot be debited by zero right if i'll go and change this to 3 We'll get the correct result. Fine. So let's get back to the presentation. Okay. So last part, raise exception. So if you are working as a developer and you want to raise exception, exception, you can raise exception using raise keyword. So basically, like you have already seen such type of errors. Now, if you want to show your own exception, like you have defined as, so you must be remember. You must. Uh, so we had already worked on this particular one wherein we tried for finding an index which was not there in the list right and we got the exception is sometimes so let's get back to the jupyter notebook and i'll show you what exactly am i talking about okay so uh let's define a list as l1 and i'll say 1 2 3 and 4 right now if you remember we used to have the index method wherein what we were trying to do we were trying to find 5 so 5 is already not in the list but we are trying to find the index of 5 so can you see we got value error so value error is basically the one wherein we are not getting we are not finding it in the list the same way if i'll just remove this just un just command this and i'll say l1 and i'll say 5 So basically, we are trying to find the fifth index. So here you are getting index error. So this is also one of the error which can be counted. So index error is also the one which you will definitely get in list set and not set tuple in such Python objects. You will get these error. So what we can do, we can either use try and accept, or we can also use the other way. So if Uh, what I'll do, I'll just say x is equal to ten. If x not in L one, I'll say raise. So this is basically you are changing the error that you are getting. You are changing the error to another one. So L one dot index in L one dot index, we were getting the error as. uh the error as value error so here what we'll get exception and i'll say number entered not in list okay okay so what we were basically trying to do so here we are basically trying to find the index of x right let's try this So can you see number enter not in list, right? Now instead of value error, you are getting an exception which you have already provided. So if you are a developer and you want to raise such exceptions, you can raise like this. So if I go and change my ten to four, you will get the correct result. If I change my x to zero, you will get an exception which you have already entered. Now let's try another one. What I'll do. Uh, <coughs> I'll just say y is equal to zero at this point. Just mention it as four, okay? So because we do not want to get this exception. So if y not in uh, range zero to len of L one. So len of L one minus one, then raise exception index is 
not in range right let's try this and then we will print l1 and y so this time you got 1 because l1 of 0 is 1 now if i'll go and try for 5 now can you see index is not in range we got the exception so i was trying to see if my y is in between 0 to the length of l1 that we have so by this way basically we can define all these errors and we can handle all these errors in python so what we have learned so far we have learned that we can handle exceptions using try and accept block if you want to use finally we can use finally as well which will execute no matter if it is try or if it is accept then we have already we have also seen some of the errors wherein we saw first name error which occurs when we have not defined any we have not defined any variable and we are trying to print it or we are trying to use it then we have already seen type error wherein what we saw that uh, if we are adding different sort of data types and we have also seen value error wherein if we were trying to convert the data type of any string into integer then we got this error then there was zero division error wherein what we got we were dividing it by zero then we also saw that we, if we want to raise an exception we can also raise an exception using the raise keyword okay so practice all these operations if you have any issues just let me know till then see you in the next lecture goodbye hello everyone so today uh, we will be learning about our last lecture which is concatenation so concatenation is basically done on strings list and tuple so so concatenation is basically so if you have defined x is equal to 10 and y is equal to 30 now if you'll go and add your x and y it will be 40 so this is basically addition right but if you are going to use the same operation do the same addition operations on strings or list or tuples then it will not result it will not give you the result as we have in mathematics it will basically concatenate both the strings or concatenate both the list or concatenate both the tuples so i'll show you directly let's first go to strings and in strings uh, let's define x is equal to this is okay and y is equal to my this is awesome <laughs> right let's say if i'll go and add this so you'll get this is awesome right let's try another one this time i'll say uh ronaldo is a uh, and i'll say y is equal to great footballer right if you'll go and add your string it will give you ronaldo is a great footballer now uh, we didn't get any space in between uh and great so because we have not provided any space while in the last last example we had provided some space so let's provide so if you want to concatenate you can concatenate a space as well so space is also considered as a string so it will be added as a great footballer and if you want to do like ronaldo and i'll provide uh, i'll just close the string over here and i'll say z is equal to uh, messi and t is equal to and if you want to provide like r great footballers right so if you go and just add x plus y plus z plus t it will give you ronaldo great volume as oh sorry so x plus z plus t plus y right so just remove these yeah ronaldo messi great footballers okay so what i can do i can just provide comma plus z plus 
space and plus t plus space let's see ronaldo messi are great footballers right so in this way basically we can concatenate our strings now let's do the same operation on list so let's define one list as one two three and y is equal to four five and six so if you go and do x plus y it will return you the complete list four plus one two three four five six so why i'm telling you this operation this operation is pretty much useful because in list if you are trying to use the add operator it will concatenate both the list while in case of numpy if you go and uh, work on numpy it will concatenate it will not concatenate it will add each element so if i'll change the size of both the list then also it will work right so it is not the sizes are not going to impact the this operation are not going to impact this operation they will just concatenate both the list so we can perform similar operation on tuple as well wherein what we will be doing uh, we will have one tuple as one two three and let's say second tuple as four five six seven eight if you go and add your tuple you will get the result as a concatenated one fine so this is basically concatenation i really wanted to cover this up so that uh, you might not be facing any issues when you will be working on numpy or in our in further modules of python so till then see you goodbye hello everyone let's look into the agenda for today's session so today we will be discussing about uh, how we can basically access a numpy library using jupyter notebook then we will see whenever we are creating any numpy array using list then how can we basically create that numpy array and how are we going to use list to it okay so uh, so we have already installed numpy library as you have seen in the last lecture now it's time to understand its functions and how can we basically use it in into our normal projects okay so uh, when you want to access a numpy library using jupyter notebook you have to use a command import numpy so import is a keyword that is basically used whenever you want to import or access any library which is or any module present in python so if you have any module present in python you can use it using import okay on the other hand numpy is a library that basically we are going to import unless and until you import or access the numpy library you won't be able to use this function so it's basically like a library so you have a big uh, big library in your let's say college and now unless and until you have the access to that library you won't be able to read the books inside it so the same way unless and until you will have you will be having the access to this library numpy you won't be able to use this functions okay so uh, in order to create a numpy array using list we have to use the following command what we have to do we have to define a list like 1 2 3 4 5 then we have to pass it into numpy dot array so numpy is basically the module that we have already have and then we have to provide dot dot and after which we have to provide array as a keyword and in array we will be providing the list under our uh, normal parenthesis okay and we can then store it into r1 r2 or whatever variable name you want to give so the same way you can either provide the list directly into the arrays or you can create a list first then you can provide it as list one so i'll directly go to jupyter notebook and show you how exactly it works okay so let's go to jupyter notebook okay so i have opened my jupyter notebook i'll rename the notebook as uh, import numpy okay now before importing numpy what i'll do i'll just first create a list one so list one let's say is having elements one two and three and four okay now what i'll do i'll create a numpy array so we know that if you want to create a numpy array you can use numpy as a module and then you have to provide array and then you have to provide the list so i i won't provide anything you have to provide the parenthesis and inside which you have to provide your 
whatever object you want to provide so we are basically providing list one now if you'll go and run this statement using shift press enter so i'm pressing shift press enter in this case now can you see numpy is not defined so we have basically not defined numpy in this case so if you really think that numpy is not even required so what we can do we can just provide array as a list and can you see array is also not defined okay now what we'll do so what we need to do we need to first import numpy so i'll just add a cell above this code now what i'll do i'll import numpy first right import numpy and just click on shift plus enter in this way can you see the number has changed now and our numpy has been imported now what i'll do i'll use this numpy over here numpy dot array list one now if you'll see can you see this time we didn't get any error now let's go and print r1 so can you see the one two three four has been converted to an array right so this is the way basically by which basically we can this is how we can convert a list into an array which is basically a numpy array so numpy array is always there it could be a 1d array could be a 2d array could be a 3d array could be 4d could be and d array so we will understand about dimension say shape and size of the array for now you should definitely you should be able to understand that this is how we can create a numpy array and use it okay now what i'll do i'll just i'll show you one more thing so when you are importing numpy so each time you have to go and write numpy like this so what you can do you can provide an alias name to it so you can provide a keyword as so if you uh, if you have worked on sql there also be provide a keyword as s as alias name so here also you need to provide as the alias name as a keyword for alias name and then you have to provide the num np so here i am providing np instead of np if you want to provide anything num any any number even you can provide your own name and then you can use it instead of numpy now what i'll do i'll just run this code so can you see now it has been it has already run so now i'll use np instead of numpy now you will see that yeah it is working now i'll go and check it yeah let's create another one array 2 and here i'll provide np.array and this time i directly i will directly provide my list 2 3 4 5 6 now if you'll go and check your r2 this is your r2 okay so this is how we can basically create a numpy array in python what we have to do first your numpy should be already numpy library should be installed on your system if your numpy library is not installed in your system you won't be able to use these functions now once you have installed it then you have to basically access that numpy library until and unless you access that numpy library you won't be able to use that function if you want to read the books into a library you have to definitely go and open the door unless and until you open the door you won't be able to read the books so the same way you have to import numpy so this method whenever you are working on pandas or matplotlib is also one of the libraries scikit-learn you have to provide it as import and then the name of the library and if you want to provide the some other name you can provide as np or something else okay so this is the first lecture basically wherein you learned about these things then the next lecture we will learn about how we can basically uh, understand the shape size and dimension of these numpy arrays and how we can basically calculate it so till then see you in the next lecture goodbye hello everyone so today we will be discussing about how uh, basically the arrays which we are creating in numpy are uh, the arrays of the same data type so in list if i'll tell you about list first so list is one two three and if i'll say sam and true so if you will go and print your list one it will be having different different values different different values of different data types right but numpy first okay first of what i'll do i'll just rename this it this to uh same data type array okay so basically arrays are of same data type now i'll show you how so you have already learned how we can create an array one so what i'll do array one first what i need to do before this i need to import my numpy import numpy as np now what i'll do i'll use np dot array and i'll provide list one okay 
now this is how we will be basically able to create this r1 and we didn't get any error now you must be thinking that as i'm saying that numpy arrays should be of different should be of the same all the elements present in numpy array should be of the same data type but here we had different data types so how this array one is is getting created how numpy is able to handle this now i'll show you what exactly the output that you're going to get over here so can you see all the all the values present in this particular array are converted into string and the data type if you can see is u11 this is a formatted data type basically you have a string over here right now i'll show you another one r2 and i'll say np.array and this time what i'll provide i'll provide a list directly 1 2 3.5 and 4 6.25 okay now let's go and check your r2 now can you see all of them have been changed right now let's go and check your type of r2 so np numpy.nd array right and okay so this is uh, can you see all the values now present in this array are of uh, decimals floating data type right now if you'll go and check your let's create another one r3 and we'll use np.array and this time I will use 1, 2, 3 and I'll use true. Okay. Now if you go. Okay. Sorry. I need to provide it as a list. You cannot provide more than one argument over there. So if you go and check your R3. Now can you see 1, 2, 3, 1. True has been converted to 1. If you include, include 4. In, sorry. If you include false in this case. NP.array. And I'll provide 1, 2, 3, true. And then false. Now then you'll see false will be converted to zero, right? So this is how NumPy is basically handling all the elements in the data type, and all the elements in the list or whatever sort of object you have provided. So this is how it is basically handling it. Okay. So all these. So the first preference is going is always giving two strings. So if you have all the elements. And one of them is the string so all the elements will be converted into string if you have numbers and boolean values then your boolean values will be converted into one or zero if you have numbers and your if you have uh, uh, decimals as well so your numbers will be converted into decimals so try and practice all these operations try to do uh, create your own array and see how it actually works and if you have any issues just let me know so till then see you in the next lecture goodbye Hello everyone, uh, let's look into the agenda for today's session. So in our last lecture, we had understood about uh, how can we basically create a NumPy array and how can we, uh, uh, so we had also understood that uh, a NumPy array carries only single data, elements of only single data type, either it could be a string or it could be a number or it could be a Boolean value. So the same way, Today we will be learning about how can we basically find the shape, size and dimension of an umpire array. What is shape, size and dimension and how can we find it. Then we will practice all those shape, size and dimension on 1D, 2D, 3D, 4D, 5D arrays. I'll create all these arrays and we will try to find the shape, size and dimension of those arrays. And we will also understood, also try to understand how can we basically create the 5D or 4D arrays. Okay, so let's move on. So the first thing is let's talk about dimension so if you can see this is one two three this is one of the numpy array now if you can think of it this is basically an array of one dimension and you can also call it as a vector okay when the array is of one dimension you can call it as a vector so if you can see there is only one axis axis one so that is why the dimension of this particular this particular array will be one now if i'll take an example of this one so if you can see we have two axes in this case one is upwards and the other one is on the right to the right okay and how many elements do we have nine now so we can say that in this axis we have three elements in one axis which is axis one and we have three elements in the other axis which is axis two so this is basically two dimensional 2d array or we can also call it as a matrix fine now let's move on so this is basically the last one is a rectangle if you can see this one is basically your like a cube okay and then if you can see we have three axes the one axis over here axis one which is having three elements 
the second axis which is having three elements and the third axis which is going upwards is having six elements so this is why we can call it as a 3d array we cannot draw a 4d array and 5d array over here i'll show you directly it is jupyter notebook how can we basically create it so let's move on to find the dimension so we have already understood so if the array is in one dimension if the array has all the numbers in the single line then it will be considered as a one dimensional array and the dimension will be one if the array is like a rectangle which is in which it is having length and breadth as well so it will be considered as a 2d array and it is also called as a matrix the third one which is a three dimensional array in which we have a length breadth and height as well so it will be considered as a three dimensional array and if you can see shape how how can we basically define a shape so shape is basically how many elements you have in each axis so if you can see this is the axis one so axis one is having three elements in its in its axis the same way in axis two we have three elements 16 17 and 18 while in axis three we have six elements 36 35 34 33 and 32 in this way so we'll say that the first one will be the the outermost axis will be written at the first one the uh, and the lowest axis will be written at the last so we'll we'll say it as 3 3 and 6 basically the shape is 3 3 and 6 and if you will talk about the size size is basically the total number of elements so if you want to calculate size directly you can calculate it as the all the elements which are there in the axis multiplication of all the elements in each axis so let's go to jupyter notebook and how i'll show you how exactly we can create such arrays and how we can find these shapes as in dimensional using numpy functions okay so i have opened my jupyter notebook i'll rename this notebook as uh, shapes as in dimension shapes as in dimension now let's create an array let's first uh, import numpy as np this is a way by which basically we can um, import our numpy and uh, uh, i have provided nps the alias name so that we do not need to use numpy again and again okay now i'll create array one so array one will be np dot array and in list i'm not creating a list separately i'm just creating the list directly over here so i'll say one so if you can go and check your array one so this is your array one basically right which is having only one element now if you want to find the dimension of this so you can find the dimension using andim attribute r one dot andim you just need to provide so dot after dot if we provide any function or any method we'll say andim and in the last at the last if we are not providing any parenthesis that means it is an attribute but if we are providing the parenthesis that means it is a method we'll talk, discuss about methods and attributes in the coming sessions for now you can just just say that andim is not a method andim is basically an attribute now if i'll press shift plus enter in this case you can see one we know that the this array is having only one dimension now if i talk about shape shape is also you just need to provide the attribute as shape and you do not need to provide any parenthesis and just press shift plus enter and you'll get one comma right if i'll talk about the size so here we have only one element we'll get one now let's try with i2 and i'll say np dot array this time i'll provide one comma two okay now we know that axis is only one because two elements are there in the one table only one line only or we can say one list only on the other hand if i'll talk about the shape the so shape so shape will be two comma and the size will be two add two dot andim add two dot shape add two dot size right two now let's uh, talk about third one i'll say np dot array and i'll provide one comma two comma three comma four let's uh, let's try with four so what we will get in the dimension we'll get dimension as one only but if i'll talk about so what i'll do i i won't provide this like this so i'll just provide print r2 dot r3 sorry r3 dot dimension and print r3 dot shape 
instead of uh, using too much space i'll just use the single cell and if you can see one four comma and four right now let's create another one r4 this time what i'll do i'll say array now what we'll do we'll create an array of two dimensions okay so if you want to provide one comma two over here and then what you will do you will just copy this one so each of the alley array should be having two numbers so so i'll show you directly in the excel file okay so if let's say you are creating a matrix one two now in the second land if you are saying three and four and you are providing three numbers so this is your incorrect matrix right because your this number is doesn't exist in this case so this is not exactly a matrix so what you have to do you have to get a number over here so if you have two elements in this axis then you should be having two elements in the second axis as well and these will be your two uh, sides of that axis two two numbers of the axis two now let's go back to jupyter notebook okay so one comma two now at last we have provided one comma two and we have provided let's provide three comma four over here and i'll just provide i'll just close the brackets because everything is going to come into a list right now if you'll go and check your let's try with these three uh, first print r4 now if you can see one two and three four is coming in the second line so this is basically your matrix and if i'll go and check for the dimension and shape and size now can you see two two is basically your dimension shape because first element is having two so the first axis the first axis is having two so it will be coming at the last the second axis is having two elements one and then two right that is why you are having two over here and total number of elements are four now i'll show you the difference as well r5 equal to np dot array and what i'll do i'll say one two and three so this time my first axis is having three elements and my second axis is having only two elements so if you can see one and then second and now close this bracket now you will see my second axis is having two elements and my first axis is having three elements so you will get a shape as two comma three let's try r5 let's copy all this and let's try with r5 r5 and if you can see two is the axis two comma three three are the numbers over here and two are the in three are the first axis two are the second axis six because you have total number of elements as six now let's try with another one this time i'll take the 3d array np dot array what i'll do okay let's let's take one more example i'll give one number over here and two and three and four now can you see my first axis is having only one element my second axis is having four elements so this will be four comma six now let's try it directly i'll copy this paste it over here and you will be able to see the total number of elements will be so dimension will be two shape will be four comma one and size will be four right now let's try three dimensional r7 np dot array this time what i'll do i'll take two elements okay one comma two and i'll just provide one comma two and uh, this time i'll take three elements right now this is how we have basically got the two axes two comma three three comma two now i'll close this so when i'm going to copy this whole one so this will be coming into the third axis right comma okay this time i'll have four now let's close all the brackets this is basically your three dimensional now what i what you are going to get is in the first axis you got two numbers in the second axis you got three numbers in the third axis you got four numbers so you'll get four three and two 
let's try r7 if you want to see r7 so can you see one two now one two and then your bigger bracket so r7 dot so let's copy okay let's let me copy it up I'll just copy it and paste it over here. Now let's try R7, R7 and R7. Now can you see 3 because the dimension is 3 now, 4 comma 3 comma 2 because my last axis was having 4 elements, second axis was having 3 and the third axis was having 2 and the total number are 4 into 3 into 2 which is 24. Let's try another one. This time I'll make an axis of 4. So what I'll do, I'll just say 1. This will be my first axis. Now this will be my second axis. So my second axis is having two elements. Let's put np dot array as well. And then I have, so what I'll do, I'll just copy this so that I can create my third array, comma and comma so this is my third array third array is having three elements right now let's try this okay so what is the issue okay i need to provide a ending bracket as well which can cover everything now control c and control v now if you go and check your array 8 array 8 array 8 so can you see i got 3 comma 2 comma 1 now what I'll do, I won't change anything. I'll just copy all this and put it four times. Okay. Three and four. And then I'll close the bracket. Now, this will be a four dimensional structure. And how and what will be the shape? It will be one, two, three and four. Let's go and check it. Four, three, two, one. Right. And if you'll go and check your R8, so it will be like this, right? Now let's try another one. This will be a five dimensional structure, R9. And this time what I'll do, I'll provide alternate one, two and one, two like this. So I'll create, I'll write np.array at last one and just copy it up two. This is my second dimension. Now copy this up. This is the third dimension, so I'm not going to provide anything. Okay, so this is my third dimension. Third dimension is having only one element. I won't be copying it so that, so I'll provide one more bracket. Now I'll copy this one. This is my fourth dimension, right? Now I'll put one more bracket, but this time what I want, I don't want to give any thing else. So this is my five dimension. Let's try this one. R9. Uh, let's copy it up from upwards. Let's see if I am correct or not. So it should be 1, 2, 1, 2, 1. Right? <coughs> let's try this. Okay. And um, Oh, sorry, I need to provide np.array. We sh have to convert the list into an array. So that is why we have to put it like this. Now let's go check it. Five dimensional, one, two, one, two, one, and four numbers. Did you get this? Now what I'll do, if you're not able to still understand this, so I'll show you the method of two comma three. So this is the last example after which you have to try it by yourself. I'll give you one assignment which you have to do it by yourself. Okay. So what I'll do, I'll just say one, two, three and two, three. What do you say? One, two, three and two, three so that you can understand it easily. One. Now the second one is going to have two. Okay. Now let's close this. This is my third dimension. Uh, now two dimensions are over. I need to go for the third dimension. One, two, three. So this is my third dimension. Now I'll close this bracket. I have to go for two. So this is my fourth dimension now. Now I have to go for three. So I'll close the brackets. I'll copy this. 
and paste it three times right control C control V and control V now I'll close the bracket at the last and I'll close the bracket at over here as well now this is and so you go and check your right hand this is your right hand is too big you won't be able to understand the single glance so let's copy and check the shape and size of it okay so what should be the uh, what should be the result 3 2 3 2 1 and it will be a five dimension if you want to create a dimension for six you can create add more elements into it okay so 3 2 3 2 1 36 and 5 3 th multiplied by 2 is 6 multiplied by 3 18 multiplied by 2 36 so in this way you can basically calculate the shape size and dimension of any array and you can basically create an array of any dimension so till then see you in the next lecture practice as much as you can try to build your own arrays and try to find the shape size and dimension if you have any issues just let me know i'll try to solve it for you okay so see you in the next lecture goodbye hello everyone let's look into the agenda for today's session so today we will be learning about uh, uh, so we have already understood how we can basically create an array one dimensional array and two dimensional array Today what we will be doing, we will be learning about indexing and slicing. So what basically is indexing to take out any of the uh, element from the array. So if, let's say if it is having five elements or six elements. So if you want to take out the fourth element or third element, you can take it out using indexing. The second thing is slicing. If you let's say you want to bring out three or four elements. So taking out the slice of the particular array, how basically you can do it, we will be learning about it. The third thing is slicing using list. So let's say if you have five elements, one, two, three, four, five, and six. Now let's say you just want to do five and six. So how are you going to take it out? So we will look about it in this session. Okay. So first we will see about indexing. So in order to access any array element by using its position, it's called as indexing. We can find the element by using its index position. So if this is an array, array is equal to np.array and we have 10, 20, 30 as the elements. So this 10 will be at the 0th position and if I'll try to access add 0, this will give me the first index which this will give me the first element which is 10. So always remember that any array, so if you have already studied about list and uh, um, strings, so what we had learned about indexing and slicing over there, the same rule ap is applicable over here as well, even in tuple as well. So here the same rule applies the first index the first element will be considered at the zeroth index now in order to access the element from the end so we already know that in list as well the last element is considered as the minus one index the second last element is the minus two index the same way we have in arrays wherein the last element will be considered as the minus one index the second second last element will be the minus two index okay now moving on to slicing so what we will be doing in slicing so slicing is like so you already know the positions now if i'll say 10 20 30 40 50 60 and 70 is your are your elements now if you want to take out 10 20 and 30 how are you going to take it so the same way 30 40 50 60 70 and 20 30 40 50 so these are basically slices how are you basically going to get the slices so for this what we basically do the same rule is applicable over here as we have in list wherein we have to provide the starting index and we have to provide the last index plus one so if let's say you want the element from zero one two three third index so you have to provide four at the last and three at the and zero at the starting if you want to take these steps you can take these steps as well if you do not want the uh, each next element you can take the next step okay so uh, i'll show you directly these into the jupyter notebook and for now you just need to understand that the same rules for indexing and slicing we had in list the same rules we have over here now the third one if let's say if you want to uh, take out one two four and seven elements how you are going to basically take it out so you can just provide the list of indexes and you can just pass it into the array in square brackets so let's go to jupyter notebook and i'll show you all these operations how it basically works so i have opened my jupyter notebook now what i'll rename it i rename it as slicing 1d array 
Okay, let's begin. So first what we will do, we will import NumPy as NP. Okay, now R1 is equal to, let's take it and let's take an array, np.array and I'll provide elements as 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. We'll go and check your R1, this is your R1, right? Now, the first element will always be considered as the zeroth index. The second element will be considered as the first index. So if you'll ask me, I want to get 50. So 0, 1, 2, 3 and 4. So 50 will be considered as the fourth index. Although its position in numeric terms is fifth, but the index will always start with 0. So you'll get the 50, you'll get 50 at 4. You just need to provide the square brackets. Always remember we have to provide the square brackets. We cannot use parentheses in this case. If you'll provide parentheses like this, you will get an error. It's not callable because this is basically you're like calling the function. Just remove, I'll remove this one. So what I'll do, I'll just add a cell over here. I'll just give a heading as indexing. And I'll just put it as one. Okay. Now this is basically your index and the positive index. And now let's talk about negative indexing negative indexing so negative indexing is basically what is negative indexing we are going to take out the elements from last so if i want to take the last element which is 70 how am i going to take it i'll just say minus one and it will give me the last element if i want second last element i'll give minus two and it will give me the second last element if i want third last element i can give minus three and it will give me the third last element so in this way if i'll go and go for minus 5 it will give me the fifth last element so fifth last element is 1 2 3 4 and 5 fifth last element is 30 so you got 30 over here so this is how basically you can do negative indexing so we have already understood about positive indexing the first element is always going to start with zeroth index and then from last if you want to go with the from last the last index the last element will be considered as the minus one index now let's go on with the slicing part slicing and let's see what's our r1 now what i'll do i just want 10 20 and 30. so if i'll go and start with 0 and provide 2. so although 30 is at second index but it won't give me 30 because the first element is always considered before column start index is always considered but the stop index is not considered so stop plus 1 we have to provide stop plus 1 so this will give me 10 20 and 30 okay now if i want to take 20 30 only i'll give r1 and 1 and 3 20 and 30 right if i want to get uh let's say from 30 till last now if i want to get all the elements i'll just provide colon and i won't provide anything in the beginning i won't provide anything at the end it will give me all the errors if I'll say 0 colon, so 0 means starting position is 0 and if I'm not providing anything that means it will go till end. If I'll say 3, 3 will be my the 0, 1, 2 and 3. So this is 3, so it will go till 2. So it will start from the beginning and it will go till 2, 10, 20 and 30. Okay, now if I'll say colon and uh, at last I'll provide minus one so that means I'm going till minus one this is my minus one index I'm going till minus one so it will go and bring 60 till 60 all the resist is 60 right okay good so uh, let's try another one uh, let's say minus five to minus two so minus five is one two three four five minus five is 30 and minus two is 60 so it will give me 30 40 and 50 I don't need to provide this okay right fine now slicing with a step okay now what is slicing with the step so this is my r1 now if let's say I don't want I don't want 20 40 60 over here I just want 10 30 50 like this how am I going to get it so I'll provide colon and I won't provide anything because I want all the elements. Then I provide another colon operator and at last I will say 2. So if I'll say 1, 
it will give me all the elements if i'll say 2 it will give me alternate elements 10 30 50 and 70 if i'll say 3 then it will give me every third element first then third which is 40 then third which is 60 70 okay like this if i'll go and search for four first and then fourth element first second third fourth and this after three elements the fourth one 50 so it will give me 10 comma 50 now <coughs> here's the catch if i'll say if i'll just provide like this and i'll provide colon and i'll provide minus one so it will what it will do it will bring the elements from last to first it will give me the reverse of the list the reverse of the array the same way we have in list the same rule also applies over here if you provide minus one it will give you the elements from last to first okay if you give minus two then it will provide the alternate 70 50 30 and 10 if you provide r1 and if you provide minus 3 it will give you 70 40 and 10 right so this is how basically you can do the indexing part and slicing part one more example i'll give you so what i'll do i want to start with 60 so i'll say minus 2 and then i'll go with minus 1 it will start with 60 right so this is how you can do slicing and indexing now the last one um slicing using list as an as position as positions okay now what i will do i'll just define a list one so uh, first let's see what's our array this is our array now l1 is a list wherein what i want i want the elements second fifth second and fifth only so second is at the first index so one comma and fifth is the fourth index four now if i'll go and search for so you just need to provide a square brackets and you need to provide the list which you have now can you see you got the elements 20 and 50 yeah one more thing i want to tell you that we already know that these are six seven elements basically six index if you provide seven it will give you an error because seventh element is not basically available your sixth element is available so the same way if you say that in l1 i'm providing one comma four comma seven and if i'll be able to get the results i won't get the results so i have to provide only those indexes which are there right in this way fine so this is how basically you can slice and take out the elements from any array these all rules are same applicable in list tuples and even strings but only this last one slicing using list as positions this is not applicable in list strings and all other data structures this is only applicable in these arrays okay so try and practice all these operations which i have performed so far so see you in the next lecture and take care